Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. And speaking of regular releases, at Maxon, we're continually striving to not only bring value to artists, but also to add features that will inspire you to create your best work. And in case you missed it, we released many other incredible features this summer. Redshift added a jitter node to create color variations across multiple objects that use the same material, as well as a matte cap shader node to render non-photoreal surfaces. Particular added several new gradient interpolation models to create more pleasing blends of colors. It also added more control over what child systems can inherit, as well as a built-in ground plane for bouncing particles. And of course, we added a huge new collection of presets that show off the power of all these new features. And last but not least, our mobile sculpting app Forger got a ton of great new features, including sweep, lathe, area lights, multiple cameras and orthographic views, knolls and object hierarchy, and the sketch tool, which allows you to create 3D geometry by simply sketching with your finger or an Apple pencil. At Maxon, we're committed to regularly providing fresh content, additional resources, and important features for the tools you rely on every day. And we're continuing to do this with our fourth major update to Maxon One this year. We continue to be amazed and inspired about how our community uses our tools and what they create with them. So join us virtually or in person at IBC in Amsterdam in September, where we'll feature a range of compelling presentations from a diverse group of talented artists and studios sharing their creative processes and creations. And don't forget that you can interact with us every day on live webinars and shows. And you can learn more about the tools from our vast library of helpful tutorials at Cineversity on the Maxon site. To find out more about the complete set of powerful 3D and post-production tools in Maxon One, visit us at maxon.net.
At Maxon, we're dedicated to helping you bring your creative concepts to life. Whether it's giving shape to characters through ZBrush, sculpting seamlessly with Forger, breathing life into animations and dynamic motion designs using Cinema 4D, achieving photorealistic renders via Redshift, enhancing visuals with the prowess of Red Giant tools, or infusing videos with unique stylized aesthetics through Uverse, we've got you covered. Our latest release of Maxon One focuses on providing power at the speed of creativity. We recognize Maxon tools are where you feel your most creative, so we've prioritized performance, so your creative spark is constantly fueled. Our tools are faster than ever, with performance gains in Cinema 4D, Redshift, and Red Giant. Of course, we've also added some great new capabilities to your creative quiver as well. Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new Normal Editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, New nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats, as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to
control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great. Good morning, everyone, uh, present in the audience as well as watching live. Uh, this is day two at IBC in Amsterdam. Uh, morning to you all. Um, my name is Karan and I'm your host. I work at Maxon. Um, we have a great lineup of amazing artists and Maxon trainers presenting today. Um, you can check out the schedule on uh, before and after the presentation, as well as on the Maxon website um, where you can see who's presenting. We'll also be live streaming these presentations, so if you're not live in audience, you can watch it on Maxon YouTube channel. If you miss out the live, live stream, do not worry. The stream will be uploaded later today on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, we also wanted to tell you to scan the QR code that you see before and after the presentations. Um, you have a chance to win amazing prices from Maxon, Corvive, and Wacom. Um, also, those who miss out, missed out the news, uh, we have a limited time bundle of Maxon 1 and Adobe Substance 3D. It's a 20% off bundle. Uh, you can get more information on our Maxon website. We have Ian Robinson presenting this morning. Um, Ian is an expert ZBrush trainer and 3D character artist and has been doing uh, ZBrush for past nine years. He has worked with various amazing companies like Funko, et cetera, um, and specializes in digital sculpting by making and making to uh, and toy making, actually. And he's going to talk about ZBrush to 3D printing. All yeah. yours, Ian. All right, all right, all right. Thank you very much, Karan, for that introduction. And like Karan said, we have an amazing lineup of trainers today, so you're not going to want to miss that. So that getting being said, ZBrush, digital sculpting, making cool stuff all the time. That's like my philosophy. That's what I live by every day. So if you're new to ZBrush, just really, really quickly, we have a ton of getting started series on maxon.net that really just breaks down how to navigate this program really simply and really quickly. So if you have any questions, you can also see me afterwards. But let's get into this and what we're doing today. First and foremost, I actually have a present for you guys, which is this Raptor we 3D printed. And I'm going to start here. And what you're looking at is this in toy format, or res basically a statue. And so what we want to do today is pretty much showcase how I went from this to that. Now, real quick, it's not, arti okay. <laughs> it's not articulated, so you can't move it. It's glued together. But basically, if you had any interest whatsoever on making something from a digital world to a physical world, you're in the right spot. Because I'm going to show you how we went from this model and sliced it up with keys. So let's quickly look at a render of what it is you're looking at. So, up, oh, wait, we need to switch it over, hopefully. One second. It's still showing ZBrush. Hold on. If it doesn't flip over, we switch back to ZBrush. Boop a doop a doop a doop. OK, let's actually just do this real quick. I'm going to zoom this out. I'm going to hit Shift X, and we're just going to rotate around. And really just taking a look at this figure. And you can see here that we have some holes in the backside and in the front side of the raptor, as well as the raptor's head it has this like kind of square tapered key. And same thing on the tail and on the base. And these are basically keys that insert and connect into each other so that they can actually, oh, hold on. One second. I broke it. My name is Ian Robinson, and I break stuff. How are you guys doing? Are you excited for IBC? Yeah? Have you seen some amazing, amazing presentations so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. <laughs> What's funny is every time I do these presentations, I'm always thinking, don't break it, don't break it, don't break it. And that's the first thing I did. So it is Saturday morning, right? So I think it's going to be OK. Has anybody here used ZBrush before? Just a raise of hands. One, two, three. Oh, wow. All right. Very, very cool. OK. One second, one second. Has anybody here made a statue or 3D printed at all? 
One person in the back. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, very, very cool. No worries, no worries. The anticipation is what's really happening here. We really just want you to be excited. No, 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 you're okay. It's just my dreams coming true. <laughs> I can't believe that. Hat's da nicht gesehen? Was hast du jetzt zum Schluss gemacht? Ich hab's einfach nochmal abgeschlossen. Okay, nicht neu Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, cool. So while we wait, because right now we're having a little bit of technical difficulty, so I do apologize. But as we wait, let me just explain this fun 3D model for you real quick. So I printed this in resin printing, or resin, yeah, resin. It's not, it's just resin. I don't know why I'm trying to explain it more than this. So I printed this in resin, which is ABS fast cure resin. Usually resin like this is usually brittle, and so if I were to drop it, carpet might catch it, but if it'd be, it could shatter and stuff like that. So usually this is used for fast prototyping, and when you're doing fast prototyping, the idea is that you don't want to spend a lot of time printing something that is inevitably just going to be rejected at the end of the process, right? So in total time, I'm going to do a pop quiz and see how many hours do you think this took to, t uh, to print in total, including the base. Four, six, or 12? Anyone? You. Bam, right on the money. This took six hours. It was set up in two different processes, and I ultimately do have a small video of me actually supporting it using Lychee Slicer, which we may not, perfect, thank you, which we may not get into today, but um, I could showcase real quickly kind of what that looks like. And I do plan on having future presentations about actually supporting your prints when you move into an external slicer, which is what you need for 3D printing. So I do see we have some new people. So let's just keep this floating around. There we go. And now we're going to go ahead and get back into it. So if I sh yes, OK. So this is why I wanted to show you, because I thought this was really, really cool. So this is a Redshift render of my model in the separate pieces. So you can really just clearly see how it fits together. And what's really cool about this, and this is something that when you're looking at 3D printing statues in general, what you want to focus on is the actual balance of the model itself. And right now, you can see that I had the base of that square in the middle, straight down. And then I have this long key by the foot that actually inserts into the, into the base itself. The base is solid, because you usually want most of the weight down at the bottom. But because I wanted to make sure there wasn't too much weight on his single foot, which is pretty thin if you think about it, I wanted to make sure that there was, uh, it was hollowed. So then it can actually be lightweight in the middle. But then to counterbalance so it wasn't flimsy, the tail and the head are also solid. So this count acts as two counterweights to make sure that it stays secure. Now, most people, when they're making something that size that's floating around, usually they'll glue that into the base as well, especially after you painted it by hand. So you just kind of get a sense of what is going on. And if you really want to just see the tiny details in the teeth, all of those were printed at an angle that was self-supported, which is a really cool way to go about it. Ah, thank you. OK. So now, how do we get from this boop, to that? So let's go in that today. We're going to cover some key cutting techniques and stuff. So first and foremost, and I'm six foot four, so if you see me crouch down a little bit, that's OK. So here, I have a bunch of different sub tools. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this one today. And I'm just going to come up here really quickly and clone that. So then we can just focus on this one that is happening. And I am definitely going to be making sure that I keep an eye on my time. So. You can see here that I actually already have a key built right here. But how did I get to this point? So let's come back here really fast. 
and let's showcase. I'm going to hit solo mode for a second. So this is my original model right now. And the wireframe itself is pretty dense. If we zoom all the way in, you can see that what I had actually done was I went ahead and I used decimation, uh, ma no, sorry, I used Dynamesh to actually come through and make this watertight. So what does that mean? So if we come here to geometry and we come to Dynamesh, the idea of Dynamesh is that what it does is when I'm sculpting and I'm stretching the geometry, so if I were to take something like this move brush, and I'm really going to come through and stretch and stretch this out like that. So you can see that the actual mesh is breaking. So if I were to rebuild this, that control drag that I just did, what it's going to do is it's going to make sure any internal geometry that's sitting inside of the raptor gets completely deleted, it closes holes, and it makes it watertight. And that's a term you're going to hear a lot of when we're talking about 3D printing, is a watertight mesh. So when we're focused on key cutting, the very first thing I did was I actually did have my base built. And where is that? Doo -doo -doo -doo. So I had my base here. And the thing that I wanted to make sure that when I was looking at the model itself, I'm going to go ahead and come through, is that it was positioned right where I want. Once you position things, you don't want to basically move it once you start setting it up, because we're going to be making very specific cuts. So let's come back here and let's showcase the fastest and coolest way, in my opinion, to make a key cut. And that's with live Boolean. Has anybody here used live Boolean before? No. Fun. So this is going to be awesome. So what is live Boolean? Live Boolean is basically the fastest way to cut a hole into any mesh you want and update it live. Let me just demonstrate real fast. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a very simple cube, not super technical. And I'm going to go ahead and position this on just his back, just so we can get a demonstration. And now we're going to focus on over here, where you see my raptor. And then we also have these kind of, kind of bubble shapes here, right? Well, this one means union or merging. Then this one is actually a subtractive cut. And then this one is an intersect. So what does that mean to you? Well, basically, I want to cut, if I wanted to cut the top of his back with this cube, I would take my main object, make sure that's on top. I take my second object, make sure that's cutting. And then when I go to Live Boolean, you're actually going to see that now that shape disappeared, and now it's cut in here. But now why is this special versus some other Boolean operations? Well, I said it was live. So I can take my gizmo, and I can move this around. And I can position it however I want, and it updates on the fly. This is a really great way to make sure that I see exactly what I'm cutting is true in the position I need it. And at any point in time, because it's just a live Boolean operation, this is just a preview to make sure that I'm getting exactly what I want. So if I turn off live Boolean, you'll see there's my, there's my little rectangle shape. Hit it again, and it's just constantly there. Now, if you hit Shift F, which usually shows you your polyframe, in live Boolean mode, you'll see it has like this kind of anti-aliasing effect. And that's just to let you know where that object actually is. And so I can come through, and if I quick select, and I'm just kind of you know, working on my raptor, the other cool part about that is if I needed to shape my raptor around this area, you can see here that the cut is being respected the entire time. So it's constantly updating live for you, which is just exactly what we want. So now the cool way to make a key after that long explanation, I'm going to come through and actually delete this. And we're going to go ahead and actually cut his head off today. So we're going to go through. And I'm going to insert a plain 3D for this. And we're just going to focus on the plain 3D. So I'm going to go ahead, full frame this by hitting F. And I'm just going to hit solo mode for a second. Now I'm going to turn that wireframe on. And you can see here that I have just a bunch of simple geometry. And we're going to simplify this a little bit. So I'm going to go to geometry. And I'm just going to go ahead and reconstruct my subdivisions down a couple times. This is just going to rebuild what was once previously there. And I'm going to go ahead and delete higher. And now I have this basic shape. From here, we're going to jump into Z Modeler. So I'm going to hit B, Z, M. And now I'm going to come through. And with symmetry turned on by hitting X, I'm just going to select these two, uh, you know, these two polys right here. And I'm going to hover over, press the space bar, and we're going to Q-mesh this. Q-mesh is basically ZBrush's way of extruding, but it also respects edge loops. In this 
In this example, you're not really going to see that too much, but in future examples, which I have on the maxon.net website, you can actually see what that looks like. So from here, I'm going to Q mesh, and I'm going to drag this out. Now, the reason why I'm only doing these couple is because I want to make sure that I have enough space to actually slice all the way across my object and do the actual key cut. And we're building both the male and the female key cuts at the same time using this process. So I'm going to come through on the side. I'm going to mask off this front section. And if you're a cool kid like me, you're going to press and hold Alt at the same time, let go, and that does a reverse mask. So the thing that I was, quote, masking, I didn't have to flip it. I can just come through, press and hold Alt, come in, press and hold Alt, move that forward. And then we're just going to scale this down and kind of just adjust that taper however we would like to do that. What's neat about building your own keys is that it really is dependent on the size of the model, and you can adjust how deep or shallow something should be or how wide or narrow something should be. So in this case, this will be fine. Now we're going to introduce the second feature, which is dynamic subdivision. And the reason for that, if we come over to dynamic subdiv and turn on dynamic, you'll see here that this kind of rounds. But I don't want that. I want a nice, sharp edge. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Shift-D to undo that preview. And if you hit D, it's going to ask you, you want to preview dynamic? You're like, yes, this is a cool feature. So always say yes. So I can shift between the two by Shift-D or D really quickly so I can always see what's going on. Now we're going to do just some quick modeling real fast, adding some edge loops to support the shape of this. So I'm going to come through, hit B, Z, M. And I'm just going to hover over this edge, press and hold the space bar. And we're already set to insert, but I want to insert multiple edge loops, and I want to keep the same poly groups. So I'm just going to go ahead and add in a few of these, add in one or two of these, tap real quick to repeat that action. There we go. And something like that should be good enough for what we're trying to go for. Now, if I hit D again, you can see here that it's a lot softer, a lot rounder. It's not as sharp. That's OK. Another method, if you want it tack sharp, you're like, I absolutely want this to be as sharp as possible, you can actually go to polygroups, and you can go to group by normals. And now every face that's either like a 45 degree angle or greater is going to give you a different polygroup. And what polygroups are, if you're not sure, is a very nice way of organizing and selecting your faces based on the normal. So I can come through and just work on this face if I wanted to, hiding the rest by hitting Control-Shift. But we're not going to worry about that today. The other cool thing about it is we're going to come up to Geometry. We're going to go to Crease. So let's actually close this menu, go to Crease, Crease by Polygroups, boop. So now if I hit D again, look how sharp that is. So this is the preview. This is not the preview. So this is a way to really keep a nice, sharp key the entire time. Now, the second thing we're going to do is we're actually going to give this some thickness, because we want to make sure that we're cutting something that's actually going to fit into each other. And right now, this is a single-sided geometry, which means it's, it's, thin as pa <laughs> it's thinner than paper. It's super thin. It's never going to work. So we're going to actually add some thickness. And again, dynamic subdiv is a preview. So if I come through and start adding some thickness to this, you can see here that now I have an open side on one and a closed side on the other. And this is going to create both fitting keys at the exact same time. So now what do we do with this? We made our key. Congratulations. What do you do, Ian? Well, easy enough. We're going to come through and now place it. So I'm going to actually set this back to 0. And if you want, what you can always do is just Control-Shift-D to duplicate this key and call this OG key. That's what I like to call them. And then I'm going to go ahead and just hide that. And now I'm just dealing with the one. This way, I can actually not have to try to manipulate the same key too many times. I can just come back and grab a spare if I need it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and scale this down. And now, remember I talked about that plane having enough distance to cut? So I'm going to rotate this in a way that makes sense to me. So I think the head should like fit inwards. And now I'm going to just kind of guess on where I think this will fit. Now here's the cool part is that I'm going to go ahead and hit this transparency tool. And this is going to help me really just see inside the model and just see how that is actually fitting. So I can come through and make sure that it's as center as possible. And see here, his neck's actually rotating. And this is pretty straight on. So I can actually rotate this around. 
and see if this actually fits something like that. And then what we can do is this key is actually looking quite thick. Like this is actually massive. So we don't want that much of a space. So this is where that preview shape comes in. So I'm going to go dynamic subdiv, and I'm just going to go ahead and kind of estimate where that should be, drop that down, maybe something more like this. Now, this number that I'm doing is kind of arbitrary at this point. It doesn't really matter. We're just getting an idea of what this is going to look like. And once we're satisfied with this, if I wanted to, I didn't really manipulate this that much. I did change the thickness. I'll just Control-Shift-D one more time. And I'm going to go ahead and actually put this by the tail. And we're going to move this in, rotate it around. So I'm just using the color, colored wheels to rotate. Because in ZBrush, the, uh, the rotation, the scale, and the movement are always active at the same time. So I'm going to come through and kind of place this something like this. Now, usually, when you're prepping for 3D printing, this is a process that takes a while. I'm just flying through this because I only have an hour. <laughs> so, but usually, take your time, really check it out. It doesn't really matter. Like, you want to make sure that this is done right. And if you are used to 3D printing, you kind of know that materials have a shrink value. And I'm going to slightly gloss over that today. But if you want to know more about that afterwards on my demo booth, come ask me about it. But essentially, every material, once you print it from liquid to solid, it's going to shrink just a little bit. And so usually what I recommend is you create like a just 25.4 millimeter cube and go and test print that and then measure it with a pair of calipers. And that will tell you how something on your machine will actually shrink based on the material and the, the actual machine itself. Every machine is different. They're like our best friends. You can only have one. So just keep it through. So. Now we're going to go through. I don't know if that made sense, actually. I saw you laugh, and I was like, what did I just say? OK. <laughs> All right, so now we have, we've used the same key for the same process, right? So now the magic part comes in. I'm going to go ahead and light boolean is turned on. So let's come back to our subtool. Now in ZBrush, we actually have this thing called folders that we can utilize and group things together. And this is going to make key cutting really, really simple. Before, we actually had like a child-parent relationship. And while that's still effective in some situations, I prefer the folder. So what I'm going to do, the quickest way to get the folders in, everything that you want in the folder together, turn on the gizmo. And then this guy right here, which is the transpose all selected subtools, AKA the pizza box, we're going to go ahead and click that. And now with Shift and Control, I'm just going to quickly drag select those three, those three objects. Because I have a, a fourth object in the scene, I'm not selecting that one. So when now when I hit Control F, it's going to say everything that you have visible, you're trying to throw into a folder. And I'm going to say, yep. And let's go ahead and name that. So let's name that our Raptor Cut. Boop. And now everything just got thrown into a folder, which is perfect. And also, it respected our hierarchy. So we had our Raptor on top, and then the keys underneath, which is exactly the way you're going to want it in order to make these cuts possible. And now from here, let's make sure our keys are set back at that actual cut. And you'll notice they disappeared. But if we zoom in a little bit closer, just a little bit closer, we're going to come through. And you can see that we're starting to see that cut there. Now, time for the boring stuff. We have math. Math is always fun, right? So we need to size this. ZBrush's strength is that it's a creative tool that allows you to make whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want except for we kind of made sure that we don't have to worry about the math stuff. The math stuff comes last, and that's where we are right now in this process. So we, let's make sure that our, our, our Raptor is sized exactly as we want. So the easiest way to do that, it comes natively with ZBrush. Under the Z plugin, we're just going to throw that on over, that menu over here to the left-hand side by just hitting this nice little dot right there. And that's going to dock it on the left side. And we're going to come on down to Scale Master. And now this is where the fun stuff comes in. So what we can do is we want to make sure we get the exact size of our Raptor, right? Well, I could just make a box and tear it and tug it and say, boom, there it is, except for that would take forever and it's not going to be accurate. So instead, we have this thing called New Bounding Box Subtool. I'm going to click this. And immediately, it created a bounding box that is the exact size in height, width, and depth for my Raptor. If we go ahead and turn on the actual transparency, you can kind of see that ghosty Raptor in there. And if I zoom in a little bit, you'll see right up to the, the tip of his snout, 
to the tip of his tail, all the way down to the bottom of the key, and also the width. You can see he's like charging at you here. Might be a little hard to see online, but you can see the tail. Everything was accounted for, and this is the exact size of my Raptor. This is our control shape to make sure that our scale is correct. All right? So from here, what we're going to do now is we're going to come up and say set scene scale, because right now ZBrush works in units or millimeters, and you can see that it is based on one. So ZBrush works in a very small scale. And so here, we can actually say, you know what, let's set scene scale. Now, when we do this, we want to make sure that we're actually setting the scale on the object, and we're maintaining that that's our control object. So what I mean is, every time I set scene scale, I don't want to set it to the head, and set it to the tail, and set it to the base, and go back to the cube. That's bouncing around. And when you export, that's where you might get something that you thought was 200 millimeter, and it's actually, you know, maybe 200 feet. So you want to make sure that it is not actually, you know, that the size itself is maintained properly. So here we get a few options. Zebras gives us millimeter, centimeters, feet, and inches. So you have imperial and as well as metric. 3D printing tech tip of the day, if you forget all of this mumbo jumbo I'm throwing at you, 3D printing and the metric system, yes, it goes hand in hand. I have friends who have tossed me inch files, and it comes up teeny tiny, and I'm like, Bro, what did you give me? Like, go rescale that. So millimeters, stay in millimeters. I implore you, please, please, please. You could say, Ian told me to stay in millimeters, and I will back you. Just remember that. So we're going to say millimeter. And notice here, it's giving me 57.92 by 123.17 by 200, which is perfect. That's what I want. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yep, that is it. And now here, you can see that that is my scale. Do I have to now say resize subtool? Only if I want that to be bigger or smaller. But actually, this came in at a pretty good size. But let's say you did want to rescale this, because I prepped this file ahead of time, and your viewers might actually say that it's really, really tiny. So let's say we want to make it just a little bit smaller. So the way to do that is we're going to keep all of the axes on at the same time. And we're going to say maybe this time we want this to be 150 millimeter. Client came back and said 200 is too big. Shrink it down a little bit because I'm trying to do a one, one pole mold. I don't know, something. <laughs> I just threw an example. So now we're going to say that. And then we're going to go down here and say resize subtool with that all selected. And that's going to do the x, y, and z all at the same time. So let's do that. And you can see here, everything is now warping at the speed of light. Boom, you just resized it. Now you can check and say, did this actually do it? And the way to do that is make sure your bounding box is still selected. Come up here, say set scene scale. And now you'll see here that it did confirm 150 millimeter. So I would just pick that. And that's how you can confirm that that's the right size. But once you size it, you're locked. You're good to go. Now, every once in a while, you might get a little error message that pops up. I call it an error message. It's really not. It's more of just a little message that's coming up and saying, hey, your size is exceeded. 100 on the x, y, and z. Do you want to continue? That just means that your scene was probably massively big, and then you went to rescale it at a size much larger, and it exceeded ZBrush's viewport. Just hit OK, and then it will resize all down back to a normal size. It's going to reset everything back to a neutral point, then scale it. So if you ever get that message, just read it. Just be like, yes, that's totally fine. I also do implore that you save a project when you're doing this, because everything that you're building, you don't want to lose that. So it's OK to save a project. And the way to do that is come up here to the file, save as. And we can say, this. I called it Raptor Prep. We'll call this Raptor Prep 2. Boom. Let that save. And that's going to save everything, including my original project, as well as any keys I make. So that's a way to go about it. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. So now, what do we do with this information here? Well, we scaled it, and we're working at a real size. Now we want to go ahead and kind of check and make sure that we're getting something that looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the transparency. And we can see that our key cuts are happening. And now this is what's really cool about the preview. Because we have an actual size that is locked in, and now we know that we're actually making a good key cut, I told you this was the boring part. We got to check our math. <laughs> so from here, we can actually measure pretty quickly in ZBrush. So I'm going to turn on the gizmo, which is this guy right here. But then I'm going to hit Y. And if you're an old school ZBrush user, you might recognize this fun little guy, which is the transpose line. But I really want you to pay attention to these hashes. 
These are actually measurement marks. Now that we've set our scheme, the actual transpose tool updates itself to accommodate for the size of the model. And there, it's actually going to kind of break this up in a way that makes sense. So we can actually now measure effectively with the scale master. So I can come all the way into this. Now, typically, I'm going to throw a number at you. For me and my machine, the printer shrink rate is about 0 0.0015 millimeter, which is less than a human hair distance. So it's pretty small. But sometimes you don't want to go straight to the wire. You want to give yourself a little bit of space. So I usually go to like 0 0.0. Yeah, sometimes I go like 0 0.0025, something like that. So it just depends on the machine. So here, I'm going to come through and just kind of give me a rough estimate based on what I know. So I'm going to come in and say, you know what, with that, I'm going to line this up somewhere that it just looks nice. I'm going to come in and just kind of drag this down. Now if I hit Shift, it's going to pick one point to the other. Sorry, I said 0 0.0. I meant 0 0.1. My math is off. So now this is right here says point. 2.5. Let me correct myself. So sorry, go back real fast. Boop, 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 boop. So I meant 0 0.15, 0 0.1. That's usually shrink rate. Here, I have almost double that. So if I measure that again from this point to this point, I get 0.2363, which is four places in decimal. That's actually quite accurate. So that will be good enough. This is actually quite big. I may take time to adjust it. But again, every machine's different. So I implore you to play with different options. And if you want to dive down more into the 3D printing realm and all that fun, boring stuff that we're going to gloss over today, please feel free to talk to me over there or just research it. It's, there's just so much in depth with 3D printing. But in that being said, that's going to be close enough for today to go through. If I wanted to adjust it, what's really fun is that I can actually come here to geometry. And I can come back down to that dynamics. Uh, um, I can come back down to that thickness. And now here, I can actually shrink that down if I would like. So let's actually go a little bit more. Now, like I said, this number here is arbitrary to the actual size of our measurement. This thickness is just giving us the kind of preview that we may want. So I'm actually going to drop this down just a little bit more. Just kind of get like something guess when it red when it lights up red like that, I could type in like 0 0.0015. Yeah. And then we can come through and actually remeasure that. Say something like that. And I actually went much larger. So now that says 0.3. So now I know I could just actually come down to maybe 0 0.001. Say something like that. So again, you could definitely play with it, see what you get. So yeah, that's fine. We'll call it at 0.214. So now we have the size that we want. So we can actually take this thickness. And let's hit F real quick. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to turn on the wireframe by hitting Shift F. And I'm going to come to this one and do the same thing, 0 0.001. And I know that I measured the one side. And this is the exact same key. So now this is going to give me the same result on that side. And so now that we're all said and done, we can actually make our cut. Now there's two ways to go about doing this. Okay? The first way to go about doing it is to apply on the key our dynamic subdiv. This turns it from a preview to actual mesh. And I can use the arrow key to select the second one, say apply. And then I can come up here to my folder. I like to close my folder when I do this operation. It's just habit. And then I'm going to come up with this cogwheel. And then I'm going to come through. Now we're going to say Boolean that folder. Now we have two Boolean options. We have Boolean folder and Boolean with dynamic subdiv. So if I pick Boolean with folder without applying the dynamic subdiv manually, it's going to give me the thin plane cut which means it's not going to work. All your math just went out the window. So here in this operation, I'm going to say Boolean folder because I applied it. And it's going to think for a second. Boop. There we go. Finished. And now I have this mesh. Now this mesh has been cut, but notice it's still all merged together. But if I zoom all the way in there, we got a polygroup, which is awesome. So the fastest way to check to make sure that you cut your key correctly is we're actually going to come on down here to polygroups. And I'm going to hit full frame for this. And then now, just so you can see, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the line so we're just looking at color, because that's really dark. And I'm going to go ahead and say auto group. And if you cut your keys correctly, which I did not hear on this one, you'll see that the polygroups now change. And that's OK. When you make a mistake, you don't doesn't cut right the first time. We just need to go back and say, why didn't it cut? 
So we can actually come back up here. So you know what? Let's delete this guy. And let's go back in. And let's take a look at this key and see what happens. And do, 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 do. Let's actually turn everything back on. So let's come up to our sub tool, turn that folder on. And we can see here that, for whatever reason, that key was there. So let's see if we could troubleshoot real quick. It was turned off. And if it's turned off, it's not going to necessarily cut. So that might have been the reason. Let's just go ahead and make sure it is cutting all the way through. And let's make sure that our geometry dynamic subdiv is turned off. OK, cool. So let's now try that operation one more time. The eye was turned off, so maybe that's why. We'll give it one more shot. If not, you're going to see troubleshooting live, because that is the life of an artist. We make mistakes. We're never perfect. And we always have to keep trying. All right. So let's do this one more time. Oh, all right. There we go. I do see a polygroup there. So let's hit F one more time. Let's come back down here to do, 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 polygroups. I see it. I swear. There it is. Auto groups. Boom. There it is. So there you go. Make sure all your tools are turned on before you make the operation. And you're good to go. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and take a look at our shape. So we can see here internally we have this female shape. And then if I go ahead and hit sh uh, shift control drag, you can see that I have the actual male shape there, which is perfect. So now what I can do is I can separate these out as independent tools so that when I export them for 3D printing, it's not merged together. I need them to be separate pieces. So I'm just going to quickly go to split, split hidden. I'm going to grab this guy. And I just, again, control shift tapped, uh, isolates the different poly groups. And then we're going to go ahead and say split hidden. And now we've made the cool key. That's the fastest way to really, really do it. We still have some time, so I might show you the second way to do it too. Which is really, that one's going to be really interesting. That might be a lot of steps, so I might fly past that. But what's fun about this now is, let's just finish this real quick. By We're ready to export at this point right here. But I want to point out the active points in total. Every slicer is different. I use Liji Slicer. It's one of my favorites. It's done by Tamal Roussel. You should definitely look at that one. What's fun about it is, 3D printing shapes, if you have like 250 million active polys, that's a lot of information to even throw out a slicer. So what I do is I quickly look at my active points, hit my arrow key, and I take a look at the different ones. This, this tail is only 286,000. This head's only 406. That's totally fine. That's reasonable size for any slicer to go through. This one, however, is 1.3 million active points. That might be a little heavy. Depends on the slicer. So what I'll do is I'll actually go up to Z plugin, and we're going to use a little fun friend called Decimation Master. And I don't have any color, any vertices. I don't have UVs because the fun part about 3D printing is we don't care about the geometry. All we care about is the thing looks as good as we sculpted it, and we're ready to export. We don't need UVs. We don't need subdivisions. None of that stuff. We're actually working in a physical world. So in actual manufacturing, we just need to make sure that it, the shape holds through and can be put into the actual slicing tool. So here, I'm just going to go back up to the Z plugin, and let's scroll on down here. And we're just going to decimate this. And I have a custom setting set at 500, which equates to half a million. And that's perfect. For the amount of detail that's actually on this sculpt, I want to actually make sure <clears throat> that it actually holds. Pardon me real quick. <clears throat> oh, OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to come through. And I'm just going to hit custom real quick. And we're going to let that process. And it might take a couple seconds. But what it's doing is basically it's triangulating. It's taking the mesh itself, calculating how well it needs to go to compress it. And then it's going to triangulate it down, kind of like in a tessellation format, and just bring it down. But it's going to retain the actual details. And now we can see here that it's about 500. And if we quickly take a look at this, this is, I'm going to control Z. This is the before. I'm going to stamp that. I'm going to go Control Shift Z to step forward. So we went from 1, uh, 1.3 million to half. And you can see there's absolutely no difference between that. And you can actually step down further if you would like. Just to keep the example going, I'm actually going to go 150,000. There it is. And you can see here the resolution didn't change. And if you step down like that, you start really massive. And you step down a couple times, you can get your models really low. 
And that's actually going to preserve a lot of detail, making it for better for other uh, applications to hold and process that information. But you can see here, there was no difference, and all of my sculpting there was retained. And that's actually the best part about it. We always want to make sure in the 3D print process that we are retaining the actual, and uh, we're retaining the information that the sculptor put on there. So here, this is good to go. So now we can come through. And again, we had our, our base shape here, so we can finalize this. So this is our bounding box, so I can actually come up here. Now we can start exporting these out. So we have another plugin for that, and that's our 3D print hub. And from here, now we want to make sure that we're actually going to be exporting out the proper size. And you can see here, we had a 150 millimeter shape, but if I come on up to the plugin, you can see here that it doesn't actually know that information. It's still saying that it's basically an inch uh, squared. So instead, what we can do now is we actually need to set the, uh, the scale as well, because these two plugins are not talking to each other. They don't know what the other one did, because they're two separate processes. So, in, so let's actually just dock that over here one more time. And again, like I said, you can go to your bounding box, and you can update the size ratio. And you can see here, this is our actual size. That's inch. This is millimeter. Inches on this side, millimeters on this side. Before, millimeters was on this side. So don't get those crossed. <laughs> so come through and say, yep, that's the one that I want. That's 200 millimeter. And now I can come to X, because here now we can see, there it is. We can see their size is updated. And now we can come to export, and we can start exporting. And I can call this my STLs, call this uh, Raptor is cool. Boom. And now you can come through and say save. And now what's neat is you can actually, it gives you some options. Choice one is just allowing you to save the subtool based on this name that it's giving you. Or you use choice two, because I name my subtools, and I implore all of you to name your subtools. It's very important. Option two will allow you to retain that actual name. So I'm going to say, yep, <clears throat> and let it go through. And now I'll tell you everything was exported. And we can believe ourselves, because let's come here to our Raptor project. There's my folder. And now here it exported stuff. Now it exported everything. So if you want to export and only get the STLs that you absolutely need, you can go through and just delete those real quick, save your project, delete it the subtools you don't need. But more importantly here, I had names. I got my bounding box. I have my OG key. All that stuff exported out fairly well. <clears throat> it's thinking. We had one technical difficulty. Let's hopefully not make two. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, OK. Now I do see some new faces in the crowd. So can you, can you do me a favor, one of you? Perfect. Go ahead and pass that back around. So this is what we've been working on today, just as a fun little reminder. So this model that we were working on right now, we sculpted in ZBrush, and I just showed you how to make the key cuts. And then from there, that is the actual model that was made from this process. So for everybody who's new in the back, go ahead and check that out. And it's not articulated, so don't try to twist the head. That's not fun. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. All right, cool. Now we do have some time. We have about 15 minutes. So real quick, let me show you the other way, which I call it the older process. I'm going to kind of speed through it so I don't take up too much time. But we're going to go ahead and actually cut the base. Now let's go ahead and find that base real quick, which I had it right. Let's go ahead and come through. And let's find it. I think it was this guy right here. I'm going to go ahead and copy that. I'm going to come in. And so we're done with this. And I'm feeling pretty froggy. So I'm going to leap and delete some stuff I don't think I need anymore. And I'm going to go ahead and paste. And now this is the base itself. So now let's, let's cut this base. And now I still do this technique. Even though I just called it the older technique, this is where this technique actually comes into play. I want to make sure that my actual raptor fits in the base correctly, which is this guy right here. That's the only reason why I didn't have it passing around, is because it's not glued together. But what we can do is we want to make sure that it fits. So this is where naming is going to come in. This is my main raptor. So I'm going to call them main final, final, final. You guys know, right? Cut. Boom. We're so certain that this is the right key cut. So now we're going to go ahead and save that there. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to control, I'm going to control, <laughs> control shift D duplicate because I want to actually use the same exact model, but I'm going to inflate it a little bit, make it a bit bigger. But I'm still going to come through and use live Boolean to get this operation done. So I'm going to put this in a folder, call this cut base, boom. And we're going to go ahead and just hide everything else that we don't need. You can do that by holding shift and tapping on all the eyes and then just selecting the things that you absolutely do need. And I need this base right here. I'm going to drag this down. Now I need the base on top this time, not the raptor, because I'm cutting the base. So every time you're cutting the main object, that object needs to be on top. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn that on. And now I'm going to move the base to the raptor, not the other way around, only because I made all my key cuts in that position. And just for my own sanity and OCD, I'm going to make sure that that stays there. So I'm going to move this on up. And then what I'm going to do is just come through here. Let's actually give us a little bit more viewport and just kind of make sure I eye that as close as possible. Now, because we're set in scale, what we can do here is we can actually come in, come on down to def uh, deformation, and I have the raptor selected. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to inflate this a little bit. Now, you might be thinking, when you inflate it, it's going to bubble just a tiny bit, right? It's going to round things. That's OK, too, because that's going to give us some more space in the actual cutting. So you can have a tack sharp cut like we made. That's totally fine. And once you make sure that the, key, that the cut is good distance, then you're going to be good. When you put glue in there and squeeze it in there, it's going to fill and flow correctly. Well, any, if you get a little bit of rounding and distorting, but it's slightly bigger and that key's still going to fit in, that's going to help the glue fl fl flow a little bit better. So it's OK that you might get a little bit, because the thing we're, def uh, we're actually deforming isn't going to be really the final object. We copied this for that reason. So in this case here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to inflate this by like 1, maybe. Maybe 1.5. So we'll just call it 1 for now, just to kind of show, because we don't have too, too much time. And then what I'm going to do here, boop -a -doop -boop, is we're going to come back up to our subtool. And now I'm going to go ahead. Live bowling is still turned on. I'm going to make that an active cut. And now you can see here that that's actually cutting into the rock a little bit. And then there's that base right there. And now here, what's really fun is that we're going to just come in. And we're going to go through the same operation. We're going to come through and say Boolean folder. And then when I make this cut, it's going to come through. There it is. There's our main cut. And now we're going to want to go ahead and just kind of check this a little bit. And so looks like my resolution kind of deformed just a little bit. So I may restart ZBrush in a second just to kind of show down the um, solo buttons that I need. But here, what we're going to do, let's actually come here. Doop -de -doop -boop. Here, let me see something real fast. Yeah, it's going to be fine. So in fact, we're just going to go through. We have our main raptor right here. We're going to come in. And you can actually see from this position that there is a little bit of spacing. Now, because my screen kind of just like re it refreshed in a weird way just based on the crazy technical difficulties that thank you guys for hanging out with me so far, that kind of did. I'm just going to measure this real fast based on these spots. So I'm just going to zoom in here. Usually what I would do is actually come through. You know what? Forget it. <clears throat> Let me do this real fast. I'm going to come up here to Preferences, Config. If you actually want to. Um, Actually, we're going to go here to Interface UI. And let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. No, I can't make that a little bit smaller. That's fine. No worries. Um, what we're going to do, usually what you can do, you've seen solo mode. I'll do solo mode, and then I'll turn around and actually do the, uh, I'll do the transparency, just so I can see inside of it a little bit clearly. But this will work for now. I'm going to turn, where we go? I'm going to turn on my gizmo by hitting W. That was my transpose. I'm going to zoom all the way in real fast, quick, and in a hurry. And then I'm going to come through, and I'm going to measure the spot. And we can see here that we're getting a measurement of almost 0.1. So that might be a little bit small, because we did 0.2 on the last one. So then you can just resize that. So that tells us something very interesting, though. I did deformation of 1, and it gave me 0.1. So now that's going to be the same math when I go ahead and make this cut again. So if I wanted to make this 2, 
then let's actually delete this guy. Let's come back up here. Let's turn on this box. Let's come into this raptor, go back to our deformation real fast. Make sure he's selected. Yep, he's selected. And let's do one, one more time. That inflates him one more, one more. So now it should be 0 0.2, right? So now we're going to come through here, and let's come in, and let's go ahead and boolean our folder real fast. Give ZBrush a little second. There it is. That's awesome. Let's actually hide this guy real quick. Let's kind of zoom in there. Scale that down just a teeny, teeny bit. Perfect. We're going to move in. Now I'm going to go ahead and measure that distance to distance. And that gives me about 0.235. So perfect. So that's a good shape. So that's ready for export as well. So that would be the other way to cut. We still use live Boolean. But originally, I just made a, a pretty much, I just made this shape. And then I just used DynaMesh to weld that all together. And then from there, I just took the Raptor, duplicated it, cut it in, and we are good to go. So then here, I can come through now, go back up to our Z plugin, which is now over here. Beautiful. And I can export that STL. Say sure. Base. All about that base. Perfect. And actually, I'm going to hit Escape real quick. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste this. Actually, let's clone it. Let's come up here to clone. I'm going to hit clone so that it's in solo object, because I just need that one. I don't need to save everything else out again. Let's come up here to Z plugin. I'm going to go ahead and say export and say yep. And again, if you wanted to at this point, you could just say, hey, make sure you see our size ratio. If I hit update size here on this one object, this could cause that conflict like I spoke with before. We already made sure our scale master was set on that measurement of the original Raptor. So I would say refrain from updating too often. You might find a size variant. We updated that once, so we don't want to make sure we, we don't want to complicate too many things. So just we don't have to go through this process. But if you're curious on the size of this exactly, like you need to know, then you could come back here and check it. Just hit Escape, and that won't update that size ratio. So now we're here. And again, we only have a few minutes. So I have a quick video to just kind of talk about what I did after this process. So real fast, I'm going to come through. Let's actually close this video down. And like I said, I had used Legi Slicer to do this next process. But I ended up, let's go ahead and double click this real fast so you can kind of see how we got to the next part. So I, this is Legi Slicer. Just made a recording of me doing it because I didn't think I had enough time to do it here. But I went ahead. And I dropped that model in. And I angled and positioned this in a way that was actually going to support the print process. You can see that the key is actually up, but I wanted to hollow the body. So I ended up making sure that the key was at an angle of about 45 degrees. So then when I would print this, I would actually have to create drain holes in the actual body so that when it's, saw, when it's hollow printing, you don't, um, you don't call with, uh, create what's called suction. Because if there's no ventilation of the actual model, it could actually pull the FET film up and just destroy your printer. So you want to make sure that you hollow your model. So I angled it in that position. And then from here, came through, and I did a hollow process. And I made sure that there was actual holes in there. There was at least a minimum of two holes so that it can actually have air come through and also drain out. And so that's what it looks like a little bit. And then really quickly, right here, see if I hit the button real fast. What I did was, what's cool about a lot of slicers now is the technology is updated. So I was able to just generate automatic supports with a click of a button, which, do, 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 do. Yep, I do it right about here. And what this is going to do is it just calculates really fast. It's just faster than me doing it manually in ZBrush. There are times in ZBrush where I have actually created very specific supports because I understood the process and I knew this had to be supported in a certain way that other uh, slicers couldn't do. So in this case, you know, I was like, I just need to print this, and it's OK. So I just hit automatic. It generated for a second. And then this is what the slicing actually looks like. I mean, sorry, what the supports look like. Then I went through and just quickly edited it to make sure that I got something that I wanted. And then afterwards, I exported it. And the export process is really cool, because the way 3D printing works, for those of you who don't know, is it's basically like 
printing on paper and then stacking that paper on top of each other. Your layer lines come through one after the other. So each white piece that you're looking at, white's going to be what's printed, black is, what, is what's going to be ignored because it's a UV process. So think of this as a really complicated mask. And it's just about 2,282 different masks that make up just the body of this raptor. And you can see it's actually hollowed in there. It's a really cool process, really, really fun stuff. And once all of that is said and done, that is how we ultimately go from this ZBrush model right here, boop, this fun little dude right here, to something that looks a lot like this guy right here. All right, all right. Any questions? I knew I threw just a ton of information at everybody. But if anybody would like to see what this looks like, you can come on up and uh, come check it out. But yeah, that's going to be pretty much my presentation. So thank you all for hanging out with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But seriously, if you guys have any questions, anybody? All right, all right, all right. I think that's it. Thank you, Ian. Did you all enjoy it? Yeah? All right. To learn more, of course, you can go to maxon.net and go on the Learn bot button and um, ask for anything that you require. Learn over there. Go to YouTube Maxon channel. Look at the training series. Ian will be here at the demo booth today, tomorrow, on Monday. You can speak to him, get all the insights, um, do everything about it. Yep, yep. Learn more. Uh, go ZBrush, I guess. Thank you. This is for you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much for being an awesome host. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great one.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, Welcome back and morning, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed the previous presentation with Ian. We have uh, Jonas now. Jonas is the training manager and master trainer at Maxon and has been educating and doing training for a lot of years now. He did not tell me how many years. That means it's a lot of years, correct? Well, um, <laughs> of course, and he also does training for everyone, but if you want to be a trainer or a pro user or training certification, he's the guy. So after the presentation, you can always ask him, ask him anything. He's the most awesome trainer I've known and I work with. Oh, thank you. So it's going to be fun. Enjoy the presentation. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Karan. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, as you already said, my name is Jonas, um, and he said this quite high now so I hope I can um, I can meet it so today I'm going to talk about eye-catching motion graphics and simulations in Cinema 4D and Redshift and basically I'm going to create uh, a motion graphics piece that is based on simulation and this is what I'm gonna create so I hope you like it and uh, are excited uh, on getting into it. So let me maybe analyze a few things uh, in here. It looks pretty complex, but if you break it down to its um, ingredients, it's actually, let's say, OK. So um, we have this, well, a lot of particles that are emitting pyro here. That's, by the way, a new feature in Cinema 4D 2024 that you can emit pyro directly from particles, which is quite cool. Um, they are colorful and they are um, they have like a curl noise behavior here and then we have these uh, pyro uh, elements here at the beginning um, this is pyro emitting from points of an object and then we have these lightnings and yeah I'm gonna recreate all of this uh, hopefully within the next 50 minutes are you excited very cool all right, let's jump into Cinema 4D and let's recreate this then. And here we are. That's the new Cinema 4D 2024. And what I want to start with is simply a particle emitter. And when you press play, you can see, all right, it's a particle emitter, right? It's, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything special about it. 
so far. Um, I'm going to bring up the birth rate. I'm also going to bring down the lifetime to, let's say, 60. I'm going to bring up the... Well, let's, let's keep the speed, but let's add some variation here. And that's it for now. The next thing I'm going to take care of is the emitter settings. So I'm going to bring down the emitter size to, let's say, 2 by 2 and then also bring up the angle for horizontal and vertical so that I'm creating particles that are shooting in all directions. So far, so good. The next thing I want to do is I want to animate this emitter along a circle spline. And I just did this with a circle spline, but this can, do, uh, can be any shape. It can also be animated uh, like manually without um, animating it along a spline. It can be, uh, it can be text. It's, it can be anything. I'm just going to use a circle to save some time here. So this is my circle. And then I'm going to right click the emitter and create from the animation tags an align to spline tag. There we go. And I'm going to drag and drop the circle spline into the spline path here so that the particle emitter is now here. And then I want to animate it along the spline. However, before I do that, I'm going to go to the project settings. And I want to adjust the frames per second, because I'm working with 30 frames per second here at the moment. I want to bring this down to 25. And um, just in case, I'm also going to open up the render settings and adjust the frame rate here also to 25, because these frame rates for rendering and for working in the scene can be different. So you can work in the scene with 25 frames per second, but then render with 50 or 100 frames per second, for example. OK. That sounds good. And the next step is to animate this thing. So let me set a keyframe at position 0. And the time is also frame 0. So let's set this keyframe. Let's go to the last frame here, which is frame 75 now. Set the position to 100% and add another keyframe. So now when I press play here, we have this particle emitter animating around in a circle. Good. Let me have a look at the animation curve. So I'm going to bring up the timeline here and set it to F-curve mode. Now you can see that I have uh, ease in and ease out. That's the default. I'm going to set this to linear interpolation by simply hitting this button. And then... I don't know if you can see it here on, uh, on the screen, but there is a black line here. And that means that after my last keyframe, this value will just be constant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the track. And then I have uh, these neat settings here for um, what's going to happen before and after the first and last keyframe. And I'm going to set the after um, to continue. And this way, uh, it will loop until infinity. So when I bring this up to, let's say, 150 frames per second, we will have two rotations. And yeah, I can, I can loop this up until infinity, as I said. Oops, some smileys. That's always good. All right, let me bring this back. There we go. OK, now I'm happy with the animation. And I now want to trace these particles to really um, see what their paths are. That's then cool for setting up the curl noise to really see what the shapes are like. So let me, with the emitter selected, just go to the MoGraph generators menu here and just create a tracer. And now when I press play, you can see that we have a ton of spline that are being created. And yeah, now we can shape these. And the way. I want to shape these is with a curl noise. So there is no like one-click solution for creating a curl noise uh, inside of Cinema 4D, but we can create ourselves a one-click solution for that. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to set up the curl noise for us, and then how to turn it into something that you can reuse quickly. So let's do this. I'm going to start with the field force object. So let's go to Simulate, Forces, and Field Force. And this is a force that you can use to create your own custom forces. And these are going to be based on fields. So just to give you an example, if you don't know the field force uh, object yet, I just create a linear field here. So let me do this. And now 
we have um, a few lines in here. It's a linear gradient, so uh, from the left to the right. So we have these lines that are pointing from the left to the right or from the right to the left. And they are pretty long here on this side and pretty short on this side. That means that we have a direction here, and the length of these lines is the speed um, of the force or the strength of the force. So let me give you an example here, uh, simply by pressing play now, because the field force is already going to work. So now you can see that the particles here are slowly going like some sort of uh, the left side. And here, on the left side, there is no wind. And this is because these lines here, or the strength, is zero. So when I move this to this side here, then you can see the default behavior. And if I push it to this side, then uh, everything will just go to the, to the left. All right. There are a few other things that are pretty exciting in the field force. Uh, and these are the velocity types. This one is add to velocity. This pretty much is the same as wind or gravity um, or turbulence. But you can also set this up so it, that it's using the direction and speed um, of the field force for the particles or just the direction. So with set absolute velocity, you can now see that, well, let me bring this up a little bit. Let's go to 50, that it's creating longer lines here because the speed is higher. And here, it's not creating lines at all because there is no speed. Um, yeah, we can also set this to change direction. Then it will use the speed that is defined in the particle emitter, including the variation. Um, yeah, and the directions defined here in the field. As you can see, here at this threshold where the values are zero, it will just go to the like random directions again. OK, so far so good. I'm going to set it to set absolute velocity, and I'm also going to bring it up already to something like 200. That's uh, what I need later. OK, now let's create the curl noise. This was just for explaining the field force in general. So the curl noise is based on a Perlin noise. So let me create a random field. And let me just add it to the field force, not by making it a child, but by dragging and dropping it into this list. And now you can see all these random vectors here. And if I press play, yeah, there are some random movements happening. We can set up the random field so that the scale of the noise is a bit bigger. And suddenly, you can see something. All right. Another thing that I want to set up now is that we, um, that we see the vectors directly from the, um, from the field force. We already can see them. This is the display of the directions. Um, but I'm going to set these up so that this is a lot higher and just a single line here. Going to bring up the line density and maybe bring down the display vector length. So now you can see the directions that are happening um, on this uh, layer here. OK, so that's looking fine. But what's happening here is with the noise, the directions are set up in a way that the particles are moving from the 0% values to the 100% values um, in the noise, or from black to white, or vice versa depending on how you set it up. But the curl noise is more or less a direction where um, it's finding a gray value or one value and then just creating circles using this value. So how can we do this? Well, unfortunately, we cannot do this directly in the random field. Uh, we have to take an extra mile here and use a volume builder. So the volume builder. Um, once we make the random field a child of it, can create geometry out of a noise, but it can also be used to create vectors or directions out of a noise. So let me go to the volume builder, and in here, I'm going to set the volume type to vector. Right? And now we have this little box that we can use to create these directions that we need for the curl noise. All right, let's have a look at the field force. The, vo uh, the random field is still in there. We don't need that. We need the volume builder now. So I'm going to drag and drop the volume builder in here. And I'm going to add it as a volume object. All right. 
that's pretty much it. I'm going to make it invisible. And now you can see that our visualization uh, square is much smaller. Why is that? Let me go to the volume builder again. And when I select the random field, you can see that we have this creation space uh, parameter here. And it's set to box. And the size of the box can be defined here. So that's an interesting thing. When you put a noise uh, yeah, in a, into a volume builder, it's not of infinite size. It has boundaries. And we can define the boundaries here. So let me do this. I'm going to set this to 800 by 800 by 400, like so. And suddenly, we can see that uh, it's the same size as before again. Now, in theory, when we play this back, it should be the same as before. So still not curled. But here in the Volume Builder, we have the option to curl this simply by adding one of these filters here. There is one that is called Vector Curl. And once I do that, uh, let's have a look at this section here. Because then you will see that it's suddenly create, um, creating circles around um, yeah, uh, areas of um, yeah, weight in the noise with the same weight value. OK, and then just in case, I'm going to create another one to normalize these vectors. That means that all the vectors are the same length, meaning everything has the same speed when it comes to the particle simulation. This is something we need. And that's pretty much it. Now let me deactivate the display here. And let's just press play and see what happens. I think this is looking like a curl noise, isn't it? So there we go. This is the, uh, <laughs> thanks Darren, thanks to me. Um, this is the visualization of our curl noise. Um, it's looking cool already, but as I said, I want to emit pyro instead of just creating splines here. So let's do this. We now have our setup for the curl noise. So I'm going to delete the tracer now. And instead, I'm going to right click the emitter, go to simulation tags, and add a pyro emitter. Let's play this back. And this looks pretty cool. Not exactly what we wanted, but it looks cool. Everything is now affected by the curl noise. And that means we get these, um, these uh, stripes, or, or um, I don't know how to call them in English, um, but these nice little shapes uh, created from smoke. And this is because yeah, the field force is affecting the particles, but also pyro. So let me adjust a few things. Um, in the emitter, I'm going to first bring the thickness down to zero. The thickness is the, the size of the sphere that is created um, uh, for pyro emission. So let's bring this down. Let me also go to the project settings again. The shortcut, by the way, is uh, Control-D. I'm going to use that uh, from now on. And I'm going to go to the pyro settings and set the voxel size down to 2 as well. And then I scroll down, and at the very bottom of the pyro settings, I find the forces include exclude list. And I'm just going to drag and drop the field force in here. And maybe let me rename this as well to curl field force. And now it's here in the list. And let's see what's happening now. So now we are using the curl noise on the particles, but not on the pyro anymore. So the only force that is uh, on the pyro um, is now its own buoyancy, more or less. OK, good. Let's set up a few more things. Here in the pyro settings, I'm going to go to the density settings, and I'm going to bring down the dissipation to um, make the, the, the smoke fade away much slower. And then in the pyro emitter, I'm going to bring up the density add parameter to, let's say, something like 60. And then we already have this. I'm quite happy with that. It looks cool. OK, so the next step would be to create a second force, because what you can see is that initially there is some movement going on um, in the smoke, 
But then there isn't because the buoyancy is gone and this part of the smoke here, for example, is just standing there and not yeah, doing much. So I'm going to create a second curl noise uh, field force here and I'm just going to add it to the smoke. And I'm going to set this one to add to velocity. Uh, I'm going to bring down the speed here and then I'm just going to exclude it from the emitter. So let's do this, like so. Let's press play again. And that looks a little more interesting because the smoke is now slowly following the initial movement of the particles. OK. Cool. I did promise you to show you how you can turn this curl noise setup into something that is more or less a one-click solution, right? And the way you can do this is by taking advantage of the Asset Browser. So what you can do is you can turn every setup that you create into a reusable asset. Um, the only thing that you need to know is that you can only do that with like one object and its children. So what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to make my volume builder a child of the field force, and then I just drag and drop that over right now into uncategorized. It's going to bring up uh, this little dialog, so I can choose a database, for example, my own database, but I can also um, move it to the preferences database so that it's um, available also in all, um, in all versions or in all scenes in this uh, installation. So let's do this. Usually I would use um, a personal uh, one because I can share this with my colleagues, with my friends, and um, also just use the personal one then in other installations of Cinema 4D. So now we have this curl noise um, uh, in here, and if I create a new scene, I can simply double-click here and the whole setup is there. Well, it's a double-click solution, right? You got me. But now, um, if I create an emitter here, and let's also trace this one, and press play, everything just works already, right? And you can make more complicated setups here and link some parameters up in Expresso and so on, and save that with the asset versioning is supported, which is great. All right, let me go back to this scene. And now let's make everything a little bit more colorful because you saw all of these colors in the initial one, right? So what I'm going to do here is first I'm going to go to the pyro emitter settings and activate color. And then in here I'm just going to set this to orange. I'm going to have orange, pink, and blue in the end. So now we are emitting orange smoke. And the next thing I'm going to do is go to the emitter to the particle settings, I'm going to bring down the birth rate and create two copies of this. And I could also set this up in thinking particles, but I think the easier way to set it up is with standard particles and also um, it's more visual because we have it all in the object uh, manager. So let me set this one here to pink and the next one to blue, like so. If I press play now, we still, see uh, we still don't see a lot of color, and this is because all of the emitters are using the same seed. So let me go to this emitter. It has a seed of zero. This emitter, uh, I'm going to set the uh, seed to one, and for this emitter, I'm going to set the seed to two. And now it should be nice and colorful. Look at this. And it's so simple. All right, so this is already the curl noise pyro smoke part of it. Now, the next part is an emitter that um, has some cool movements, like many, uh, many emitters, more or less, that are yeah, doing a cool movement and therefore look very dynamic. Um, in order to create that, let me quickly deactivate the emitters and just create a platonic. And I'm going to place the platonic here. I'm just going to create a copy of the align to spline so that we have this. 
I'm going to set the platonic to be an octa, and I'm going to make it a little smaller. And I'm also going to create a simulation tag on it, pyro emitter. There we go. So let me also set the thickness up here to 2. As I said before, that's the radius of the pyro um, emitter now. By default, it's emitting from the surface. I don't want that. I want to emit from the points. That's also something new in Cinema 4D 2024. So now, wait, is this visible? Yeah, it's visible. Still not enough density for my taste. So let me go down here to the density, and let's just bring this up to something like 50. And I'm also going to set the color to something grayish. So now we have this. All right, so far so good. The problem now is it doesn't look super cool because there is no movement, like no relative movement between these particles. They are keeping their same relative position to each other. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to deform the platonic um, using a random effector. You can use effectors to deform uh, objects. So everything you need to do is to edit as a child. So I'm just going to hold down the Shift key now. This way, it's going to be created as a child. And then I'm going to go to the Deformer tab and set this to point. So now you can see that something happened already. But although it's random, and it's looking more interesting, um, there's still no like, relative movement between these, um, between these points. So let me go to the Effector tab of the Random Effector. And let me set the random mode to something that is animated, like noise. So now this changed. I'm going to also set this to index to make all the uh, different movements more independent from each other. And let's have a look at this now. So this looks much cooler. And I'm going to make the platonic invisible now. So this is a cool uh, way of creating, like, or of easily animating a whole bunch of pyro, whatever, if you have, uh, for example, a character who's doing this and uh, you want uh, pyro to smash into a building or something, this would be a cool way to do that because you only have to animate one object and uh, then the pyro will just be emitted from the points. However, it's a little bit too much for my taste, so let me first bring down the radius of the platonic, maybe to 5, and then let me also bring down the strength of the effector to something like this. I'm quite happy with that. All right, now let me bring back the other particles and pyro simulation. And then suddenly we have this. So we have a clear starting point. That's way better than before. And we have the cool uh, looking kernel is here. All right. That is great. But there's one little detail missing, the lightnings. So how can we create some lightnings here? Some lightnings that are following the curl noise, but yeah, they, sh they still need to be independent. All right, the way I did this was uh, by using a few um, spline modifiers, uh, spline modifier capsules to be more precise. Now, let me quickly deactivate all of this and then yeah, just create a duplicate of this emitter here. So let me call this Lightning1. And let's reactivate it. Let's just get rid of the pyro tag and let's see what we have. OK, we still have particles. And we need less. We need less. So let me bring the birth rate maybe down to 5, and maybe the visibility also um, a little bit more down. I could also go down with the birth rate, but this would result in um, less random um, um, starting locations or birth locations for the particles. That's why I'm bringing up the birth rate, but then bring down the visibility uh, to create more randomness. And now we have these little particles here. And I'm going to trace the particles. 
like so, with the tracer, and now we have this. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I want to modify these splines that I just created. So in the tracer, I'm going to go to from end and just create a little bit of length here, maybe 20. So it's tracing for 20 frames, and then the splines are just following the particles. That looks cool. Still doesn't look like a lightning. Um, and also, it's too close to the particle itself. I want some, some distance between the particle and the actual spline. So how can I do that? Well, there are some spline modifiers in the Asset Browser. Who didn't know the uh, that there are spline modifiers in Cinema 4D? Who didn't know? OK, many people. So check this out. You go to the Asset Browser and just search for spline. And then here under Operators, you can see a few things that are related to splines. And the orange ones are spline modifiers. They have been created by Rocket Lasso, uh, the, the incredibly talented team at Rocket Lasso. So we can also search for Rocket Lasso here. And then we have the stuff they created, also a few other very cool uh, generators. And here we have a trim spline modifier, and we have a an electric spline modifier. These are the two that we are going to use. There are more spline modifiers, like a dash spline modifier, creating procedurally dashed lines, for example. Super helpful. Um, I'm going to use the trim spline modifier first and just make it a child of the lightning. And now I'm going to trim this start a little bit. Let me see. No, that was wrong. Did it? Oh, yeah. I need to make it a child of the tracer, of course. And now you can see, look at this. So this is the default one, and it's procedurally shortening the spline here. And the interesting thing about this is that this is procedural. So and the next thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to add an electric spline modifier, like so. And suddenly, I have electric lines. And they are completely procedural. That's the cool thing. Yeah, and as you can see, you can add them just as a deformer to any other object. Let me set up the electric spline a little bit more. So I want to bring down the displacement, maybe to something like 20. And also, what the electric spline modifier has uh, activated by default is that it's fixing the start and end point. So I'm going to bring down the fixed start and end to 0 to make the splines even more random. And now I have electric lines here which is cool. So these are my lightning. I can't type today. Lightning one, and I'm going to make this one green. Let's do this right now. Let's go to the basic settings here and just use custom color for now so we can see that in the viewport. So now they are slightly greenish. And yeah, I like the look of them. And now I can create more of these. So just for the sake of this example, well, no, let's, let's create four of them. So two of them are going to be green, and two of them are going to be blue. So let's just type in blue here and blue there. And then we just need to adjust a few seeds. And we're going to do that in the emitters. So this seed needs to be something else. This seed also needs to be something else, and this one also something else, and now we should have yeah, four different uh, things here. We need to set up a few other things as well to make these more random. So maybe let me bring up uh, the birth rate for one and uh, bring down the birth rate for another one. And yeah, let's just, let's just play with these values here. And suddenly, we are getting a few more lightnings. So, too many for my taste, but we are getting there. Here we go. Maybe these are too many. Yeah, it's still, still a little bit too much, but you can see some stuff going on here. I'm going to colorize these two here blue so that we have a little bit of a, of a variation in color here. So. 
That is looking good so far. But what I also want is I want these to flicker. And this is why I created four of them, so I can make them independently uh, flicker. I cannot make every single um, uh, trace spline here flicker, but I can make the groups of splines that I have here flicker. So let's do this. I'm just uh, going to select all of the emitters here, uh, all of the tracers. Let me just put them here so I can grab them easier. And also in the basic tab, I'm going to set a few keyframes. I'm going to set these two off, set keyframes for viewport and render visibility, then use the G key to go one frame further, um, set them back to default, and maybe I should activate auto keyframing. That's clever here to save some clicks. We already wasted a click on the double click uh, thing, you know? So uh, let's go back to default here. Then next frame, set this to off again, and then set it back on. And two frames later, um, set it off or switch it off. And now we have this. It's not too spectacular. But what we can do now is we can open up the timeline again. And down here, we have all uh, our, um, our keyframes. And we can just move them around, offset them a little bit, and create some variation this way. We don't need to have them as one thing. We can also uh, just put a few keyframes back there. We can also maybe just use these um, here and these back there. Yeah, just create a little bit of variation here, like so. And so. Oh, this is going to be long. There we go. And now it should be way more interesting. Give me a second. Here we go. Let's see. Ah, it's OK. I mean, for, for a first attempt without, uh, without um, checking everything, that's fine. I'm going to use this. OK. So it's still a little bit too many, but that's, uh, that's something we could set up at a later point. Let me just see if there's another interesting frame here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's OK. So let me activate everything again, also the pyro. And let's see what it looks like. There, do you see it? Here we have some more variation in there because of the lightnings now. OK, so let's use this frame and let's get this stuff rendered. So if I uh, fire up a redshift here, it's all black. And that is because we didn't create materials yet. So let me create a pyro volume material. This is the pyro volume material. And once I add that to the pyro output, it's important that it's on the pyro output and not in one of the emitters, you can at least see um, the emission or the, the temperature of it, which is the fire. OK, so I want to see more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two area lights. One is going to be somewhere here, maybe. Let me fire up Redshift just to see what it looks like. That's OK. Let me go here. Rotate this by 180 degrees. And let me move both of them a little bit up. All right. So this is looking way better. But you can see there is no color in there. To activate color, um, we need to change things in two places, first of all. Everything pyro that you see here is based on VDBs, right? And VDBs typically are coming with uh, different grids that are stored within the VDB. Uh, there is one for temperature, one for density, um, usually also one for a velocity uh, by default. At least it is there. Um, but the one that is not on by default is color. So I'm going to set this to on export so that we are exporting 
the color information. And now we can pick it up in the material. So let me select the material, go to the pyro volume here, and then we go down to the color channel. And we can either just type in color here, or we go to the preset, pyro output, color. And this entry here wouldn't be there if we didn't activate it before in the pyro output object. So let's activate color. And there we go. Now it's colorful. Great. However, we are missing some, uh, some things here, the lightnings. So let me create uh, materials for the lightnings. Um, I'm going to just use a standard material. I'm going to bring down the, the diffuse weight and the reflection weight. And I'm going to go down to emission. Going to make this one bluish, well, greenish for the first one, like so. Going to bring up the weight maybe to four or so. And I'm just going to add this to the lightning screen. And I'm going to add a second one where I, colorize, where I change the color to be blue. And I'm going to add this to the other two. There we go. But as you can see, there is no lightning showing up. Why is that? Because we need to tell Redshift that it needs to render these splines. So by default, splines won't be rendered unless you, uh, you sweep them. But you can render them um, if you, you right-click, go to Render Tags, and add a Redshift Object tag. You do that. And then you have this uh, Curve uh, tab here. And you set the mode to Hair Strength or anything else. And then suddenly it will work. Here's our lightnings. They are a little bit too thick. So let me go down with the thickness here. Maybe something more like this. All right. So this is basically the full setup here. What we can also do um, to make this look um, better is we can just go to the first frame here. Um, and then I'm going to bring up the pyro settings and just bring down the voxel size to one centimeter to have more detail in the smoke. And this way, it's going to look richer. So let's play this back. It's also going to take a little longer. Usually, before you render, you would cache this. Let me just go to a frame where the lightnings are popping up. There we go. That looks good. And let's render this. And you can see there's a lot more detail. Maybe let me, yeah, let me play back a few more frames here. But you can already see that it's a little bit slower. Usually, one thing that I do uh, in the pyro settings is here in the, in the tree settings. Um, there is a padding of two. That means that around the visible pyro, it will create a padding of two blocks where it's um, yeah, creating velocity values already. If you bring that down to one, then you will save some time uh, waiting for uh, whatever you're doing. It's too late now, so I'm not going to do this, because otherwise I would have to go through this again. All right. This is looking cool. I like it. Let me also add um, a dome light to light up the other parts a little more. I'm also going to not make it visible for the background. And I'm also going to bring this down quite a lot. But now we see even more. And the next thing I want to do is I want to create a background. I have five more minutes or, f or 10. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to bring up the commander. The cool thing is the commander can now also show things in the asset browser. So here you could also search for the um, spline modifiers, for example. But you can also search for the backdrop. There's a procedural backdrop in here. And I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. And because I have to be fast, I just move the backdrop down instead of moving the pyro simulation up. And let me adjust a few more things here. 
bring this to the back so that we cannot see it anymore. Place this further back. And maybe let's bring up the exposure of both of them. And now it should be much brighter because we don't have a material for the background yet. There we go. OK, I want the background to be pretty dark. So let me create a new material. Let me assign it to the backdrop. Where is it? There we go. Now it's a little bit darker. I want to make it even darker. So let me quickly create a texture in here. Just in case you're not using the Asset Browser a lot, there is a ton of really useful stuff in there. For example, imperfection maps. And I want uh, a smudge map. Smudge. And it's in media if you have the filters on. And I'm going to use. I'm going to use one of these here. Let's go with this one. Maybe I don't know if you can see it here. Let me see if we render this. Yeah, so this is the smudge map. Not looking too bad. I'm just going to bring up these values here to create more tiles. That looks good. Then I'm going to create a ramp to remap the colors. I'm going to use the Alt input here and put that into there. And the interesting thing about using ramps for remapping colors is that you can see now it's much darker. And that is because the default interpolation between knots is smooth. If you set it to linear, uh, it's looking the same as before. So this is something I always do when I use it for remapping. And now I can bring down the color here to make this a little darker. That looks good. We can unsolo this. And now let's also take care of the reflection roughness. I'm going to use another ramp for that. Oh, by the way, one thing that I really like, I mean, with um, control, you can always just like duplicate a node. But if you hold down control and the shift key, you will keep the connection. Aha, I see uh, happy faces. Some people didn't know. All right. OK, let me bring this up. We're going to use a lot of roughness here. Something like that. Throw that into the roughness. And suddenly, it's very rough. I'm also just going to bring down the reflection weight a bit. Like so. And then I'm actually pretty happy with that. Let's make this render a little for some, for some moments. I'm also going to deactivate the HUD because I'm then also going to uh, send it to the picture viewer in a second. Maybe the light back here is a little bit too bright. I don't like that too much. There we go. OK. Let's give it a few seconds, and then we're going to send it over. Well, actually, I forgot something. I wanted to set some stuff up in the pyro material. So let me go in there, pyro volume, and let me bring up the scale for the emission, because this is going to make the whole setup a little bit brighter, especially the fire. There we go. Yep, we're getting there. Do you like it so far? Cool. All right. All right. I think that's, that's clean enough. Let's just go to View and send this to the picture viewer. I'm just saving time this way, because the rendering would take a little longer. Yeah, I'm going to send it to the picture viewer, and I'm going to stop Redshift, because I want to give some final touches to this, uh, simply by bringing up Magic Bullet Looks. And here in Magic Bullet Looks, I'm going to add an effect 
That is called optical diffusion. And this is uh, basically the same engine as um, Optical Glow uh, from VFX Suite. So what we can do with optical diffusion is uh, we could create a glow effect. So I'm going to bring down the size first, maybe to 100. And then I'm going to bring up the glow parameter. And look at this. Th this is making a huge difference already. Maybe like so. I'm going to reduce this to the highlights only. More like so. Maybe we can add more glow now. That's a little too much. And then I'm also going uh, to add another tool here, which is going to be a lens vignette. Just make this a little bit bigger and bring up the strength. Yeah, and let's say we are happy with that. Then this would be, um, yeah, the final. OK, so are you happy with this? Very cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me, let me jump back to the keynote to have a look at the, at the final version here. So after everything I did now, um, I cached the volume. Um, and then I rendered it, of course, um, so that it's, that it's uh, mostly grain-free or noise-free. And yeah. I added the, the magic bullet um, effects and the glow uh, later in compositing and after effects. But this is the final thing. Exactly. So I think I have a few minutes left. Yeah, two minutes are enough. So let me um, quickly uh, talk a little bit about training and certification. So at Maxon, we have a training team. And in the training team, we are doing a lot of cool stuff for the community, for you. And we're constantly hosting live streams and uh, recording tutorials. Let me see if the internet is working here. So here on the Maxon events page, you can see um, all the live streams that we're doing and uh, see all the events that we're, um, where we are in person. So we have uh, live streams here, for example, uh, demystifying post-production uh, live streams every Monday. Um, Max on color and ask the trainer on Thursdays. And yeah, it's VFX and chill on Friday. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of exciting stuff going on. Just in case you want to catch up with some of these, you can always go to the Max on Training Team YouTube channel. Um, this is where we host all the recordings. And of course, if you are new to Cinema 4D, to Redshift, to ZBrush, or to any of the Regiant, um, um, plugins or Forger, you can just go to cineversity.maxon.net and here you find all the Getting Started series for the apps. All right, let me jump back here. Also, we do custom training for a bigger team. So just in case you're working in a bigger team, um, reach out to us and we can train you. The email address would be training at maxon.net. And last but not least, we are also taking care of certification. So we are certifying pro users and trainers. This is what you can see here. These are the two certification types. And if you're interested in that, uh, go to maxon.net slash certification or certification at maxon.net um, as the email address. And that's everything I have. Thank you very much. I hope you liked it. <laughs>
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct Pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new projection deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while to Good afternoon everyone and welcome back and good afternoon to everyone watching live. Um, we have Ellie presenting, uh, she's another Maxon trainer and has been training for past three years. Um, along with that, obviously you can check the schedule before and after the presentation so you know who's presenting. Uh, please also scan the QR code that you will see after the presentation to win prizes from Maxon, Coreweave and uh, Wacom. Ellie, the stage is all yours. Thanks. Hey everyone, how's it going? Oh wow, I'm loud, cool. Um, Hi, as Karan said, my name is Ellie Wade and I am part of the training team here at Maxon. And I promise you I am slightly better at 3D than I am at making PowerPoint presentations. Um, yeah. So the idea of today's presentation is I'm going to talk a little bit about simulation. But I'm going to talk about connecting those simulations together. Because those of you who work in 3D or know Cinema 4D will know that we recently updated the simulation system. And it's now a unified system, which means we can now combine all of the things like uh, cloth, rigid bodies, rope simulations, and all of that stuff can interact together in the same scene. So we're going to talk about a few different things, combining soft and rigid bodies. Rigid bodies came out two, three days ago, uh, Cinema 4D 2024. And then we're going to talk about why things like mass and topology are important. And then, of course, uh, it wouldn't be me without doing a little bit of redshift. And then if there's time, I've got another simulation. Uh, but we shall see. We'll see what happens. OK, let me get into Cinema 4D. And we're going to start off. Actually, let me quickly show you. I put a, I put a few test scenes uh, together, a few test renders uh, earlier. And this is kind of the idea of what we're going to create, first of all. Just this really nice, squishy, soft body uh, combined with the rigid body, which is the logo in the middle. And then we're going to create this, this soft, squishy texture. I'm going to say squishy a lot, so I apologize now. Cool, so we're going to start off just by creating the base shape for the soft body. And we're going to keep it really nice and really simple, and we're going to make a cube. So anyone who comes into Cinema 4D, as soon as you make a cube, you're officially a Cinema 4D artist. So congratulations. I'm just going to resize this a little bit, maybe something like that. And I'm not too fussed about the size and the scaling. I'm going to leave it pretty big because it's going to be connected to Cinema 4D's default scaling, which is nice, which is about 100 centimeters. 
So let's leave it like this. This is as high tech as this gets. And if I just show my segment, I can see that we don't have a lot of topology. We don't have a very dense mesh going on. So I might need to just add some segments in here. So maybe let's go 80 by 12 by something like 150. And it's come in. So we can see we have uh, a dense mesh going on. And this is going to be really important when it comes to creating simulations. We need to make sure we have uh, enough points or enough polygons to then warrant uh, all of the parameters that we're going to want to change. But a little, a little tip here that I actually learned from um, Mikhail, who is Subframe Studios, is he creates a procedural setup using uh, this method and a remesh and a connector, and it can work to update a polygon count or a point count of your simulated objects really easily. And so the way that we can do that is we can take our object, our cube. We can throw it into a remesh. And it won't really look any different at the moment. Uh, if we had not very nice looking topology, what the, the Z remesher algorithm will do, thanks ZBrush, uh, it, will, it will clean up that topology for us. But what I'm going to use it for is I'm going to change my target mode to polygon count. And then I can define the polygon count here for my mesh. And so what I can do, I can start low res. Uh, things are going to be really like fast and snappy. Uh, and then in I can increase this over time because it's going to remain uh, a procedural setup. So let's just, for now, go to like 8,000 on our polygon count. And then I'm also going to just throw this into a connect as well. So this is going to be my setup. This is my, my soft body. It's as simple as that. And let's start to actually add some, some, some squishiness. So let's not have a cube. Let's set up a, oh, my pen's going a little bit weird. Technical problems, love it. Cool, let's, la let's add a plane. So this is going to be our floor. And I'm just going to raise up the cube just so we don't have any intersections going on. And then let's just set up some simulations. So I'm going to right click. I'm going to right click on my connect, go to my simulation tags, and then we're going to add a soft body. So we can now see we we see a whole bunch of lines, a bunch of pink lines. Uh, these are our poles. And when we work with soft bodies, so if I just come over to here, we can see that we have poles per point. Poles are constraints. What they're going to do is they're going to work to maintain the structural integrity of our shape. Uh, basically, it's going to help keep it stiff or potentially squishy. And so what we want to do is we, we do actually want to have to have, we want a lot of points because we want it to maintain its shape. But then we want to then adjust some other settings like softness, bendiness, stretchiness to bring back that squishy feeling. So what I'm going to do is, in my max poles per point, I'm going to change this to something like 25. And now we can see we have a lot of them now. And then we also have a spread value. So if this was at 0, what's happening is at each point, they're firing out a pole to the opposite point in the direction of the point normal. Basically, it's just looking in front of itself and going to the next point. The higher the spread, the more the angle they're going to come out and reach other points. So let's go something like 90. So we can now see we're almost filling that entire volume with these poles. And then we also then can bring more softness back in by just increasing this softness value here. So let's go something like 800. And so. What I like to do when I say, like, let's go 800, uh, I just like to iterate. I like to just try things. Uh, and because simulation is now so fast and it's so well performing in Cinema 4D, I can just try values, press play. If it doesn't really work, I can then adjust those values. And I continue to, to iterate uh, as much as possible until I find something I'm happy with. Let's just add a collider to our floor. And then nothing's going to happen. So well, something's going to happen, but we're not really going to see anything. When I press play, we can't really see uh, the soft body happening. So let's add a rigid body element to this as well. So let's just drop in a sphere. We're going to change this later on, but just for now, keep it nice and simple. 
add a sphere, and then we can just right click on our sphere, come into our simulation tags, and add a rigid body. So now when we press play, we can see that we're getting an element of uh, softness and squishiness occurring now in our, in our cube. So from here, we can start to make things a little bit more interesting by coming back into our cloth tag or our soft body tag, and then going to the surface tab. So the surface tab gives us all of the things that we need to also uh, define and control the look of our simulation. And again, this is where things like topology is really important because all of these values, all of these constraints are based on the points that make up our, uh, the surface of our geometry. So just to run through a couple, bendiness effectively will look at the points around a single point, and it's how much they'll be allowed to bend. With a low value, we'll have a rigid sim. With a higher value, we'll have a bendy sim. Stretchiness is the points, that, so every other point, it's how far they're going to be allowed to stretch from one another. And then the rest are kind of you know, self-explanatory, bounciness, friction, et cetera. So we can use these settings to create a different looking sim, but all the time we're remembering that the, the mesh and the density of the topology is what really is making the difference. So let's maybe add, again, just some values that we like to play around with. I tend to always add a little bit of friction so we prevent objects from sliding around across each other. And then the thickness is the collision distance of objects when they collide. So I can do one centimeter, but if I had smaller objects, I would need a smaller value. And then we come to mass. And so mass is probably one of the most important things when it comes to connecting simulations together. And I didn't know this at first. <laughs> and without having different masses, simulations become unpredictable. Uh, when, and we have errors, and it was kind of driving me crazy a little bit. And then I realized that actually having different objects with different masses will help fix so many problems, and things become more predictable. So let's just change our soft body mass to five. And then my rigid body, we're going to keep on a density or a mass of one. Now let's play this through. And we can now see we're sort of getting a little bit more of a, of a squishy feel. But how can we make this uh, far better or far more interesting? Well, this is where we can come back into that remesh. So this is where we can control that polygon count really easily. And then we can just up this value. So let's go, let's go 15,000. And then what we will need to do, the important thing here, going back into our soft body, you'll notice that we're getting, we're getting some problems in the corners. And that's because, again, this is basing the poles on the points. And because we change the number of points, because we up the polygon count, we need to actually refresh this. And now it's kicked back in, and now it's going to work correctly. And let's even up the softness as well. Why not? And now we can press. OK, my pen is not working very well. Let's go back. OK, I'm going to be track padding it now, everyone. I apologize. So let's just play this through. And so now we can see we're getting a little bit of a nicer looking soft body -ness in here. That's my new word. OK, cool. So now let's go, let's actually go 25,000. Let's just up this. Let's go crazy. And then let's add a, a more interesting rigid body object. Let me just save this because. Why not? Right, so let's, I'm a fan of working with like uh, logos and branding, so I thought I would just uh, steal the Adidas logo for this. And we can paste that in, in here. So let's just set up a, a little bit of an interesting simulation. So let's do a two by one by two. So what I'm doing is I'm just cloning the Adidas logo now. Let's raise that up. And then let's just pull it a little bit closer together. And then maybe we can transform this minus 90 and 90. There we go. OK, 
cool. So we're going to use these. We're going to use these logos to replace the sphere. So we have some more interesting rigid body dynamics going on. And then we can start to really play around with the soft body uh, just a little bit more. So let's pull that in there. And let's pull that down. And finally, just a little bit of variation with a random effector. This is like my go-to go -to cloner setup. Something a little bit like this. And then we can add some varying rotation as well, just so they're going to fall at slightly different um, sort of angles. And then we can drop that rigid body tag that we'd originally made onto the sphere onto my cloner. And then we can press play and just see how this reacts now. OK, so everything's kind of collapsed in on itself. And the reason for that is because I changed the remesh without actually refreshing the poles. So now this should react slightly better. Play that through. And you can see it's still working really fast, even though we have really high, dense meshes all working together. OK, cool. So. From here, the next step is we can actually combine soft body, rigid body with ballooning. So we can add a little bit of inflation now to this squishy pillow. And that's what's going to create those nice bubbles and those nice wrinkles as our rigid body Adidas logo comes down. So let's go into our soft body tag, go into ballooning. And we have the ability to enable ballooning. And then we have something called overpressure, which is uh, kind of like inflation, but it's like a burst of pressure over a period of time, which is our expansion time. So let's say we have an overpressure of 1.5. So now this should slightly inflate as everything collides together. And so this is sort of what we have created this little simulation here. And then, as always, we can throw things into a subdivision surface, and we can create some slightly interesting looking results. But again, the, another reason why I like working in this particular setup is because we can iterate fast, which is what we talked about at the beginning. So not only can I adjust my polygon count really quickly, but I can also come into my random and just start to play around with the seed. And so this just means my animation and my simulation, the way they fall will be slightly different. And I might find something that I'm happy with. Then I can just play it through. And then we just have something that looks a little bit like that. So maybe we can sort of pull them in just slightly, maybe a little bit like that, and play that through. until we get something that we are a little bit happy with. OK, so it's getting a little bit better. But there's a few things that I do actually want to fix and change. And those are going to be in my collisions of now my rigid body. So these are my logos falling down. So let's just increase that friction as well on those. And then maybe we can just reduce that thickness value on, for our collisions. Uh, and then we can hopefully prevent too much of a gap uh, occurring. But before I press play, there's a couple of other things I do like to do. In my project settings, I can define a few, a few things. So you might find when you work with simulations, especially when you're combining different types of simulations together, you might have collision problems or uh, just, just different issues. You, you could have some jittering that we get sometimes where things aren't really falling properly and they're just kind of like wiggling. Um, and those things we can fix inside of the simulation settings. So we can control substeps. But in this case, so substeps can work really well because they make the constraints and the simulation more precise. The downside in this case is increasing the substeps also adds to the stiffness and the rigidity of our simulation. So if I up the substeps, I'm no longer going to get a lot of that soft squishiness. So I need to figure out how I can fix these things without adjusting the substeps. And so we could add dampening. And I heard this described as adding dampening is like having your simulation uh, occur underwater. So the more dampening you have, uh, just the slower and smoother things are going to be. So let's maybe go 8%. 
And then we have collision passes, which can fix any of the intersections and the collisions that can occur uh, without having to do the sub steps. So let's play this through. And now we have these nice little sort of inflating, squishy lines that we can always come in and increase our subsurface on there. Subdivision surface, sorry. And then this is sort of how I created that particular inflating simulation. But there's more that we can do. Uh, we don't have to stop here. We can actually bake this down. And so what, we, what I would do is if I'm then going to go into Redshift, let's say you're satisfied with your animation and you don't need it to be continuously calculating. We can bake it down as in the Lembic, and then we can get into Redshift. We can do some texturing. But there's also some fun stuff we can do with an Alembic to slow down and smooth out our animation. So in order to bake this as Alembic, there's one thing I'm going to do first. I'm actually just going to drop everything into a connect. And what this will do is now when I bake it as an Alembic, it will give me an individual file or individual object for this entire setup and this entire setup. Whereas when I tested without the connect, uh, I was getting like 10 different objects for the cloner uh, that was just harder to control. So this should just give me the one for each. So we have our Adidas logo. And we have our squishy squishy pillow. Select them both. Actually, let's just save it. Select them both. Uh, right click. And then bake as a limbic. And this shouldn't take too long. Of course, depending on the number of frames, as well as the density of your mesh and like the complexity of your simulation, the longer this is going to take. If we just look in the little bottom left, so I don't worry about watching the far bit. I just kind of watch that one and see how long I have to uh, fill time for live. Uh, and then once we have this, we will have our Alembic, our cache data, which we can then uh, slow down. And then we'll also be able to actually just disable uh, this original simulation so it won't have to continue calculating. But at this point now, it's no longer procedural. So I can no longer come back and change my sim. Well, I can. I would just then have to rebake the simulation. So here we go. We've got this. We can see it's now in our scene. Is that me? Oh, god. Cool. And then what we can do is we can just group the original setup, hide that from our scene. We no longer need to see that. And then uh, I'd also recommend just uh, disabling your dynamics or your simulation tags, because uh, sometimes that can just cause some problems. So now we have cached data. So I can actually scrub through the timeline and choose any frame that I like to then render out. And if you press play, we can see we have our simulation running in uh, its, its original speed. But what we can do is there are, there are more advanced and technical ways of creating slow motion animation. But I like, I like fast hacks. That's kind of like my style. Uh, and so what we can do, we can just select the two Alembics. And we can reduce the speed to something like 60%. And it just adds that little, really easy slow motion effect uh, onto this little, this little sim here. OK. So that, that is as advanced as that setup got. And now I'm going to just dive into uh, one that's already got a lighting setup so I can show you how I created that. Um, this kind of foamy, uh, nice texture on there. So let's go to this one. OK, yeah, cool. So it's the same thing. If I just come out of here, uh, you can see that it is basically the exact same thing as before. It's just a cache sim. I slowed this one right down. So it's this nice sort of like slow-mo effect inside of here. And I just added the Nike and the Adidas logo, because because why not? Cool. So with this bit done, we can now look at 
how I created the texture for this. And this is a procedural texture. I like to work with procedural textures. One, because I get to basically explore my own creativity and create a unique material that someone else may not have. And also, when you work with texture maps, we have to sometimes either do like a triplanar effect or we have to UV things, but I like to work and iterate fast and create fast setups. And so working procedurally is a really great way of, of doing that. So let's just come in here and let's reduce this down just to make things a little bit faster. So we go low and then we've got in our system. Yeah, that's fine. We can work with that. And let's just take these materials off. Let's take that off, take that off, and then take these off as well. We want to start from scratch. OK, cool. So we have a, our plane scene here. The only thing it has got is it's already got some redshift lighting in it. So I can just quickly show you what that is. I'll just switch these off. Really simple lighting setup. It is a dome light with a HDR image. And then I just like to add a, a few different area lights just to highlight some, some of the darker areas. And, and it will help bring out the texture and the detail as well. So let's create that. Let's create that material. Let's throw that on our, on our squishy pillow. And then let's start to start to, to create some stuff. OK, so, so this is, I've just created a Redshift standard material. And this is the, the base of that. We have our standard material node. And we have our output, which is outputting to the surface. And the main focus of this material is to be creating elements of detail and texture to really help sell that soft body feel in a procedural way. So first of all, let's just create a sort of a slightly creamy, creamy color here. Yeah, that looks fine. And I'm not going to change anything else in the, in the base settings. What I am going to do is I'm going to begin to use Maxon Noises to create my own version of a texture map for bump and displacement. So if I double click, we actually have access to Maxon Noises inside of Redshift Materials. Just pull that in here. And we can solo this. So the little S key there is going to show me how this noise is projecting onto the surface of my object. Let's just make it a little bit bigger so everyone can see. Cool. So this is the algorithm or the noise pattern that we can see. What I found was Voronoi 1 gives this really cool like cellular pattern. Um, what we can do, we can tweak it and we can combine it with other versions of itself to create a really interesting cell-like material or pattern, which we can then use for our detail. So Let's just come into our output. And in our output, we can just define a few different settings. So maybe we can just increase our cycles to something like 1.5. And then we can, our low clip, as we increase our low clip, you'll notice that the, the darker or the, the blacks become more uh, prominent. And then we can do the opposite with the high clip. And we can pull those down. So we almost just have these little, these little cells, these little dots uh, in here. And then maybe we can decrease our contrast because we don't necessarily want to have 100% black and white values, because then we could get too intense of a uh, displacement going on. So that is our first, that's the first noise. And then what we can do is we can just layer these up and duplicate them to create our own version of a, our own Maxon noise. So if I just duplicate that, solo this one, maybe make them a little bit smaller and then maybe just adjust the seed so we get a different uh, sort of like random distribution. And then one more time, we can then solo that. And again, just make them a little bit smaller on the scale. And then maybe we can adjust the seed again. So we now have this one, this one, and this one. And now we just have to combine them together. And the way that we do that is Double click, add a color layer. So color layer is it's like baby Photoshop. 
basically, we have a color option, so we can input like a color, a texture, a noise, whatever we want. Then we have a mask, similar to a Photoshop layer mask. We can then apply a black and white texture or a grayscale texture to show and hide certain things. And then we have our blending modes. So if we just now solo the color layer, let's just make sure, like we don't need that, don't need that, we can hide all this stuff away. You can layer up to eight different things. We have the base layer, first noise, layer one, second noise, layer two, third noise. We just have to enable all of those and then we can connect them to the relevant color input. So I literally just plug these into the color here. So we've got, we got one, two, three colors. And then we just need to do our magical Photoshop uh, blending and then just multiply these together. And then now what we have is a far more interesting version of the Maxon Noise, which we can use as our surface detail or our surface textures. So how do we do that? Well, let's just give ourselves a little bit of room over here. All we have to do is we have to tell Redshift, hey, this, this little setup here, uh, can you please see it as a bump map or a displacement map? And the way that we do that is we take a bump map node. And uh, let's do a displacement as well. Take a displacement node. All I'm doing is drag and dropping these in. And then, just get rid of that. We can unsolo that connect these together, and then we can connect it into, we have a little bump map input on our standard material. And now, hopefully, hopefully it's visible for everyone. I'm going to leave it really kind of, uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit too intense, just so then like live stream and everyone can see it. But yeah, basically what we're doing is we've, we've cut these little holes out uh, to create this surface detail. But at the moment, it's just, it's just a bump map, so it's just a, a kind of height effect. If I zoomed in really close, you will see that we're not actually getting any physical displacement. So what we can do is we can just throw it also into a displacement node and then plug that in here. And then at the moment, nothing happens because there's a, there's a quick little extra extra step we need to take. So on the, on the squishy pillow object, I just need to add a redshift object tag. And then in geometry, we can override that, enable tessellation, which is subdivision. And then we can also just enable our displacement. And it might be a little bit crazy. Oh, it's actually not too bad. That's not too bad. But let's maybe decrease that a little bit and make sure it's working, give a little refresh. Cool, so now we have the bump and the displacement working to add this nice little, this texture effect. But there is more, we can do more. Let's, let's reopen our material. And so I, I like to spend a lot of time in materials. Uh, I just, it's something I like to do. But you could be happy with this, we could be satisfied. But something that can go a long way, especially in textures like this, uh, when it comes to like, like I was thinking like marshmallow textures was kind of my like inspiration for this. And so a little bit of subsurface can go a long way, especially to bring out uh, these sort of darker patches uh, in the creases. So the way that we do that is back into our original standard material node, we can come down to subsurface. Subsurface basically is when the light hits our object, it's going to absorb that light and it's going to scatter it inside based on these values. So the first thing I'll do is I'm just going to copy the color, the base color that I set up, and I'm going to paste that in the subsurface just so the color matches. And the weight value inside of Redshift, a lot of uh, settings will have a weight value. It's effectively at zero, it's off. So we have no subsurface at the moment. Anything above zero will start to combine with the other settings like base color, reflection, et cetera. So let's just do like a 0.5. We don't want to have uh, like a crazy amount of subsurface. And then the scale is the next most important thing. So the scale is how far into the volume or into the object that the light is going to travel and then scatter. This is based in centimeters, centimeters for Cinema 4D. Um, and so understanding the size of your object when working with subsurface is really important. So we know this was like, this was 200 by 30 by 400 centimeters. So a scale of one maybe isn't really gonna do a great job. So let's say, let's scatter five centimeters into our object. And now we can see it's lightened up those areas. And it just gives that kind of extra little like 
extra little softness with, with the subsurface. Okay, we're doing good for time. Okay, let's, let's do a little part two of this, of this material. So at the moment, what we have is we have this set up here. So we have created the little, uh, little dents in the, the surface of our material. But the more noises you combine and the more kind of color layers you use, just the nicer and the better the material will look. And so what I thought I would do was just copy this entire setup so we can copy and paste it. Again, I like to keep things like fast. And then we can just uh, reverse the colors for the maxon noise. So at the moment, we have uh, black and then white. So up here, we have black and then white. And so if we just reverse these, so let's maybe do like an off-white and then a off-black. And then maybe just change the seed so it's not the exact same as its uh, counterpart. And then we can just do that again. And then what this is going to do is when we then use this as the bump and displacement, instead of it being indented, it's going to be raised. So again, just adding a little bit more detail to the surface of our objects. Here we go. Let's do that. And just change the seed just a little bit, just random values. And then we'll also need to change the blending mode. So because we now have slightly darker uh, noises, we need to just make sure we adjust this. So we get something that looks a little bit like that. So it's kind of the opposite of what we had before. And then all we have to do is tell Redshift again. We just need a bump map so we can see this as a bump and displacement texture map. And then we can connect these together into our input, just in there. But now the trouble is we only have one input for bump and one input for displacement. So how can we, how can we combine these things together? Well, if we just give ourselves, again, a little bit more room, we can actually blend things together. We can use Blender, 3D joke. So let's get a bump blender, and let's get a displacement blender. And we'll just combine these together. Also, for anyone who joined uh, later on, if you're wondering why I'm a little bit slow, my pen tablet's not working, so I'm on the trackpad. But it's OK. I'm a pro. So let's just connect this into the bump map. And then let's unsolo this. So in the bump blender, we have our different layer options, kind of similar to the color layer. We have a blend weight. So as we know, we just need to up that weight value. And then we also have additive mode. So it's just going to add these two bumps on top of each other. And then what we should have is we'll have detail on the outside and detail now going on the inside. And then we can just do the same thing with the, with the displacement. Again, just some random values in here. And then if I just tell you what, if I switch off the subsurface, you should be able to see this a little bit better. Let me hit a little refresh on there. So now, hopefully, hopefully you can see that there are now dents on the inside and bumps on the outside. Again, just helping to like sell, sell this as a nice, a nice texture here. OK, cool. So we've got, we got some time. We've got some time. So if I just switch subsurface back on, and then just kick that off. This was basically how I created that material. I added uh, some extra little noise elements as well. And then I did come in. And we can use, so we have different diffuse model types. Basically, uh, the Lamb version spheres is a, it's great for like porous materials. So we can again add and make a really uh, a more rough looking material for this. Again, that makes it just give it that nice, nice texture. That's what I like to do. I like to try and create nice textures uh, procedurally. And yeah, this was the, the basics of uh, how I created that texture and that simulation. And so what I do want to do, because I've got a little bit of time left, I do want to do another quick setup, which talks about, again, connecting simulations together. So let's just get rid of that. Let's go to this little basketball hoop and hide that away. OK, 
Okay, let's get into here. So when I was uh, doing some tests for connecting simulations together, I thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun to create a basketball hoop with a basketball net that's a simulation where the basketball can now go through and interact with the net uh, nice and fun. So in the next, hopefully, eight minutes, I will show how to do that uh, nice and quickly. So I'm going to start off just by creating the net shape. And to do that, I'm just going to create a cone, center it into the middle of the, the hoop, and then adjust some of these settings. Let's go 12 and 20, 22. 22. There we go. That's what I need. And the height of 50. And let's just reposition this down. And then we can see our segments and our subdivisions. So again, we know from the last simulation that our density in the topology is really important. But it's even more important for this because I'm going to convert the, the lines that make up the geometry into the net spline. So let's go something like this, uh, maybe like 32. And this is going to become our, our net. And let's just pull that, pull that cone out of there. Out of there, there we go. And then hit C, and C is going to turn it from a parametric object to a polygonal object. And the reason that is good and handy is because now I can just delete this top loop. I can just grab all of those, delete them, come to the bottom, grab all of those, and delete them. And then with my lines selected, or my edges, I can just go Command-A to select them all. And then Shift-C opens up the Commander. And so if you, if, you, if you remember a feature, but you don't know where it is, Shift-C, and you can search for it. And we can do Edge to Spline. And what this will do is if I just come down here, it now separates the spline. So if I delete the cone. We now just have the net, a spline version of the net, which we can then add our rope dynamics to. So let's, do you know what, let's add a floor as well, just so we can show off some other stuff. Add a little floor here. Let's maybe make that black, just so everyone can see it. There we go. And then let's just, on our spline, on our new little net that we created, we can add a rope tag. And then we can press play. Let's just add a collider. And we press play. And everything explodes into loads of tiny little noodles, which isn't exactly what we want. We're kind of hoping for a little bit more of a basketball net vibe. So what we can do is we can take advantage of some of the connectors and the different tags in the simulation system. So we need this to be an individual mesh, an individual net. So let's right click, simulation tags, and then grab a connector. What connector is going to do, again, looks at the points. That's important. And it's going to define a search radius. And it's going to try and find a point within that radius. And it's going to kind of hold on to it like this. It's going to, they're all going to hold on and uh, be like, guys, I'm not going to let you fall. So let's just increase that radius to something like four. And then the connections, the more connections, the stronger, the stronger they're going to be. That's what we need. And then we don't want other objects, because what that will do is it will connect itself to other simulated objects. We want the same object, and we want to update it live. So now we press play. We now have, hopefully you can see, a net that's all together. We no longer have our separate little noodles. But still not really right, because we kind of want it to connect to the hoop. So how do we do that? Well, there's two different ways of doing it. The first way is we could actually fix points in space. So I could select the top loop, and then I could fix those. But the downside is if I then moved the basketball hoop, the net's going to stay in place, and the hoop's going to move around. So I can actually connect it or belt it onto the ring of the hoop. So then if I chose to animate the hoop, the net and the simulation is going to kind of move along with it. So let's do that. So we right click. And then we grab, in our simulation tags, the rope belt. We also have, so this entire setup also works for cloth. 
because the connect would we wouldn't need the connect but it could work the same way but then if you want to connect a uh, cloth to something just use the cloth belt so let's grab the rope belt and it needs a few things so first of all it needs the object and it needs to be a polygonal object it needs to be actual geometry to connect onto which is just going to be that top ring that top hoop there and i've uh I was actually organized enough to name the object that I needed. So I can just drop in the rope belt object. And then I need the, the points that are going to be connected to the hoop. So if I just hide this, I can, oh, it's in there, isn't it? Let's not hide that then. Let's come into our spline. Let's zoom in here. And then let's just go to rectangle selection with my points. This is important. And then we can just grab those top points. And then back in my rope belt, I can go to set. And they've all gone red. And now, magically, it is all connected. Well, it's not magic. It's just Cinema 4D. So finally, I've got, I've got a couple minutes left. So I mean, it wouldn't be a basketball hoop without a basketball actually falling through it and interacting. So let's do that as well. Let's just grab, let's grab the floor, get rid of that. Don't need you anymore. And just for speed, I'm going to keep it nice and simple by grabbing a sphere. And let's shrink this down. And let's drop this sphere into, into this little like torus hoop, just so I can center it correctly. Pull that down, make it maybe a little bit bigger, so we know it's going to fit through. And then pull that out of the hoop. OK, so the way that we get this to work is kind of similar to the Adidas logo when we had that combined with the soft body sim. We just need to add a rigid body simulation tag. And then we can press play. And it kind of doesn't really work. The, the net's like, no, sorry, you, you're not having the, the three points. And so this is where, again, the mass is really important. So I just need to come into my rope sim. And I just need to adjust and reduce the mass of the rope to enable the rigid body sphere to, to fall through. And that's as simple as that. That's how we can create a, a rope, a net, a sim, have it belt onto the basketball hoop, and then have our little basketball going through. So sometimes live, you don't come across the problems when you practice. And so I do like to talk about that a little bit. If, let's say, you were still having problems, collisions, intersections, that's where we come in to our simulation settings. And then we can up things like our sub-steps. We can up things like our collision passes, some dampening, uh, just to, to help fix any of those problems. And then I guess one final little thing. We can do a little, do a little one minute. We can turn this into geometry with uh, one of our favorite generators, the sweep. So if we throw it into a sweep, we can then define the shape of the net, which is just going to be a nice circle, maybe like 0.1. And then we can drop that a bit further down into here. And now NA. We now have some actual physical geometry for our net. And then we can all be playing now in the NBA. Um, yeah, cool. So apologies for all my jokes and the fact that I've had to use a trackpad this entire time. But thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Ellie. That was great. Thanks. And um, yeah, everyone, uh, the next presenters are going to build up their stuff now. Um, we're going to have Max, Chad, and Alex next talking about Red Giant. And yeah, as always, I'm going to tell you, visit the Maxon website, have a look at everything we have there. There's an exciting uh, new bundle, uh, Maxon One plus Adobe Substance, that you could check out. And yeah, other than that, Cineversity, if you are new or if you want to learn more about our uh, applications. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. See you in a few minutes.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct Pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, cloth, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new projection deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, New nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks of objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality, while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. So welcome everybody, we are back, and um, yeah, I have these three gentlemen right next to me. The three musketeers. So, yes, Chad, Alex, and Max from Maxon, and they are now going to take you away talking about titles using Red Chip, uh, Red Giant, sorry. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Have fun with these guys. Thank you. Thanks for being, thank you. Thank you, everybody. That's very kind of you. Uh, so yeah, I'm Chad, and joining me is Alex and Max, and we're going to do a really weird presentation where we're going to like go over two hours, 90 minutes, uh, the three of us. We're going to be talking about doing stuff in uh, Red Giant. And <clears throat> it's uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, with all the great people at Maxon, in this beautiful venue, in this beautiful city. Uh, it's just a really, really fun, really fun thing. So thanks for being here and joining us. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, is really exciting to me about this situation here with the three of us is that I get to work with Alex, and I'm a huge fan of his work. And this actually plays into the theme, so I'm not just kind of like, you know, just building up for nothing here. But this is some of Alex's artwork, and I'd like you to notice, like, up here, you know, this or Excuse me for interrupting you. Oh, Jeff. please, please. Like, before he goes into this, we did not prepare this. Like, I had no clue. <laughs> just, like, I, I just got in here, I watched his laptop, and I was like, <laughs> so, like, this was not planned. Yeah, so. it's a surprise. <laughs> it's an None of us know what the other one's doing. It's great. <laughs> but uh, my secret ploy was to work with Alex, because I'm a huge fan of his work. I think Max is as well. Absolutely. And uh, he has this, like, really frenetic energy. There's just still frames from some of his work, but notice how... There's just, even in these like flat areas of color, there just seems to be this kind of like dirt and that provides so much energy. Look at the, these extra little like doohickeys, you know, all this kind of cool nonsense happening around the frame. It just creates a lot of energy and intensity. And even though these are still frames, they feel like they're almost just like alive. Like you could just feel the motion. You could feel what would happen. If you were to press play right here, you could feel what would happen because there's so much energy in the design. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of stuff that just like there's a couple dots here. What are those dots doing? I don't know what those dots are doing, but they're just there and they add character and energy to the whole piece. 
And then, um, so hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that. And then I was recently in Bruges. And as I was walking around Bruges, they said, I saw the sign for a Salvador Dali exhibition. And if there's one thing I know about life, is that when a Salvador Dali exhibition calls you, you don't send it to voicemail. You know what I'm saying? You pick that up and you talk and you go and you explore the Salvador Dali exhibition. And one of the things that really struck me, if like I zoom in here to this, like, this painting, he, uh, there are a lot of uh, drawings and sketches and things. And you know, they're all done with like, you know, pre-digital stuff. So they're using organic tools. And you know, when, when you're using organic tools, there's an interesting thing that happens. There's, uh, like, like it talks back to you. Like Salvador Dali like, was like, oh, I'm gonna paint this blue line. And then the line was like, maybe not. I don't think I want to do that. I think I want to go in this direction. And I think I want to spread some paint in this direction. And so when you're using organic materials, it speaks back to you. You say, I want you to do this. It says, eh, I feel like doing this. And there's like this great relationship that happens when you have these organic tools. And uh, here's another couple examples here. There's like a watercolor, probably, I don't know my my materials, but uh, you know, something like that. But you can see the chaos here. And even a master as great as Dali can't plan for these little happy accidents, as Bob Ross calls them. Like, it just kind of like spreads all over the place and it has an energy and a character of its own. And here's like one other final example, these ink splotches that are kind of like all over the place. So what I wanted to do in this group thing is I wanted to look at how to use Red Giant tools in the same way where I could get these tools to speak back to me. Where I can say, hey, I want to try this. And it could say, okay, but also have you tried this other thing? And that's really what I wanted to play with. And the Red Giant tools are kind of built for this. They're built for kind of playing. They're built for this kind of like response as much as you can. I mean, keep in mind that computers are literally built so that when you give it an instruction, it does what you say. Like when you type a thing, it types out the thing. It doesn't like come back with like prose or something like that that you didn't intend. It, it's meant, it, they're, they're built that way. But when we're doing art, it's really great to have these opportunities where we get these happy accidents and the software can kind of like inspire us back, which is something that's uh, sometimes lacking with digital, t digital tools. So I was playing around, and these are some kind of like initial experiments that I had. So I was like playing around with some, using Red Giant tools together, and I got this kind of like watercolor look. And then I fiddled with some settings, and I turned that into kind of like an ink and paint type situation. And then I got this like 3D sprocket, and I was moving it around, and it kind of felt like hand-drawn. And the way that the light was hitting this, because of the way I set it up, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. There are textures and patterns here that I could have never predicted. You know what I mean? There's like shapes and the way that light interacts with these settings that I couldn't have specified. So I got a little bit of that kind of like Dali organic medium speaking back thing going on. And this is the final that I came up with here. And um, so as I play it back, you know, there's some random things happening and there's some uh, cool organic things. but. It was the process of making this. Actually, I don't need to, I could make this bigger. There we go. But it was the process of making this that, uh, that was really fun that I'm excited to share with you here. Whenever you're on stage and you take a drink of water while everyone's list, like watching you, it's a really interesting thing because it feels like it takes a very, very long time even no matter how fast you go, it feels like it takes a very long time. So thank you for your saintly patience while I took a drink of water. Okay, so the first thing I did <clears throat> was I made this head in mirror, which I thought was pretty fun. So I applied trap code mirror. <clears throat> Most of the tools I'm going to be using are from the universe collection of tools. Some stuff is native in After Effects. I'll talk about that as well. And then um, a, f a few trap code things here and there. Not too much, but one of them is Mir. And Mir is a very interesting tool. I actually did a course on Cineversity, which is free. So I'm not trying to sell you anything. It's free. So if you're interested, if you have the trap code suite and the Red Giant tools, uh, I recommend checking that out. Because Mir is like, this really weird tool to kind of wrap your head around. 
But then once you understand it, it opens up the possibility to do so many incredible things. So to get my, like my major uh, centerpiece for this, I just uh, had the, this is the default settings of Mirror. And basically, Mirror just creates an area of geometry. And by default, it's set to plane. But I could also choose 3D model. And then it goes black for a second because it's like, well, what 3D model? So I have to click choose 3D model or choose model. And then I'm just going to do right here at the top, bust mail, and click OK. And then we have this uh, bust, this mail uh, bust, which is really easy to, uh, to set up here. And then I'm going to go into my shader and make sure that that's set to smooth. It is, so that's good. I could go ahead and increase the size of that here, move that around, yada, yada. But this is fully 3D. You know, I could have him look around, what's over there, what's over there. Uh, and, and this becomes really cool when I create lights. So if I go over here and I make these lights, I can uh, really add a lot of dimension to this here. And so what I did is I just made a couple lights. I did one that was kind of like a key light type thing. And then I did one that was like a backlight. So we just got like the edge of him like so. But then, you know, this looks like a, a CG head. It's not very inspiring. Um, but we do have a situation that is like primed and ready to um, look more sexy than it does. So one of the things I did, and this is where I spent a lot of my time, if, you, and if you're in After Effects or Premiere, you can go to the window menu, go to Extensions, RG, or Red Giant Universe Dashboard. And what this is, is it's a collection of capsules, or what we call presets. Um, or presets, what we call capsules, um, here for all these different universe tools. And universe is a collection of like 90-something effects. Do you know how many effects are in universe? I think it's over 100. It's over 100? Yes. OK, it's growing all the time. Um, big collection of effects for all over the place, and they get installed into DaVinci Resolve, to Avid, to Premiere, to Final Cut. Um, so you could use all these tools all over the place, and they're in a bunch of different categories. So there's blurs and generators and motion graphics and ways to stylize footage and all kinds of really amazing things. And if I'm in the dashboard, I can kind of like go and browse through and meander and be like, oh, what you got for me here, Universe? And then I could click on a uh, preset. Like if I click here, I could apply the effect from here, which is convenient. But if I click on the thumbnail itself, I get to this hidden world of capsules, a bunch of presets that are um, made for that particular effect. Now, I've been at Maxon long enough that I've actually been able to participate in the creation of some of these capsules. And the process is actually really interesting because you know, I, I was responsible for making some, and I would make them, and then I would send them off to a bunch of other artists and designers, and they would give me feedback and be like, that's really dumb. Why would you ever do that? Uh, or whatever. They were much nicer. But like, they would give me a bunch of feedback. And so it went through these processes of you know, kind of getting refined and um, and collated and uh, gathered in a very intentional way. And so that is one of my tips for having the software speak back to you, is by using these presets, it's almost like it turns you into an art director. So you, I can say, I don't have to open up a tool and be like, OK, I want to change this setting to this setting. I can be like an art director and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you, like a great, great team of artists, why don't you get together, put your heads together, inspire me, wow, and dazzle me, Give me some ideas to choose from, and then I can tweak it to my, to my liking. So these presets are kind of like one modern way where we can have uh, our software speak back to us and give us feedback and inspire us. So I went to, um, in the stylized category, is, is phenomenal. The stylized category is probably the best category of universe. Don't tell anybody else I said that. Like, generators, we love you. Motion graphics, you got some great stuff going on too, but stylized, you're my favorite. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to go to this hollow matrix effect, which uh, is great for simulating any kind of like screens, holograms, any kind of stuff like that. So it has like glitches built in. There's like a separate glitch effect, which is also amazing. But then hollow matrix also has uh, glitch effects. And I don't remember which one I used, but it was a good one. Whatever a preset that I used, it was amazing. Uh, so I can just go, I'll just click Mockingbird, which it's like this like, kind of like hologram. So then I have this thing, and you can see if I, as I zoom in, it kind of created this like uh, matrix thing like, that makes it look like it's being projected on a screen. There are some glitches here. If I animate this, you can see that this animates. And there's this kind of like distortion on the side here. Uh, there we go. 
So you see that like there's some frames that are kind of like normal, and then there's like this kind of like distortion that kind of like waves down through it, and there's just kind of occasional pop. There's all, all kinds of stuff. So again, I didn't have to specify every single thing, like Dali with the paint of the brush. I didn't have to specify every single thing that I wanted. I said. I kind of want something distorted. I kind of want something that looks like a screen. And then, like the watercolors,、uh, the software was like, "Okay, but have you thought of this?" And I really、uh, appreciate that about that. And then I also went to、um, the same spot again, and I went to stylize. And there's this cool multi-tone effect. And so I applied multi-tone. And again, I don't remember which、uh, preset that I used. But I'll just go ahead and apply that. Yeah, that looks actually pretty close. I probably just used the default settings. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. That's what I did.、Um, the default settings sometimes are great. I think I tweaked them a little bit, but but look how that changed the shadows and the、uh, the highlights. And you might say, if you're familiar with After Effects, well, there's already the tritone effect, buddy,、um, because you can already color the the highlights, midtones, and shadows. But With the multitone effect, you have the ability to adjust where the midpoint is. So, in the regular tritone effect, what is the highlight? What is the midtone? Not to wax philosophical, but like, what is the highlight? What is the shadow? And you don't have any control over that. But here, with this, with the, with、uh, multitone, I do have、uh, control over what is considered a highlight, what is considered a shadow, which is pretty fun. Okay, hold for an eternally long drink of water. Thank you for remaining here. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so that's like the the head that I made, and I'm going to、uh, move a little quicker here because、um, I'm going to leave time for everybody. This is a fun thing that I did.、Um, this doesn't have anything to do with like speaking back, but I wanted to create this kind of like wavy thing in the background. This kind of like、um, well, okay, yeah, this kind of like wavy texture in the background there. And、uh, I was kind of playing around with ways to do that, and I found this like really simple one. So I just like drew a line with the shape layer, just like boop, just like simple straight line. And then、um, I open. If you open up the、uh, shape layer, you can add a repeater. And so then I could go into the repeater and repeat this. And let's make a bunch of copies. And we can't see what's going on here because what the repeater does is it makes a bunch of copies, and then whatever transform settings you set、uh, set in the repeater. It offsets each one by that thing, and by default, it's、uh, set on the x axis here. Yeah, 100 pixels on the x. That's so we can't see it. It's going sideways off screen. So I can、uh, adjust the y. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. And so I could stretch this out, and so we see that we have this、uh, repetition. And then if I go and I'm going to unlink scale, I can scale this down in the y axis. So it creates this like cool 1980s Miami Vice. Type thing. Do y'all have Miami Vice? Where you're、oh, from? Miami、that. Vice. Don Johnson. Don Johnson. Yeah, yeah. With this little like five o'clock shadow, like that made five o'clock shadow is cool. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another super fun effect, turbulent displace. And already we got something kind of cool and fun.、Um, and so we can adjust the size of this, like how big this、uh, displacement pattern is, and I can adjust the amount of how much I want to distort this. I could go into crazy values and create something like Alex would make with like the circles and stuff like that. He do that. He does this all the time. I mean, it looks good. It does. It does look good. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I did that and then animated it and、uh, created that little those those bands. It's not the most like jaw dropping trick. So you know, you don't have to be that wowed by it. It's fine.、Um, so another thing that I did that was fun is in the final.、Um, I have these eyes, and I wanted to create something that felt like spray paint that like was really organic. And I was like, "How do I how do I do that?" And so that was one of the things I think that probably took me the the most time, where I'm like sitting there looking at pictures of like how spray paint behaves, and like, "What do I what am I doing here?"、Um, and、uh, I'm embarrassed to say how long it took me, but the, the the end result was actually pretty fun. So what I did is I took a, a font. And、um, it's just a simple, simple font. And I used a capital letter X and a lowercase letter X, and then sized them up to be the same so that there was some variety. And then I used、uh, rough and edges to、uh, tweak that. And、um, yeah, I won't go too far into that. But another thing that I did for this is I also added、uh, trap code particular. And I'll just、uh, warp to the final here. 
but I added trap code uh, particular using the cloudlet sprite. So it had so, like the shape already had some irregularity. And I just kind of, I used it in the form behavior. So I just kind of spread it out and uh, put some glow on there and some noise that I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, it's pretty fun, pretty fun result. I like that. Now, another thing that I did that was uh, a little zany is uh, played with Echo Space. I don't know if any of you ever used uh, trap code Echo Space. It's a very old plugin, but it still has value. I think, it's, I think it's really cool. So what I did is I made some text and a black background, the you are next text over here. And I pre-comped it. And then I just applied Echo Space. Now, Echo Space is one of those ones, um, like many of our tools, many of the trap code tools, that don't speak to you right away. Like when you apply it, you're like, OK, what did that do? Um, so what I first need to do before I, what's going to do, it's going to make a series of clones that I can control very easily. So I can go into the repeater and say, actually, I don't want this to offset in Z. I want this to offset in X. And I want to lower the opacity. So it's very much like the repeater that we saw with shape layers. Um, and once I get kind of like the parameters that I kind of want to fiddle with, I could set up the instances. Maybe I want like five instances, five copies. And then I click repeat. And then what happens, it makes a series of clones. And there's a bunch of like hidden layers that are created here, a bunch of like nulls and science that I don't understand. But I don't have to understand it because I can just go back over here to my repeater settings and then adjust this. So I could have like this uh, fiddling like this, uh, the rotation, that kind of thing. So this is another way, again, talking about the talking back, the software speaking back to you. Like, if I had to go and manually set each copy and then rotate each copy, like that's, uh, that's too much work and I would give up because it sounds boring. But um, by using Echo Space, I can very quickly iterate a bunch of copies doing a bunch of different things and, um, and, and play with that here, which is, um, I don't know, really fun. I thought it was a fun, a fun way to, to play. Uh, OK, a couple more examples here for you. And uh, let's pause for water. Thank you for staying here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play with this. Oh, yeah, so this is fun. So Symbol Mapper is like one of my favorite tools. And it sounds weird, but if you're trying to create the kind of like frenetic, intense, energetic stuff that Alex uh, makes that I was uh, showing off earlier, um, it's a, a great tool to create random chaos. And so what I did, this is kind of a fun little, th actually, I'm going to go to the uh, dashboard again. This is a fun, a fun thing to play with. I went to Generators, Turbulence Noise, which is kind of like Fractal Noise, uh, renders a little bit faster, and the noise patterns are like a little bit different. Um, but there's all kinds of really great presets to check out. So I'm just going to apply Ridged here. And then one effect that I used all the time in uh, my experiments, I don't know, I'm going through a phase right now where I'm using Chromatown a lot. I love Chromatown. So basically, Chromatown, it takes one copy of your layer and overlays it on another copy of their layer. And um, you can offset them. And then it creates like a chromatic spread between the two. So by default, it kind of creates this like warping thing. But if I go into the quality section, you can kind of see what it's doing. If I take this down to three, yeah, maybe I lied about you can tell what it's doing. In this example, you can't really tell. But you could see that there's like a blue, green, and red like separation. And then as I increase, actually, maybe go to the end. I mean, I'll offset these a little bit more so you can see that. Yeah, there you go. See how it's making a red, blue, and green version of that? Um, and then as I increase the quality, it's increasing the number. So like, it, as I take this up to four, it's bringing in like magenta and yellow, I think, something. And so as I keep increasing the quality, it creates this beautiful chromatic streak. And then I can rotate the end. Look at that. I mean, there's just, I mean, you start playing with uh, Chromatown a little bit, and it's just like you sneeze, and then, oh, whoops, there's beauty everywhere um, <laughs> from, from Chromatown. So what I did is I did that, and then I added some curves to just make this pop. I just wanted anything, just any kind of texture. There we go. And then I applied this amazing new tool, kind of new, called Symbol Mapper. Um, and it basically takes everything on the screen and converts it to characters. 
So it's like made out of characters. And you could choose whether you want uppercase letters, lowercase letters, symbols, numbers, uh, any of that kind of stuff. And maybe I'll take the symbol size down a little bit. Can you see that that's uh, letters there? And I'll maybe take this down in size. And I could take down the spacing into negative values. And so then I have, you know, my original shape, but it's uh, much, much cooler because now it's made out of characters. So there's a lot of chaos and randomness, uh, which is uh, really exciting. And then as I animate uh, this thing, which I think that the, the turbulence noise is already animated. So if I move this around and you can see that this is just already animating just from uh, playing with these presets, uh, that I have something really interesting here. So in the final version, nope. That's not it. In the final version, I just put like a layer of this symbol mapper stuff using the same combination of turbulent noise and chromatown and symbol mapper. I just like overlaid it over the top of like most of the stuff. So you can see that just, it just pr provides this like really interesting texture even in the dark areas. I'm not sure if you can see that. I'll increase the exposure. Whoop. There we go. So you can see the symbol mapper in the background just providing this like really interesting texture that's uh, provides a lot of like chaos and noise and stuff like that. It's pretty fun. Okay. Um, and then we had the final look, and I'll just like walk you through this because I think that that's a big part of creating stuff that looks organic. Doesn't really have anything to do with like the art talking back to you, but I created this final adjustment layer that I think made a really big difference. Uh, final look adjustment layer. Here we go. And I'll zoom in so you can really see what's going on here. So here is before the adjustment layer. Whoop. And you can see that it's, uh, it's dead and lifeless and boring. And I would get thrown out of IBC for showing this. But then I, I add some optical glow. And it's like, OK, you're on thin ice, buddy. We're watching you. And then I add some camera blur, which is really subtle. But I really love this. So here's before the camera lens blur. And here's after. It seems kind of dumb, but you know, in the real world, like no matter where you go, and don't let the rest of IBC hear this, but like no matter how great your cameras are and your lenses are, they can't resolve things perfectly sharp. They just can't. Like if you're like shooting like a box and you zoom in, there's going to be softness on the edge. That's the nature of optics. There's humanity in the man-made glass that we use for lenses. But when we have digital stuff and you say make a straight line, computer's like, hey, I got you on this. I know how to make a straight line. And that line is straight. So when we're creating art that we want to feel organic and have humanity in it, then we have to dirty it up a little bit. We have to take those perfectly sharp edges and just kind of make a little bit of a mess of them. And so this little camera lens blur takes this from being this like computer straight edge and then adds this kind of like life to it. It just adds this softness that adds that like little degree of humanity. Then I bumped this up with curves, and then finally added renoiser, which is a, an effect in uh, the Magic Bullet Looks Suite that just adds a bunch of noise. Because again, if you're just filming something, it adds, you know, it's going to add some degree of noise to it. Camera sensors just add some degree of noise. And if you're wanting something that feels really edgy, chances are it's not going to be super clean. You're going to want this kind of like noise and gunk on the, uh, the, the surface. And so renoiser is the best tool for that. And Renoiser also had this really cool added benefit because here's my X's, my little, uh, my, my spray painted X's. When I added the Renoiser noise, it brought out these extra details and added noise around the, uh, the X's here, which added, you know, made it feel more like kind of spray paint gunk getting uh, all over the surface there. So when we back out, we could see that uh, there's the before, the adjustment layer, um, and then there's after the adjustment layer where now they're allowing me to stay here, which is cool. Now, the last element that I added um, last night in my hotel room <laughs> um, was this little uh, mosaic pattern. And I came up with this trick that I thought was pretty fun for the mosaic thing. So I'm just going to show you that my, my last little thing that I'm going to show you here. Um, so what I did is I created adjustment layer. I created a mask. And then I'm going to apply the good old uh, mosaic effect. Mosaic. And uh, I spelled it correctly. All's good. Now, the mosaic effect, if I crank up my 
exposure here. Oh, wait, there's an adjustment layer, so I can't solo that. There we go. Uh, so the, adjust, the, the mosaic effect, it creates a mosaic out of something. It turns it into squares. But the problem is, is that these numbers, it says uh, how many horizontal blocks you want, how many vertical blocks you want. And the downside of that is that they're not going to be perfect blocks. When this effect was invented back in the day, you know, most uh, pictures were square. And so then it made sense. You would increase the number of horizontal and vertical blocks to the same degree, and then you would have squares. But now, because of the way you know, we're doing stuff uh, widescreen, thankfully, um, then these blocks don't really add up, and they're, they're askew. So what I, I came up with this system. Maybe I'm impressed. I'm an American. I don't know math at all. So if I can add any two numbers together without a calculator, I'm feeling really, really good about myself. So maybe this isn't impressive to anybody else. But um, I wanted to create a system to be able to have easily adjustable um, blocks that were equidistant, equal size. So I know that this is a nine, uh, 1920 by 1080 composition. So what I did is I just made 192 by 108. So I divided them by 10, a number. Uh, and so then I just said 192 by 108. So then I know that I have square blocks because the number of blocks, uh, the ratio, corresponds to my aspect ratio. And then what I did, and here's the smart part that I'm really proud of myself. Mom, if you're watching, I know you've never been prouder here. Um, because what I can do then is I can go to one of these numbers and I could say, okay, divide by two. If this is like too many blocks, I could divide this by two and, um, and then I get, you know, they're still proportionate because I'm still dividing them by the same number. So what I did was, I'll just show you the final example of that. What I did was uh, I created a slider control, an expression controller, and then I linked up these two uh, to this uh, slider. Actually, I could show you this. I can show you this. This is not going to take very long. Max, I'm going to eat into your time for like 30 seconds. Don't I'm really worry, sorry. Man. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, so what I, can, what I did was uh, alt-click on the stopwatch to create an expression, and then I'm going to, uh, after the expression, I'm going to put divide by, a little uh, divide slash sign, and then I'm going to use this pick whip to say divide by whatever that number is. And it's going to give me an error because it's divided by zero, and you can't have that. Um, but uh, when I did that, then as I increase the slider, I'm creating proportional square mosaics, and I'm like resizing them dynamically, and they stayed squares. And uh, if you're good at math, then that's not a very good trick to end on because it's probably very self-explanatory and easy, and you, there's probably a bunch of other smarter ways to do that. But I, I was proud of myself. I thought it was pretty cool. So anyways, the, the point is, is that... Um, you know, creating this uh, was a really fun experiment and project for me because these Red Giant tools give us so many ways to explore and play where we don't have to necessarily manually tell it exactly what to do like a computer. It gives us variety and variation and kind of like the Dali stuff, it allows it to speak back to us a little bit and be inspired by the tools. So thank you, and we're now going to have a Q&A or something and then uh, switch it over to, uh, to Max here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for um, being patient with my water drinking, by the way. <laughs> There's a simple question from me, Matt, um, Chad. OK, um, do it. About uh, trap code, mirror, or something like that. Yeah. It, it means like when you're a mirror, does it mean that you can create like 3D object without ever going, without ever leaving um, After Effects, and you can just stay in After Effects and create a lot of 3D simulations, 3D objects, so to say? Yes, I'm glad you asked that, because uh, that's exactly what it means. So um, whether you're in, if you're in Mir and you want to create 3D objects with the plane, it's like a 3D, it's like just a flat plane, but it is a 3D object. Uh -huh. So you can use fractal maps, fractal noise to displace it. So you can create landscapes and things like that and 3D objects like in that way by distorting just that flat piece of geometry. But then also, if you're using a 3D object, all these, um, these objects here, these 3D objects, all these things, they ship with Mir and are built into the software. So you don't have to know anything about 3D in order to uh, use any of that stuff. Good question. That's really cool. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for asking. Turn it over to you, I guess, while we do our little housekeeping laptop switching stuff.
Okay, do I need to let you out so you can? Cool. So now that we're going to switch a little bit of the hardware here, I just want to let everybody know that we have prepared like some sort of a live experiment where we're going to get out of our comfort zone and Max is going to do some compositing. He's a very talented colorist and he's just going to showcase how easy <laughs> it is to accommodate with our tools and how simple it is to get started. And me, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and I'm going to do some color grading and being hated by everybody because everything looks ugly. But at least I just want to like, get to know the tools and showcase to everybody how easy it is and it doesn't really matter what you like to do. The Red Giant tools are very simple, and they can get you started and accommodated very quickly. You need internet? Yes, please. You don't have Chad here had an amazing presentation. Stop. And uh, mm. he's a very talented artist, and he made sure that he sets me up for disappointment after <laughs> this. <laughs> No, I've seen your stuff. I know. There's a bit too many compliments for my liking. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you'd be standing next to me on stage when we did this. And no, no, we don't. We don't have borders. Thanks for sticking around, everybody. Alrighty. So um, again, while we are preparing for the laptop switch, um, the idea of this presentation that we are going to do um, with me and Alex is that it's just a fun exploration. Um, we're going to step out from our comfort zones a little bit and play around, so to say. Right. That, okay. So um, the the um, how I how we ended up with this uh, presentation is that uh, we work a lot together during uh, when we are preparing for um, IBC and Chad was very kind and um, handing over his scene and I got to take a look at his scenes and asking myself, hey, this is actually doable. Um, me as a uh, colorist by trade. I haven't been in Fusions, I mean, uh, let me just admit it, I've been just in Fusions only for color-related stuff. Whenever I'm creating a lot, whenever I'm creating something um, color-related, then I'll, I'll be at in, in Fusions. So with that being said, it means like I know a little bit about Fusions, just like to get around it, but I'm not going to call like myself as a, a, a full-blown compositor because I'm far away from that. Um, the thing is, um, with Red Giant, um, it should be doable because the tools allows you, it invites you to be creative. It's very easy to use. Everything is just within one click away. And as Chad mentioned before, it invites you to be more explorative. So that's, that's the thing. Um, and let me switch it. All righty. So as you can see, the style of the scene itself, it's like, it looks pretty familiar. Chat will be like laughing at me at the moment. Oh, wait, it's amazing. <laughs> because uh, we have like the main object as a cassette and um, the text that says, be kind, rewind. I mean, I stole that like right away from my favorite movie. <laughs> And um, here, what I, uh, what I did is that um, everything was created within um, universe. So there is nothing, um, there's no tools um, that I use outside um, universe, except for the ACES transform, because I'm apparently working in ACES. But let's not get into that. Um, since um, we can only work with uh, universe in fusions, um, that's not the limit, but, uh, because Universe plugin itself, with, with just Universe plugin, we can create stuff like this very easy. And first of all, what I did here, let me switch into two uh, screens. Um, the first thing, I start the compositing project by dropping in my uh, black background. So if you're not familiar how Fusion works, it works 
when you, whenever you are creating a fusion compositing, uh, fusion composi compositions, it gives you like this scene with one media out, right? And whenever you want to create something, you have to port something into the media out to be able to be um, projected. So in this case, um, I'm dropping in my background. And by the way, to search for tools, you can just uh, press Shift and Spacebar, and it will bring this commander. And by typing in BG, I got my background, and I just press Add. Now, it feels like, all right, I have the background, and I have the media out, but I have black screen. All right, that is because I haven't poured my black background into my media out. So now, if I change my black background into blue, for example, I have my background in the um, screen. And there's like this tiny button over here, like the two tiny dots. So when I'm pressing one, it will bring the viewer into the first uh, screen. And if I press one again, it will disable it. And now, as you see, it is only in the second uh, viewer. So that's how um, Fusion works. Um, the first thing that I did, let me just go back to the previous scene. The first thing that I did after creating the black background is that I applied the universe soft gradient. And by applying universe soft gradient, I got like very instant background just very quickly. And that can be done with, um, within one click, within several clicks. And for example here, I have a, let's just switch it back to black. And by dropping background, soft gradient background, and by default, I have like um, this gradient that went from cyan to blue. And by clicking the soft gradient background, you will be able to um, access the effects in the inspector tab. And what I did is nothing fancy and nothing very sophisticated except just using presets. And by using these presets, I can get a lot of stuff very quick and with a very fancy look, apparently. And what I did here is that I'm using like this blot clot um, presets. And then on top of that, I want to add some texture um, with the background before adding all the text and the subjects. And to do the textures, like Chad mentioned before, one of the, my favorite tools to do that is the texturize motion. And just by adding texturized motions, you can like really see really fast that you have texture applied to your background instantly. And here, instead of using um, other, instead of going into this um, pre, um, parameters, what I did first time is that, all right, maybe let's choose a preset and start playing around from that. From here, like for example here, I got Cryon, but if you want to, you can also play around with the drop down with the texture selections. And in this case, I want to create like a uh, dot shade, and that can be uh, created using this fabric, uh, fabric um, style. And by, by disabling the mask, you can really see that the effects is pretty much applied to the whole background, right? So let me go back to the previous scene. All righty. So on top of the uniform, uh, uh, let me switch back again. All right, on top of the soft gradient background, I have like the texturized motions applied on top of that. And to create a color separation, um, what I did there is just by adding a multitone. And if you see, in, in multitone um, tools, there are options to select if you just want to use like a dual tone scheme, like with it, it means like you can pick two colors and create a um, C, uh, sh color scheme based on that, or you can do a tritone. And using the tritone, you can target like a very smooth, you can have like a very smooth gradations between the two colors. And you can even uh, pick totally different colors if you want to. So let me just cancel that. And 
On top of this back, uh, background, I add another uh, black background on top of that, and I create a turbulence noise. And with this turbulence noise, I add a prism displacement to create some glassy reflections on this turbulence noise. And just to make things more um, exciting, I add the glow on top of the turbulence noise and the prism displacement. So it's like you have like this glassy looking textures um, on top of this background. Um, at the moment, we cannot see the first uh, background that we create before, but that just because the second background that I created apparently is in the same size with the uh, previous background. So what I did is that I simply mask it, and by doing that, et voila, you can really see like two uh, background merged together, right? And on top of on, on top of like this pre-made background, what I did is that just by adding um, simple text, and in this case, the text tool that I use are the text plus just the text tool that is available in Fusions, and on top of that, I create um, a body. I give the text a body by using the tools inside Magic um, inside Universe called Luster. So with Luster, you can create so many um, options. For example, if you click, uh, click presets, there are plenty of options that you want that you can create. And in this case, I just went with um, Diablo presets. And from there, I transform it, put it up there on the top left, and add some glow. And by, by doing that, I can get like, like this really um, easy. And uh, the thing seems to work together like very easy just by using those presets. And the, the next one is that I create the screen text. And the screen text element is like this uh, small text, the small blue text that appear in the background. And to do that, I can, cre I can create another background and attach a screen text on top of it and then merge it again. And on top of this, I put the image. It's an sRGB photo of a cassette that I find in, um, in the internet. And on top, of the, on top of the image, I apply the texturized motions. And just simply by adding a texturized motions, it gives you the, give you the animations, give you the texture, and give you like this um, rough, rough edges um, instantly. And on top of that, I added hollow matrix and transform it and then merge it again. And on the second one, on the second text, what I did is that I created a text, which is called Be Kind. Um, hang on. Why this not showing? Hang on. <laughs> right. So the idea is that um, this text was created on top of the screen text. And then it was this. All right, at the moment, it's not showing. I don't know what's happening. OK. But what I, uh, what I can show you is that um, if we switch to another project, to the follow along, what I did is that in the first background, we create this and add texturized motions. And from here, we can add another text. Hang on. The beach volleyball. Uh oh. I think the main takeaway here <laughs> with Red Giant is that whatever it's your software that you like to work on. Um, yeah, the main takeaway um, with Red Giant plugins is that um, it's available in many multiple hosts. Doesn't matter which host you are um, familiar with, it will be accessible, it will be available. So, for example, 
Chad created the compositing in After Effects. I can easily replicate that inside Fusions. So if you want to, you can also probably try it in Premiere Pro or even like in um, Avid Media Composer because all of these tools are available there. So bear I, with me. I have a, a question. Second. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for the ball, um, I noticed your Aces, you had an Aces Transform node. Um, but you had several objects like first, and then you put an ACID transform node before the merge. And so I'm wondering if there's a way that you could help me to understand with my limited understanding of color <laughs> what the purpose is yes. of putting the ACID transform node where you put it. Yes. Um, the idea of ACES is that it brings all your uh, different color, uh, um, how do you call it, um, source like different color spaces from your source into one unified color space and process it there. And um, if I am creating an effect, if, if I'm creating a, an object and then transform it into, a, into an ACES right away, it means like the process that is processed after the ACES transform will be carried away in ACES um, CG or whatever ACES um, space that I am um, setting up. But if you are creating an effects and doubling up with another effects and then transforming, transforming in it, means that those effects will not be carried out inside the, the big ACES uh, color space, but it is carried out in, in this case, in the sRGB linear um, color space. And then after that, after you got the final result, you transform everything into ACES um, color space. Okay. It okay. seems like Fusion doesn't want to work with us in yeah. text right now, so I think it's better if we just restart it real quick. Right. Let me just force quit this. So it sounds like you kept it in sRGB to, so that the presets would be, like look the same, but then you use, you put it in ACES before you mesh all that together so you could use yeah. This is for that. Is that right? Let me show you. Let me show you that chat. Okay. Like in this case, for example, um, the background that I created. First, I have like the black background, and then after that, I create the soft gradient background, and then added a texturized motion on top of that, and a multi-tone as a final finishings. And then after that, I transform that into ACES, which is, uh, as you can see in the, uh, in the panel, in the inspector, um, I put the, my input transform as sRGB because that's our, those are, that is the, um, the color space where my effects are processed. And then after that, I pour it in into ACES CG. And if you see in the, in the end of my um, compositing, in, in the end of my note, I have another ACES transform that goes from ACES CG into the target display that I want to target. In this case, oh, wow. REC 709. So okay. it, means, it means that anytime I um, transform any single, any, any rows that I select here into ACES, means that I will bring them into ACES. And then finally, in the end, it will port back into the display, t uh, trans display um, color space that we want to target. Really? Yes. So each of the pieces is put into ACES, and then you put a final display transform at the end. That's awesome. Thank you. For exactly. That. Thank you so much, Chad. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, let me do this again. OK. So the text, the be kind text that we want to create here is just a simple fusion text. And then I transform it, just rotate it a little bit, add glow. And then after that, you can see here it's split into two different um, territory, two different category. The first one, I added uh, electrify. And in the electrify, I changed the blend mode from overlay into none just to have like this, um, the, the, sh the, how do you call it? Just the shadow without the, um, the text itself. And then on top of that, I add the ACES transform to go into the ACES. And the second split, it is transformed into the, uh, slightly to the right and added blur 
because you said before, in, in, in case to make things, in, in, in the, if you want to make things a little bit more organic, simply add imperfections onto it. In this case, blur it is. So that was the breakdown of the very simple compositing scenes that I created in Fusions just to recreate what Chad uh, created before. But this is not the end of the uh, game, right? Because we want to color grade it. Um, yeah. In order to do that, instead of, instead of baking it, instead of sending it into color page as Rec 709, which looks good at the moment, we can simply change it into a log space because after this, we, won't, we, will go, we will simply just go to color page and it will be delivered to you as a log image. And from there, you can just um, target the display space. You can still work in the log space in your color grading and then um, move back the, the, the output transform, so to say, way back after the grading. And that can be done simply by selecting ACES CCT as my final output and just by going into my um, color page, we can start grading like very simply. So let me reset all the grade and to, to prepare this, what we can do is that we can bring this into ACES because ACES again, because at the moment, we're not in ACES. Um, we are in the, in the project settings, um, how do you call it, color space, uh, which is in normal DaVinci Y RGB, and we have to manually color manage it. And in order to manually color manage it, um, you can use Node, you can use uh, plugins that is available in the OFX that is called the ACES Transform. Surprise, surprise. And from here, what we're going to do is that we will select the input transform. As you remember, the output from Fusions was ACCCT. We will use that as our input. Of course, it doesn't look nice at the moment. And we will go into ACCCCT. Um, we will go into like Rec 709 just to showcase that, you know, it is fine. And we'll change this into ACCCT and then create another one. Or, hang on, because we are living fusions in ACCCT, I don't think we need ACCCC transform either, right? Because we are in this log color space, what we can do is that we can target the Rec 709 in this one. And prior to that, we can drop in Magic Bullet Looks. And if I launch Magic Bullet Looks and select the input to be ACCCT in and out, you got the correct preview right away. Now, just to prove the point that um, the tools inside Red Giant Suite is very easy to use, Alex is a compositor, and I think in this um, in this um, occasions he will try to take um, the place to. Color Please don't grade. judge me after I'm done with this. <laughs> <laughs> so today it's all about getting out of the comfort zone. Uh, as Max mentioned, I am spending most of my time compositing, and uh, I know little to nothing about color science. And um, my needs as a compositor are different from your needs or max needs or, you know, it, it is very situational. But what I, what I like about looks is that a lot of the times I just open it and I go check the capsules and there are so many. And those, those presets are made by colorists, uh, which basically just enables me to work with a colorist without being a colorist. Um, and most of the times that's what I do. I just come in. I preview the presets, I like that, I click on it, I apply it, and then I'm done, I'm out. My composition's looking good enough. Um, and in general, my style, the, things, the, the way I like to do things is, I am in love with oversaturated colors, which means a lot of clipping, right? <laughs> so, uh, but that's what I like, that's my style, that's what I like to express myself, that's what I like my art to look like. And um, that's how I always start. I start with just hue and saturation, and I start playing with it just to like crank a little bit to get my saturations up. Uh, maybe I'm tr playing a little bit with the hue just to like change my colors around. And 
that, that for me just looks good enough. And from there, I always, I always apply optical diffusion. And uh, what I like about optical diffusion is that it's trying to mimic a physical diffusion, like a, a real glow. Um, and it, it gives me enough customization, but simplify that somebody like me can just pick it up and have fun with it and decide, OK, that's it. I'm done. I don't need to, I don't need to complicate myself. I don't need to understand exactly how it's working. And um, I can then go and boast about it and hit our max and say, hey, look, look at me. I'm a colorist. Um, no offense. Um, I respect everybody that <laughs> it's a colorist. <laughs> it isn't color science. I understand how complex it is. And that's why I don't want to get in it. But I respect everybody. <laughs> so let's just crank a little bit the glow. And um, another favorite tool that I have is the, the, the Mojo tool. Um, it applies some sort of a um, LUT, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on top of the. What, what Mojo is actually doing, it is, um, it is targeting the highlight of your image and bring it into specific warm um, hue. And then it is also targeting the shadow area and bring it into a cooler hue. So if, if we take um, a minute to think about it, it is actually working in the uh, complementary color scheme. Warm up your highlight, cooling down your shadow type of things. Good. I'm so happy to have you here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, after I'm done with Mojo, I, what I like about Lux is that it also it provides me with trendy effects without me having to like jump back and try to like uh, replicate that. Um, and the chromatic operation tool it creates me the RGB split that I need without me having to you know go back and forth or like uh, manage uh, manage it. And um, as I said, it's it's. For me personally, it's just about being playful with it. It is not really about I'm doing this because that's how it should be done. For me personally, it's just the joy of playing with the tools. And I, until my eyes are satisfied, I'm not stopping. When my eyes are satisfied, that's, that's when I usually stop. And I'm like, OK, that's enough. Uh, and that's what I like about the Regiant tools. It is all about being playful. And it doesn't matter what you like to do, what's your hobby, where you start. Our tools are ready to accommodate you out of your comfort zone. And it's just that easy. And now I can boast about I'm the colorist. <laughs> but, <laughs> right, now, but in case you want to color it in a correct way and in a scientific way, you said, like, mm, how do I do that? Is, is that a possible thing with Magic Bullet Logs? Yes, it is absolutely possible because there are a plethora of um, very accurate, uh, color accurate tools inside Magic Bullet Looks. Do you mind if I start over and in 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 introduce Magic Bullet Looks to the Please do show audience? them exactly how it is awesome. to be done. <laughs> so here in the, in the left corner, you have, uh, to, uh, you have like, a button to reset the, um, everything. So just to understand Magic Bullet Looks a little bit, Magic Bullet Looks is a plugin um, that is made by Red Giant, and it is specialized for creating looks. And it's shipped with over 300 presets. And um, if you press L, you will be able to open the presets drawer. And if we press um, T, we'll be able to open the tools drawer. So in the tools drawer, there are four categories of tools that you can see. There are selective tools. Those selective tools, you can think of it as the tools that you normally see on set if you want to target a specific exposure or if you want to have like a negative fill, you can do that. And there are some camera tools. Camera tools, when we're talking about the camera tools, think about it as a um, effects or tools that you normally do with your camera. Think about filters. And color corrections are color corrections um, tools that you normally have in any color corrections package. And finally, we have the film emulations tools. Like for example, here in film negative, we have over 20, 22 different profiles that you can use. And in film print, there are four different um, profiles. And there are also halations and um, optical diffusions tools. What is special about halations and optical diffusion tools is that it is created um, based on a 3D rendering principle that is called the energy conserving principle. It means that 
the tools itself will not generate the source of light. And if you see in our scope, let me just put looks back. In our scopes, if we disable the optical diffusions, you can really see that by having optical diffusions in your scene, it's not affecting the whole exposure of the scene. It just use whatever available light source in the scenes and work the magic there. So for example, just to prove a point, a point let's just crank it to the maximum. And you can really see it is not exceeding the exposure um, threshold. Right. Now back to the purpose, uh, Alex's purpose when color grading before. He mentioned something that, hey, I want to get my scene to be more saturated and more exciting. Is there any scientific way to do that? Absolutely. And you can do that by moving around, dancing around between color spaces, right? And it doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be um, complicated. You can just use one simple tool called Color Remap. And by default, it is working in the color model JZ-AZBZ. The JZ-AZBZ color model, it's similar to LAB color model. So you have one channel for the luminance and the two coordinates that goes between um, magenta and green and yellow and blue. So for example, I already create a presets here by targeting a specific, um, how do you call it, specific uh, coordinates of color. And it means like I have the sample from magenta to magenta, green to green, blue to blue, and yellow to yellow. Just for example, if I am making my source color a little bit more desaturated and my um, target, my re result color all the way to the max, it means like I'm targeting this color and bring it to the maximum level. So by doing that, it means like I'm taking the signal of that color in the LAB color space and just scale it up by, um, by doing this approach. And you can play around if JZAZBZ um, color model is not stuff for you. You can also, not the, um, not the, um, correct, how do you call it, not the, your preference. It's not giving you the, the, the look that you're after. You can play around and perhaps change back into the LAB color model. And as you can see, before and after, I'm increasing the saturations in a very color accurate way, so to say. And on top of that, uh, new in this release, new in this release is that there are 38 new presets that was uh, developed based on a very popular look that is happening at the moment. Um, for example, we, have no, we are now having a new f uh, film emulations um, looks. These are the film emulations looks that you can start, uh, that you can use to start off your grade. So for example, if, all right, apparently the download is not supported, but be, uh, f worry not. I don't not. have access to the internet. Yeah. <laughs> worry not. I, has, I still have that. Right. For example, the first one is film grade. It is a base. It is a base canvas for you when you want to create a filmic look. And as you can see, it is, um, it is built based on the combinations of film print and film negative. And uh, there's another uh, iterations, the film grade high contrast, or if you like the black and white look, you can also do, uh, you can also select this, um, the black and white versions. Um, but but the, the new presets are not just like this um, correct and accurate presets. There are plenty of like fun and exploratory uh, presets. So for example, something that is based on the music video or fun, let's just pick this one. And this one, this one particular new preset came with a lot that needs to be set into ACCCT, in and out. And just by applying this, we are creating a look that we want very easy and very fast. And now you can still balance your footage, balance your clip, balance your render um, under the look. 
So I can show you that. So for example, if you still want to, we can create uh, several nodes before our main look. And here, we can just play around with the contrast. Since we are in ACCCT, perhaps I don't want to change the midpoint. So I'll type in the, my pivot to be 0 0.413 and just increase or reduce my contrast accordingly. And after that, I'll add up my exposure slightly. Oops, that's too much. Perhaps instead of reducing the contrast, slightly up it a little bit and tone down the exposure. So that's um, just to showcase that you can still do plenty of things under your looks without um, making your looks as the final, um, how do you call it, the final touch of your image. You can still work prior to Magic Bullet looks and finalize, so to say, the looks to your liking. Cool. Thank you very right. much, Max. Thank you very much. And um, is there any questions? <clears throat> no? I uh, do have a question for yeah, you please. and Chad. Okay. If I were to get my, head, my hands dirty and get to actually learn color science or get to learn some compositing, where I could find is there some some way I can interact with you lively, or maybe a place where I can just search some tutorials? Absolutely. Um, um, I feel like as an artist at the moment, as a uh, people who's working in the post-productions at the moment, we are like entering a renaissance of information. Like um, the, the information about color is like, it's never been more accessible uh, than today. If you care enough to um, search for a journal, for example, Plenty of those are available over the internet. But if you want to, at Maxon, we also have a learning platform. It's called Cineversity. So anytime you want to learn more about Maxon products or the industry itself, like if you want to learn compositing, if you want to learn how to create 3D art, you can simply go to Cineversity. And we have plenty of series that will um, help your journey to to arrive to your uh, goal um, easier, so to say. What if I wanted like new information, like I just wanted to sit down for like an hour or two every other week or something like that. Is there something, like I just want to learn about color yeah. on a bi-weekly basis, is there something that could help me there? I'm glad that you bring, me, uh, bring this up, Chad, because at MaxOn, I'm also running a show that is called Max on Color every second week. And um, you can tune in and Max on Training Team in YouTube. And it will be in the first and then the third Thursday of the month. And there, we normally have a casual to semi-informal discussions about color grading, creating looks, and sometimes we doubled into compositing as well. Thank you very much. Cool. Sweet. If you, if you see a, a weird username, misspelling JZB or LAB, that's probably me asking That's you a probably question. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember that. Thank you. Cool. So uh, let's switch the... Uh, let's switch the laptop. Let's switch the laptop real quick, if you don't mind. So bear with us. We still have one more um, session after this, where Alex is going to um, showcase his high-intensity high title sequence. Very high-intensity. As I said, I like saturated colors. <laughs> Do you need sounds? Sorry? Sounds. Uh, I can play without sound too.
Thank you all for still being so patient with us while we're switching the, the hardware. I hope everybody's having a very good time at IBC. I am been having a lot of fun getting okay. to know you, getting to talk to all of you, getting to meet new people. As I said, it's all about getting out of the comfort zone, and IBC was a good lesson for me to get out of my comfort zone. I don't know how you feel about it, Chad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was really, really fun to play. I don't feel like I got out of my comfort zone because it was just fun the whole time, but I'm glad that I pushed myself and tried new things for sure. Yeah. I mean, you warmed them up very good, and now I only have room to disappoint. So <laughs> oh, stop. Thank you for doing such a great job that I will not have anything to show. <laughs> You're very, very talented. Cool. So all the screens are on. I will play just a little video to kind of like showcase what I'm going to present uh, today. Um, we are going to do some sort of a semi-breakdown project where we're going to create from scratch the important aspects of how I achieve uh, this with a giant, um, but also like going through like exactly every tool that I use in the, in the tool chain and so on. So um, my compositor, my compositor of choice is After Effects. But as we mentioned previously, if you prefer Fusion, uh, if you prefer an NLE like Premiere Pro or Final Cut, our tools are still available. And the user experience is standardized. You're getting exactly the same um, across hosts. So um, this is, as I mentioned, um, what I'm going to go through today. And uh, before going into detail, uh, I'm just going to create a fast comp. I'm just going to call it like test for now. And I'm going to go back to my main comp. And I'm just going to like dissect a little bit. Um, this is the main comp where all the effects, all the giant tools basically stack up um, and create everything. Um, and the way uh, I started this was, OK, so. I want a city, and I want some sort of a background that maybe moves a little bit, and I want my city to f be filled with a gradient or a color, and where do I start? So what I like about the Regiant tools is that is that sort of, as I mentioned, playful way of discovering and starting your journey of creating. And I think there are so many combinations, because every day I think, Oh, I could have done that. Oh, I could have like go around and do that thing. Or oh, I could have combined them in that way. And I appreciate it a ton because it keeps me inspired. It keeps me fresh. And the next day when I wake up and I want to create, I start from another point that I started previously. So in this um, example here, as I mentioned, I just started with a gradient. So that's my base. And I use universe gradient ramp to create me like a um, gradient between two colors. And on top of that, I apply texturized motion, which it gives you an array of textures that it can pretty much animate it for you. And you can control the speed. Like currently, I have it set to uh, 15 uh, frames per second. So if I, if I hit play here, you can see that my texture is moving like 15 frames per second. But if I were to like go a little bit slower, let's say 5, and I'm playing again, then you'd see that it's moving a bit slower. Um, you can also make it posterize time together uh, with your source, which is great. I don't have to worry about that. Um, and it gives you certain options to even um, hook your own custom texture. So if you have something that you like, something that you work on, or maybe you grab a different texture from another place, you can just link it, and it will animate it for you, and it's just uh, get you started uh, super easily. Or if you don't want it to be animated, you just have to change it from cycle to still. So yeah, that's how I, that's how I um, um, pretty much got this background. And if I'm going back to my tense comp, and I'm going to create fast, um, not a light. If I were to create fast uh, solid, sorry, I'm working with the trackpad, so I'm a bit slow. But that's OK. And I don't know, I'm just going to like we named this universe gradient RAM just to showcase you how fast it is to create this effect. I'm play gradient RAM. I'm going to select, let's say, maybe different colors this time. I'm feeling very playful, as I said. That's my gradient RAM. And 
What I also like about gradient ramp is that it gives me the option to control the fall off. So now I decide where my color starts, where my first color starts, where my first color ends. And I'm going to apply real quick texturize um, motion. There you go. And I like to work with the universe dashboard at all time open because it allows me to pick fast uh, some of the capsules. Um, but we also offer the options within the, 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 the menus, uh, if that's um, for your liking. And let's, let's just go something like, I don't know, maybe abstract. Um, I'm going to disable the mask because I don't want it to be mask around the region. I just want to be applied overall. And if I press play, I'm already kind of very close to where I just was a minute ago, and I'm getting my, my background started. So let me go back to the main comp and kind of like showcase how I took this and applied to the background and created the effect and from where like the, the, the city comes. So um, I'm going to create another new solid here. And I'm going to call it city. And after that, I'm going to apply mirror. So here we go again. We here will we go again. We've been here. <laughs> we'll create a 3D yeah. object without ever having go to 3D package. Yeah, that's, that's what I like. I'm just staying connected here. I'm staying okay. focused. And I, I just really love the way our um, Regine tools just connect together and you know, get you started real quick. So I'm going to switch to a 3D model here. I'm going to click on Choose Model. And we, as, as Chad mentioned previously, too, we offer you an array of capsules. So there's a lot to discover here, a lot to play with. Uh, but for this title sequence, I went uh, with the city, because that's what I needed. And it, it's very fast, very responsive. Um, and it gets me to the results that I wanted very quickly. And um, you get to animate it. You can, you can create um, keyframes uh, and so on. Um, let me just move this real a bit down like this. Let's say like that. Maybe we can zoom in a bit more. Um, you can also use the point control to have a more interactive experience within the viewport. Let's just put it right there, let's say. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. And I really like the, the, the gradient ramp effect, as I mentioned. So I'm going to apply another one. This time on top of the city. And that's, that's exactly what I just mentioned. That's, this is what I like about the Regine tools. It just works. It just feels organic. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't want a gradient on top of the city. It just does it. Um, and let me just change real quick the colors. Um, I don't know, maybe let's, let's go a bit like blue this time. Let's get some blues in there. Um, maybe I want to bring in the, the effect of some sort of a, a mist down there. So I'm trying to like blend it with the background color and so on. And I don't know, let's go that way. I'm very happy with that, so I'm going to leave it exactly there. So this is how I achieved this city um, moving around and animating it uh, and combining it um, with the background. Now, there's a bunch of other effects uh, in here. Like, I took this uh, real-life footage and I kind of like track made it into the city. And that's very simple to do. Um, I just pretty much uh, went to my project went to my city time last footage. Um, I don't know. Let's, let's pick this one, for example. Put it there. And from here, I just have to press this button where uh, it toggle switches my modes. Um, and I can pretty much set the, the city to be tracked, mm. uh, to be track made. Um, and I'm also going to enable back uh, the city because I want to control the, the blend mode, let's say, overlay. So now my real life footage, time lapse, it is mapped to my mirror city plus the gradient ramp. Um, and that's exactly what I appreciate, playing it nicely. I'm thinking I want to 
do that, and it just does it. I don't have to worry about it. And um, you can also apply to your, um, to your footage the multitone effect in case you want to um, control some of the colors that just overlaid on top of our city. And you can like easily use this effect to achieve that. So for example, here I just like swapped my, um, my, my, my purpose to the blue by just uh, going more towards the uh, yellow highlights. And you can also control the contrast or the midpoint, uh, which because Chad already showcased it, I have nothing to showcase it. <laughs> He's doing such a great job at uh, being a trainer, which I've been trying to learn a lot from him. I feel like I'm not articulated or like I'm not very good at explaining things. And working with him has been such a blessing. Um, get to learn from a real trainer exactly how to train. So um, basically, that was how I got the, the city with the live footage, uh, I animated, I got the background, and now I was like, well, I just want some, some facts, main titles, and I just want to create fast my text. Um, and that's also very easy to do by just creating uh, another solid, let's name this one text, and um, I like to use typographic from Universe. And um, having the universe dashboard, as I mentioned, it just lets me to pick weekly stuff already. And there's a variety of capsules um, that we offer. You can create with typographic anything from loaders to main titles. Maybe you just want a small text to be placed uh, in your composition. Uh, and there's quite a lot of options. Uh, let's just go with this one, for example. And uh, what I like about typographic is that it's already animating my stuff. So I don't even have to worry about animation. Uh, but if I want to go more in depth, I can do that. Maybe I don't want it to be rotated. So I'm not going to rotate it. Maybe I want it to be a bit more centered. Um, maybe I want to play a little bit with the text. And uh, maybe add a bit more randomization to it. Again, just going to that playful way of uh, compositing. So you can do that. You can just like with one slider start um, um, randomizing um, your text letter by letter and so on. Um, and you can animate those great keyframes um, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, let me just go back right there. And after I animated some of this text, I just put it like in the center, make it big. So everybody can see it. Um, I was interested to create some sort of a shadow effect to them. And for that, I just used uh, Universe Long Shadow, mm. which is great to easily get you started with some um, uh, long shadows. And what I did, I just played with the length. So it just goes around my text only. But you can also play with other things like expansions, like do you want it to like be around your text fully? Maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to uh, use, use the angle and control the angle. You can change the color. Um, I don't know. Let's do maybe black. Um, and um, it just gets you started real quick with the, with, with the shadow. And from there, I just animated the expansion. Um, and that's how I was able to. Uh, get that no shadow to long shadow 3D effect style. Um, and after that, I just created um, this texture on top of, my, of, the, of the text. And that's just playing with the track mate. Uh, so if I go back to my test here, and I take the, the, the text solid that has typographing on it, and I give in, let's say, the, the city again, you can see that whatever I move my text is just track made to, to the city. Uh, but I still want my text to still be on top uh, of things. Uh, so to create that, I just have to duplicate this text layer and have it nomate and change the blend mode from the 
previous text layer to something, let's say, like uh, subtract. And now if I move this under, you can see that I'm getting um, two text layers separately, but one is following the city, the other not. And if I were to, let's say, scale both of them, or maybe move around, you can see that one is following the city, the other doesn't. So that's how I was able to achieve this um, track mate effect. And then I just, I just really love to use Unmult from Universe. It's basically it's taking your footage and removes all your blacks and creates an alpha channel. But you're also able to like invert it. So now it starts to removing your whites. Um, and that's how I was able to like put the um, I don't know square texture on my blacks um, and achieve this look. Um, now, for the um, edge effect, I just pretty much played with uh, find edges. So if I am to like disable all the universe effects for now, um, I just pretty much duplicated my main comp. I apply find edges, and I uh, afterwards, as I mentioned, I just apply unmold but with the invert option on, so I can pretty much remove my whites instantly with one button. Um, then I inverted it again, because if I were to zoom in here, uh, you can see that my edges right now are like red, uh, and so on. And if I invert, I'm getting my blues uh, back. And I also added camera shake, uh, which is a great effect to create a camera shake. Um, and because I'm lazy, I also used uh, a preset. Um, let me just go back. Let me just go back real quick. So uh, I just used a preset. I like the, the Carmon preset. Um, because it's already set up as if you're like in a car and trying like to shoot, so you get a lot of like uh, uh, shaking. Uh, and I just like increase the frequency all the way up to like 100, so that means that every single frame is getting the camera shake effect. Um, and after that, I just play with the uh, the aptitude, and I like to kind of like put twice or less on X than on Y, um, so you're getting uh, the aptitude higher on Y than on X, basically, twice as much. Uh, and that's how I, I, I got my edges to kind of like shake around and like this, do this wiggle effect without me having to like get into an After Effects expression or anything like that. Um, and that's, that's basically what I like to do. I like to like um, be in my comfort zone and be lazy and like achieve things real quick. Um, and um, after I pretty much like did the, the, the edges, let me just zoom a bit more. Working with the trackpad is no fun. Um, so after that, um, we added some sort of a, um, effects adjustment layer. Um, and I wanted this time to bring some of my, um, to create like this RGB separation effect. And um, Universe has a very small um, product that does that, but very powerful. Um, if you are interested to create a more chromatic spread, then Chroma Down, as Chad showcased, that's, uh, that's basically an option to create like super complex chroma spread. Uh, but if you want something like super quick, just to create a fast RGB separation, that's what I use. I use universe RGB separation. So that's what I did. So if I was to like on and off this, I just add a little bit of um, RGB separation. So um, now, because I have a colorist near me, uh, I don't have to worry about that. So I'll just give it to, to Max real quick to showcase of how can you get the sum of using the Giant tools. You created your title sequence, how you get it, and add a little bit of oomph um, and color, color graded. Right. Um, 
Right, let's get into the fun part. Um, normally, when you, have, when you finish with your rendering, that's normally not the end of the game, right? You sometimes want to sprinkle some magic to make things a little bit more interesting than before. I'm not saying that what you created is not interesting. It is a lot of interest there. But just in case you want to add some pop, just to make things a little bit more enjoyable, you can still color grade your footage. Um, the first thing what I want to uh, show you is that... Um, Just disable that. Wait, can I disable? Um, yep. Give me a second. There you go. Yeah. So, um, first thing first, when um, we are approaching color grading, uh, there are like some thought process that I want to share with you. Because sometimes uh, color grading, it, it, it feels like this a a black arts that you don't really know what to do and you just push things around to make things look uh, wonderful. But um, there are some, some like a boiled down versions um, of how you can approach your color grade easily. First thing first, think of three things. The first thing is like the contrast. How is the contrast level of your image? The second thing is like, how is the color scheme? How is the color palette? Is there any hue that you want to change? Does one color works with the other? Does is everything works as a group. And the third thing is that, how is the textures of your um, image? Do you need more texture? Do you want to reduce some textures or something like that? And I think by having, by keep asking yourself that, that those three questions, you'll be off into a better um, positions, right? So. First thing first, if we want to um, add color to our um, to, add, to add color grading to our um, image, is that first we need to set up the environment. But here is the thing: when you are in After Effects, and if you are using OCIO to work in After Effects, since this new in this release, if you launch Magic Bullet. By default, it is already setting you up the input and output. Um, automatically. So you don't have to go through um, the questions of what is my footage, how do I want to um, uh, tag it, and which output do I want to um, select. Just leave that with After Effects. Once you um, finish setting those up, Magic Bullet will just sing, uh, will take the metadata from After Effects and will give you whatever you need there. So first thing is that Let's talk about the contrast of our image. The, there are plenty of tools that you, want, that you can play around whenever you want to um, tweak the contrast of your image. One of the tools that I like the most is this contrast tool because it is giving you the uh, contrast and pivot um, point. So for example, if you add contrast, and you, you can still move around the pivot point, and those are available within Magic Bullet Looks. And the second thing is that when you want to change several col um, s some specific hue, you can still do that with color remap. But is there any simpler thing to do that, for example? Yes, there are plenty of things that you can do that. For example, if you just add Mojo, it, it gives you like this two-in-one approach. So you have contrast um, set up for you. And then, a the, and then it, it warm up your highlight, and then it is cooling down your shadow simultaneously. So let's just use Mojo in this, um, in this looks. And what we can do is that we can crank up Mojo a little bit, and perhaps reduce the contrast by reducing the punch just slightly. And the third thing that we want to think about is the textures. How is the textures of our image? At the moment, it feels like, yeah, there are plenty of like, like this tiny rugged textures that I already have in my image. I can add some more film grain if I want to, but let's soften the image a little bit. And to soften the image a little bit, we can always use the optical diffusions, for example. And by default, you have plenty of presets that is available in the optical diffusions. Um, for example, if you're familiar with um, diffusion filter, you'll be in luck because those presets are modeled after the famous um, 
available diffusion filters. One of the filters that I like the most is the glimmer glass. So let's use that. And instead of using diffusion filters just as a diffusion filters, we can also use diffusion filters to add glow. And as we know previously, um, these tools are modeled after, are created based on the principles of energy conserving, means that it will not mess up your exposure. So we can just be playful. And in this case, let's perhaps add some more glows and cooling down the glows a little bit. And if you want to, you can change the filter if it's a streak or diffusions. And if your machine is uh, capable enough, you can always change the quality into best if you want to, right? And last but not least, to make things uh, work together, let's add a filmic grain on top of it. And we can just use a very light preset, either a light noise or image vitamins. And Bear in mind that whenever you are using any tools inside Magic Bullet Looks, you don't have to use it like to the extreme, to the hundred percent. You can always tone down the effects that you want inside Magic Bullet Looks, right? And that is Magic Bullet Looks. Um, one more thing that you can use Magic Bullet for. Magic Bullet looks for is not just that you can use it for adding a color grade for your image, but as Alexandra will, tell, uh, will show you, you can always use these tools to create iterations of your um, art. Before going to the iteration things, I do have a question for you. Yes. So, uh, because I've been a bit too playful with my stuff, yeah. I, I can say that, let me just disable Magic Bullet looks here. Um, I lost some of my my city. things, my city. Yeah. Can, is there a way that I can use looks where I just can bring back some of these absolutely, highlights? Absolutely, absolutely. If we open Magic Bullet looks, right, if we disable everything first, just to make sure that we are focusing on one simple thing, is that if you pay, uh, pay attention of your scopes, you can really see that, oh, we have plenty of information, we have plenty of signals in the red, several of them in the green channel, but in the blue channel, there's nothing much except like that um, um, highlights over there. And to do that, we can borrow some, do some of those signals and then assign it to the other channel. And we can do that very easily by just using channel mixer. So for example, we can oh. just drop in channel mixer right in the front. And let's borrow some of the red channel. And we can just reduce it slightly. And we can use that to, to increase our blue. So for example, we can go to the green channel and push it up slightly. Of course, if you're doing it too far, you get an artifact. And you don't want that. And doing it carefully and just a teeny tiny little bit may bring you to a better point. Right? So before, after. And of course, if you just like reduce the blue all the way, you get all the detail back, but it will mess up with the, um, another color. For example, if we are confirming that and moving to the other one, you'll see that suddenly it mess up your um, grade. So what you want to do is that probably do it sparsely. And that's probably how you save detail in your image. Well, thank I you for uh, saving my details. I assume I should be more careful when I'm compositing <laughs> and be more fineful, mindful for uh, working with colorist. Um, um, so um, another thing that I really like about uh, the Red Giant tools and um, the way I use Magic Bullet Looks is to create fast iterations, uh, basically. And if I were to disable this and go back to my original comp, if, I, if I'm, let's say, um, 
I, I like this, but I would like to, I don't know, play with the colors. Of course, I could go like start opening every print composition and play with the multitone that we set up and change the colors there. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'm feeling lazy and I want a fast way to do that. So uh, what I like to do and the way I use looks as a compositor is uh, I use the 2C process tool, uh, which Max would explain what it does because I'm not a colorist. It's a lab process that um, normally uh, that you do when you are, fil um, how do you call it, when you are grading film back in the day. In my language, that means my greens go to red and my red goes to greens, depending yeah. which way I go left or right. <laughs> and that's what I want. I want my reds um, uh, to pop um, and everything else to pretty much um, turn to um, uh, green. And that just gave me this space of red and white and black. And um, after that, I used uh, Unmold, which again, I inverted it to remove my whites instead of my blacks. And then I used again multitone to set up this time um, a three tone, a freeway color. And that allowed me to pretty much map real quick three colors uh, on the footage. After that, I play with the optical glow to bring back some of the glows. Um, I apply the Mojo standalone because I just didn't feel like opening looks again, so I just used the standalone at that point. And um, I just add a bit of more uh, saturation. And like that, I was able to like quickly um, iterate um, a look. And the way it's set up right now, and because as I mentioned, the Red Giant tools just play nicely together, I can just open my three-tone uh, from multi-tone and say, hey, OK, maybe I don't want pinks. Maybe I want whites. Um, hey, I don't want to see any blue. Maybe I want to go down to orange, maybe some reds. Um, and now I just got another iteration with two clicks. So nothing, nothing that I need to go again and like figure out what composition I did what. I just set it up in a compositing need and uh, just using the multitone to uh, iterate. Right. Cool. So um, are there um, any, any questions or? Right. If there's no questions, it seems like we're at our end. And um, thank you very much for your attentions. And um, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good job, Alex. Thank you, Chad, Max, and Alex. Thank you, Carl. That was amazing. Did you all enjoy it? Yeah. Sorry? yeah. Did you all enjoy it? I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we enjoyed it. Uh, we had a lot of fun and a lot of information. And as you all know, you can get more information on Max on website, on the YouTube channels, as well as you can get in touch with them and speak to them. They're always available. We will be available in the demo stations right after this. So if you are curious and you have any questions, feel free to approach us. You can also play with the project files. So you can just yeah. mess them up however you want. And, and to be very honest, they both are award winners. So they know what they are talking about. I'm not joking. I've seen their work. They are very modest. They won't say it. But they are brilliant artists, all three of them. He's the funniest guy. <laughs> no joke. Um, but yeah, they are amazing, and I work with them day in, day out. It's just a pleasure to have them here. And thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise. So we'll see you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new break spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. Hello, hello, welcome back. Um, hi everyone in the audience as well as live. 
Um, we are back and we have amazing artists presenting now. We do have Relative Berlin, based out of Berlin. They are an amazing studio. We have Carolyn and Timo who's going to present for us today. Uh, they are a creative studio that focuses on creative, uh, creation of digital moving images. And we have uh, Caro and Timo, as I mentioned. Uh, they will be talking about showcasing products in CGI product pipeline. So well, stage is all yours. Thank you, Karan. Oh, it's quite loud. Yeah, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to Maxon for inviting us. My name is Carolyn. I'm managing director and producer at Relative. Standing next to me is Timo. He is uh, a partner at the studio and also a 3D lead. And today um, we prepared um, a little presentation for you. We're gonna, I'm going to start off by introducing who we are and talking about the work that we do. And afterwards, we're going to show you one of our most recent product films called Echo Berlin. And Timo will then break down our CGI production pipeline by taking you through the step-by-step -step process of creating the film that I just mentioned. Let's dive in. So we're relative Berlin, as you already heard. Um, we started off in 2016. Am I talking a bit too loud? No, it's fine. OK, thank you. Yeah, we started off in 2016 um, as a couple of freelancers that got together and started working out of another freelancer's living room. At the time, we were doing mostly motion graphics and VFX. And over the course of the years, we broadened our field of interest and also developed new skills. So nowadays, we can proud, proudly call ourselves a creative motion design studio. And with creative, I mean that we like to get involved quite early in the conceptualization of projects. So we work uh, closely together with brands to not only help them write their stories, but also consult in the right medium for them to connect with their audiences in an engaging way. And we do that through three main components, which are design, animation, and tech. Design is the backbone of everything that we do, is our first thought. And we um, dare reference go back to referencing quite a lot um, the principles and fundamentals of design to create stunning images that we make then come to life through detailed animation. And animation is the way we tell the stories that we write. Um, and then tech is a big part of it. We don't shy away of uh, technically challenging projects. We love incorporating new technologies into our workflow most recently with machine learning and AI prompting. And over the course of the years, we developed a special interest um, in immersive storytelling. So uh, through extended reality, such as virtual production, the development of AR and VR application. And especially with VR applications, um, we're seeing really interesting use cases at the studio at the moment. One in particular is a long-standing collaboration we have with the research lab back in Berlin. And the work they do is um, also implementing newer technologies in the work of emer emergency services, such as firefighters. So what we do for them there is cr uh, create VR applications that replicate disastrous situations and simulate the use of these newer technologies to make the work of these emergency sa services safer and more efficient. And with the help of through VR, they're able to gather more uh, data to keep researching on it. So this is quite interesting for us. I've been talking quite a lot already about what we do. And I want to show you what we do. But what we're going to show you here today is nothing related to extended reality. We've been using Maxon tools since the inception of our studio. So we thought it would be fitting to showcase the work we've been doing with Maxon tools. Oh. oh. Ah, that was a bit too quick. We're not done yet. Hold on. <laughs> Still want to show you what we do. Uh. Aye, aye, aye. 
we're getting there in 10 more slides. So hold, bear with me. Now. Now, okay, now I spoiled the whole presentation. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is um, a max and real for us, so to say. What you're seeing here already, or what you might be telling, is that we have a distinct style. We are quite heavily influenced by the city of Berlin, and we're techno kids at heart. So we naturally gravitate to muted colors, and when we uh, use colors, there is quite a lot of contrast in it. But we like moody compositions, um, and also enjoy music quite a lot. There is no music in here because I wanted to keep talking. Um, and I'm going to keep talking a tiny bit more. You've, you're probably seeing a lot of um, different characters. And this is a pipeline that I'm particularly proud of. So we established um, a character creation pipeline that we do all in-house, it being for stylized or photorealistic characters. Uh, we create these characters, and then we design clothing for it, and we also do the motion capturing all in-house which is, makes for quite a fun um, work days in a way. And to move on, I want to show you the faces behind the work. These are our 10 talented uh, team members. Although most of them are 3D generalists, they each have their own specialization. And when it comes to project, we mix and match team members. So it also makes for a really collaborative work environment. And that gets reflected in the big open space that we have that just invites you to play around with different tech. We do have a photogrammetry rig at our studio where people love bringing different trinkets to scan and then later incorporate into their work. Or as I had mentioned with motion capture, it's quite a tangible and collaborative process where we just have a lot of fun recording different movements. And this aspect of playfulness is really important to us. And we dedicate um, a lot of time to it. And we do it through the execution of passion projects. So we've been getting quite good nowadays to set aside time between commercial projects to work on our own ideas. And over the years, we've been increasing the scope of these projects. So they're not, not only increasing in duration, they could last for weeks, but we're also having uh, more team members join. So it ends up being, compare, yeah, um, being compared to the scope of a commercial project. Our passion projects are getting inflated and bigger and bigger. But there is a reason we're increasing the scope of the passion project. We see that it's quite a valuable f tool for us as a studio. Now, firstly, it's an amazing way for younger talent to be able to assume a role in a safe space, or it's a way for us as a studio to try out new styles that maybe would not match quite well with our clients. And also, regarding the technical aspect, this is a way we keep further developing our pipeline, incorporating new technologies into it, and optimizing workflows that we already have. Um, there is an issue with it, though. There are challenges with uh, passion projects that are this big. Um, when, no, when is it actually done? When is everybody happy with it uh, when there are so many people involved in it? So it can be quite hard to meet a deadline and have a delivery date. Um, because there is no client saying, hey, I need this at that time. Um, there are other problems or like challenges with it. Um, it might be quite hard to stick to a structure, because usually in uh, our commercial pipeline, we're quite anal about the way that we work. We're stringent with the processes that we have, and especially working close directly with brands we follow this structure right here. So we have a briefing that um, can be quite loose, can only be, oh, I d might have an idea for something, might have a problem right there, could you help us execute it? Not really sure 
how, what the output should be, how it should look. So we dive into a discovery phase with the client. This is where we go quite deep into the client's brand, brand and um, see what their target audience is, what their visual uh, world looks like, and how to best reach their audiences. After going through that, we have a lengthy consultation period, just us sitting down with them and suggesting, suggesting different ways of reaching their clients. As I mentioned, we work a lot with interactive technology as well. So this is something interesting for clients that have tech-savvy audiences. So we are able to incorporate AR uh, there quite a lot as well. Um, or maybe it should be a film, something that will be on YouTube or no, on TV. But we do this consulting process quite closely with the brand. Then we go into development. Uh, we start writing quite a lot, which is unusual for studios to do. But we do a lot of writing. And um, we start visualizing what we want to create. Um, after that, we actually go into production. Timo will um, be breaking it down in detail for you in just two seconds. And of course, there is a delivery that with passion projects, huh, quite hard to get. And what I'm quite proud of is that we've been incorporating debriefs into our pipeline, not only for the team, but also with the client. And it's such an enriching process. Can definitely recommend. But yeah, this is our commercial pipeline. I'm going to give it to Timo to tell you a little bit more about in detail of how our production pipeline works and also sh finally showcase our product film. No? Go right here. Thank you, Caroline, for giving us the yeah. intro and uh, a view into the commercial pipeline. Um, this pipeline is more for the external, so the communication with the client and so on. And the stuff I will talk about now is more internal and for the team. Um, and we chose a project, which is a passion project. It's called Echo Berlin. And we decided to make a commercial ad for a portable speaker. So a speaker you can bring everywhere. Um, we come from Berlin, so music and techno is a bit in our DNA. And that's why we had the idea to, to do something with a speaker. Um, and we like to challenge ourselves uh, in this passion project. So we try to use new technologies, we try to, new, to, to, to uh, try new softwares, but we also try to um, try a different style than usually. Normally we are more minimalistic, black and white, and uh, in this case we try to be more uh, working with bright colors, be a bit more playful and so on. Um, and another thing we uh, wanted to try is to use new uh, techniques like AI. But before I go into detail, I would like to show you the final product. Now the sound is not working, right? No sound. Are you hearing any sound? Ah. Yeah? Okay. Yes, that's it. Now I would like to go a bit. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to go a bit uh, in depth now. Um, with commercial projects, we start with a client briefing, of course, and this includes uh, really technical, important information like uh, the time frame formats and stuff like that, but also marketing stuff like uh, the USP of the product, the target group, uh, which goal the client wants to achieve with the film, for example. Um, in our case, we did not have that, so we just started with the mood board of the actual product we wanted to create. 
Um, for that, we used our internal image libraries and images from the internet, of course, but we also uh, generate images with uh, Midjourney in this case, with AI. I think a lot of studios started doing that because you can go more precise and in depth with what you want to create because sometimes you just cannot find the uh, right images for what you want to, um, want to show. But we wanted to bring it a step further. So um, also to step out of our comfort zone, we decided to design the product ourselves. Uh, obviously, we are not product designers but we decided to design the product from scratch, and for that, we decided to use AI as well. So we started with prompting images. Um, this is um, quite easy with Midjourney, obviously, but to get really what you want and in a precise way, uh, there are a lot of turnarounds, but it's amazing that you can have so many iterations at, uh, at, at, in a quick time. But we were not only generating images, we also took images out of our mood boards and fed them into Midjourney and then mixed them with, uh, uh, mid, mid, uh, with the images from Midjourney. So in this way, we were able to art direct it in a really uh, nice way and then have a lot of images in the end where we could choose our favorites from and where we also could go in detail and see which parts we like from which image and which functions for the um, which functions from the uh, each image and each speaker we like. After a longer process, we um, decided for one model and to combine all the different functions and all the color schemes and everything we wanted we started scribbling the final product before we jumped into the modeling process. As I said, we like to try new tools when we uh, are on passion projects. So in this case, we used uh, Placidity to model the speaker. It's a NERB-based modeling tool, which uh, turned out to work really well. There were some... Uh, some challenges, especially there's this handle on the top, which is like curved, and then there's another curve on the other side, and everything is beveled. So it's not so easy to model, but uh, it worked in the end, and uh, we were really happy with, uh, with the result. The UV unwrapping we did uh, in good old Cinema 4D, and uh, we are super happy that they updated the UV system, and um, yeah, it was... Uh, was a no-brainer to use cinema for that, um, and it worked really well. This is how the final product looks. Um, as you can see here, we were focusing on different uh, key aspects of the speaker. Like in a client briefing, in general, um, the client have an idea of what they want to showcase. They say, okay, now we have new colors, or we have this and that. And uh, as we made our own client briefing, we also uh, wanted to highlight uh, certain key features. So in this case, you can see we have color variations. We have a touch, touch, pad, uh, touch screen on the top of it. And then the speaker uh, have a button on the side, so it's extendable. And if you put the upper part up, uh, you get a more bus, uh, bus sound. Uh, and the last important feature is that the speaker is a lightweight, so you can bring it everywhere easily to a park or everywhere and have a good sound at the same time. So these features we wanted to show in the product film as well. So we jumped into creating a storyboard. Um, as you can see, or, or you also saw in the final product, we have the shot where the speaker jumps up and the display moves up as well, and these uh, cloth bubbles comes out of that. Uh, in this shot, we were representing the, the display and the lightweight at the same way in a, in a more abstract way. After we had the, stuff, uh, the rough storyline, we thought about where the action sh should uh, take place. Um, First, we thought about an abstract, uh, minimalistic world, but since we want to step out of our comfort zone, we um, 
uh, we decided against it. Um, then we thought about maybe outside would be cool as well. But in the end, we decided to make an interior because uh, we thought that the design of the room can underline the design of the speaker itself. Um, so we choose that. Of course, we created a mood board for that as well. And once again, we used AI um, to create uh, images, but also used existing images. In the next step, we started with blocking the scene. In this uh, part of the project, you can um, work with different materials, uh, you can work with different light situations, and we added more and more detail to bring the whole scenery to life and also to make it more believable that it's like a real living room. But at the same time, we tried to make it uh, a bit stylized. Of course, the render and development phase is uh, a really important step for us. Um, because here we can really play around. Um, and it's super amazing that we can use Maxon to simulate uh, inside Maxon now uh, and have really complex animations inside cinema without using uh, to go to Houdini or something like that. So we could make a lot of uh, quick iterations. Uh, and in the end, we had a lot of uh, different parts where we could choose the best from to integrate it into our final movie. We decided to pick one of them from the main shot to quickly showcase how we did it. Probably the technique in general is familiar to uh, most of you already, but I will quickly go through that. The, uh, the goal was that the coin is rolling and hitting the speaker, and in the moment where it hits it, the color reveal starts from the bottom to up um, and revealing the different color. The way we did it, is to uh, put a weight map on the speaker itself. That's where it all starts. And after that, we added a shader field with a noise. Um, the shader field with a noise uh, is, in the end, helps to break up the linear uh, reveal and make it more organic and more um, pleasant to look at. And um, one important thing there is in the vertex um, in the vertex tag, you go to the freeze and put it to grow, and this is actually uh, turning on the function that it's that the growing is happening from the reveal. So, if you set that up, you have the effect that when the speaker hits a, a corner, uh, if the coin hits a speaker, the grow effect starts. But this is only the first part, because we wanted to transfer that to the, to the texture as well. For that, we created two different materials and used the vertex attribute to blend between these two materials. If you want to go a bit more in depth and want to uh, art direct it a bit more, it helps a lot to put a Scala ramp in between. Um, that that helps to get that little detail you see uh, in, the, in the grow effect. We really like these simulation tools in cinema, but we really want to point out that deformers are really our friends as well. And the combination of complex simulations and deformers really helped us to make this um, product film. Uh, in this case, uh, this is like, um, it's only happening on the side of the main impact shot. The paper of this um, board goes up and floating in the wind a bit. Of course, we could have done it with cloths, for example, as well. But in this case, to art direct it, it was easier to, to do it like this, especially because the uh, animations are really light in this way. The way we did it here is we combined different deformers. One is the displacer. It makes like a bit of ripple effect on the paper. Then you, we have the classical bend deformer, which is bending the paper. And uh, then we use the formula effector to make it like float in the wind, kind of. Um, we had a lot of control with this technique. 
and uh, at the same time it's not very heavy for the scene. Of course, um, we, we really like to work on complex shaders. Um, as you know, probably uh, to create a good image, you need good mesh, you need good light, but uh, first of all, you need good textures as well. So we really spend some time to build our own custom shaders to, to get uh, photorealism as it, if it's needed um, or stylized effect to really get um, everything out of the project. After we had all ingredients like textures, light, the actual model, materials and everything together, we came to the part where we created style frames. Um, here as well, we really take time on that because this really is an important step to really de 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 uh, define the final look of the animation. As you can see in the two pictures below, the main ingredients are all the same, the colors are more or less the same, the materials are the same, but the look is totally different. So one time it's more moody, one time it's more playful. Um, so what we do is to create a lot of different style frames and then see in which direction we want to push the project. Of course we create animatics as well, based on the storyboard. We start to animate. Um, it's, of course, it's super important for the team to, to know what's happening at what time, to check out timings, to, to check if we have to change animations and stuff. But in commercial projects, uh, obviously, it's important to show it to the clients as well, because um, images uh, is, is one part, but to show the, real, the, the animation itself is a, a crucial part for the client to understand the whole process before rendering, of course. We are super happy that you have uh, really useful post effects uh, in Cinema and Redshift. We use them a lot, but we also um, tend to uh, render images and then jump into After Effects and play around there. Because sometimes it's easier to make iterations there quickly to really define the final look. Um, in this case, we use the ACES workflow with Redshift, which uh, helps a lot to get the last detail out of um, your animation um, and give it a little last sparkle. So after I talked so much about the film, I would like to show it one more time for you to have a more, a better overview of everything and maybe you can pay attention on the small details I was talking about. As Caro said in the beginning, our studio is uh, the pillars of our studio are design, animation, and tech. We are super happy that Maxon um, uh, helps us to not think about the tech so much sometimes, so we can really concentrate on animation and design. Um, and I would like to point that out here one more time because for us, the design is really uh, crucial because you can have the best textures and the best light and the best everything, animations, if the picture in the beginning, the composition and the camera you chose and stuff like that is not right, then it will not look good in the end. So we really take that as a backbone, backbone for our um, animation process. For the animation part, we, we think that you really should pay attention to the details. Like you see in this shot here, we, we try to make a lot of small animation beside the main animation and we do that because we think it's underlining the, the, the main animation and it's kind of the secondary animation in, in 2D, which is really giving uh, more attention and more power to the main. 
although in this project the story is not very deep, we try to really give characters to every little piece. So these small coins which are waking up and the one in the background which is like also like, ah, what's happening here? Uh, these small details uh, we really try to implement in the animations to give it more life uh, and to make it more natural and human kind of. And of course, last but not least, the sound is really important for a good animation because again, it's underlining the animation. I um, would, would like to show you three small snippets where you can see again the sound design for the um, different parts. For example, here in the beginning, the coin when it uh, awakes. Or when the coins start rolling, you, uh, it has this, um, this thing behind it and it makes this whoosh. Or the last example, when the speaker in the end before the pack shot goes down, you have this cluck effect. Caro said in the beginning that uh, passion projects also have um, some challenges sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to perfectionism and that you have the feeling you don't know when to end and you want to bring it to an end, but you're not sure. So we would like to share some learnings from the passion projects we did so far. One is set a fixed delivery date. Um, for example, a, um, a presentation like that helps a lot because obviously you have to finish the project to present it. Um, another point we always do is we choose a lead for the project. Like in a commercial project, there's one person who decides in the end and you really need that because it's important that the whole team can bring ideas and you work on that together. But in the end, the, the whole project has to go in one direction, otherwise it's ending in chaos. And last but not least, stick to your plans. Stick to your plans you had in the beginning. If you uh, have, a, have a setup in the beginning where you say, okay, this is a deliverable for us, this is a, our personal client brief, then stick to that and don't change it in the way because you would not do that with a commercial project as well. And this really leads to the best results, we think. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we work quite fast. Uh, we do have time for questions, so feel free to hit us up either right now or afterwards. Um, are there any questions that come to mind Im immediately? <laughs> don't need to be shy, but it's also okay if you don't. Uh, as I said, we're going to be here anyways. Ah, there is a, there is a microphone coming. Yeah. Is it you? Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was a bit late, so maybe it was mentioned, but I was asking where did you guys find your music for the commercial? Where we find our music? Because you, you tell us that it is very important, but where do you find it? And if it was mentioned, sorry, I was a bit late. Yeah. Yeah, there we have mentioned. Um, in general, we, we work with sound designers uh, for the project. We have uh, several um, sound designers. Um, as as artists, they always have different styles, so we choose the right sound designer for the right project. Um, especially in immersive uh, experiences, it's really important that you have like the 3D uh, surround sound, for example, and but then we work with specialists like that. Um, yeah, so we work with custom sounds, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any more questions? I have a question for you. Um, I'm sure you would have been asked this a lot more times. Uh, you work with clients as well, right? So how difficult does it get for you to work with the clients at times when you have to um, explain your vision to them as per the brief that they, that, that they have given you? And how do you navigate through that situation? Like what, what is the best way to navigate through that situation? Yeah, we there um, have quite a strict process um, that we, especially in the first meeting, we go through a lengthy questionnaire of um, getting as much as information as possible. And in that meeting already, we break down the way that we work. So we go into details of everything that um, I had shown you earlier. Maybe if I find the slide again, that could take too long. Um, 
or do you want to find it up there? We uh, sit down with the client and we go th through the step-by-step -step process of how we work and also talking uh, really tangibly about what does it mean time-wise. Um, now, there are moments where there's no turning back uh, if the renders are done. So um, there's a lot of um, the work we have to do there is basically assume the work of an agency and take them by the hand um, and go through it step by step. Is that precise enough? I can yeah, go into it is, it is. deeper. Like, yeah. I just want, because everybody has a different way of working. So it's always good to know how you navigate through that. And I'm pretty sure everybody would be interested in knowing that as well. So thank you for the answer. Mm -mm. Um, any more questions, anybody? Thank you so much, Caro and Timo. Uh, they'll be at the demo booth. So if you all want to have a chat with them, please feel free. Um, thank you so much for being here, watching us. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Um, and if you have missed the presentation, you can watch it on our YouTube channel, Maxon YouTube channel. Uh, you can also check the schedule uh, before and after the show, as well as on the Maxon website. And please do not forget to scan the QR code, because you have a chance of winning gifts from Maxon, uh, Wacom, and CoWeave. Thank you. Thank you.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object, creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new Normal Editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, New nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats, as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and registered materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamp the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new break spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life. Welcome back, everyone. Um, two more presentations to go, and we have Robert Ronitsky with us now. He's a designer and a creative director who has been using Maxon tools for a very long time. And he's going to talk about his creative workflow today with Cinema 4D After Effects and Red Giant. All yours. Thank you, Karan, so much. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, hoi Amsterdam. Who's Dutch? I know you, you, okay, cool. So thanks for, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Robert. Uh, what's your name? Okay, nice to meet you, thank you. Cool. All right, so it's a huge pleasure to be here and to present and talk to you today, sharing some of our work that we've finished and worked on recently. And as Karan said, I've been a long time user and it's really hard to pinpoint at what year exactly I started to use Cinema 4D. Um, but as you said, a very long time, so I don't want you to guess my age, all right? So we're not talking about this. We don't go down this road. As you can see in the back, um, this is a couple of my, my stuff I've been working on. Um, I haven't managed to edit or even let someone edit my new reel because I'm just too busy doing work, right? So shamelessly just showing old work, which I'm still proud of, so that's all good, I think. I'm doing a lot of motion graphics, visual effects here and there, opening titles product visualizations, but also the occasional Star Wars fan film that I've been working on for the past five years and continue to work on, and also we'll share some of that um, along we go. So what is the topic for today? It's called Creative Workflows with Cinema 4D, After Effects, and Red Giant. Okay, so it's a little bit broad, but hopefully we'll have fun because I'd like to, to not just inspire you, but also hope to share a couple of tips and tricks along the way that maybe, hopefully, you didn't know. So um, stay tuned. It's going to be a wild ride. It's going to be 45 minutes packed, maybe 50. It depends on how nice you are to me. Um, so it's, it's a lot we will see. Um, I will cover a couple of motion graphics projects we finished, um, as well as some, um, some future stuff I'm working on. So uh, a lot of visual, visual things. So let's get started um, by saying that I'm here to help and to inspire, OK? Just like this nice young man that is helping this poor lady um, with that bottle, right? So it's, it's just about an act of kindness, okay? Just being kind to each other, helping. So that's, that's my task for today, be here and help you to um, get you going. All right, the first thing I would like to share with you is the promo trailer for the Cintiq um, Pro 27 that we just finished a couple of months ago. And it's a device uh, I use myself. Uh, we also have it here on display. 
and Wacom has been a very fantastic client of mine. I love working with them because the way it works, they're just like, all right, Robert, here's the prototype. These are the new features. Come up with some good stuff, how we can make it into a promo video. I'm like, all right. So I'm sitting down with, with close friends and colleagues I'm working with, and then we get started brainstorming and working on that. But um, images speak better than words, so let me share that with you first so you know what we are going to talk about. So yeah, so that was that. Um, again, a lot of fun to work on this one. And of course, it's not just me who's working on this. So credit where credit is due. Um, I work with a fantastic team of artists, uh, namely Max Iglesias, Simon Fiedler, John Eduman, Glenn Southern, Mike Jelinek, and of course, Peter Rice, who did the wonderful music. So of course, uh, again, it's, it's not a one-man thing, although I was directing that. Um, I would like to walk you through some of the processes that we are having in our studio. So most projects usually start with a storyboard and an animatic, or with a storyboard or an animatic. So it really depends on time, budget, you know, all those things that we have just vastly available, right? Um, but kidding aside, it is important because these things help you to fail early and fall softly. So why is that important? Well, you have to communicate to your partners, to your clients, to, to whoever you're working with about what you want to do, right? So imagine just spending, like, imagine like a bathroom, okay? So you're spending, building a bathroom with all those beautiful tiles and the plumbing and it's all done. And then the client says, oh, hang on. <laughs> the toilet should have been on the other side. <laughs> so it's like, okay, hang on. You should have told us, right? So it's the same thing. Um, so you have to work very carefully and that's why we um, came up with uh, a full and animatic, no storyboard for this one, because I pretty much had like a visual in mind already. So um, I'm going to share that with you. And first, for example, the first shot you can see, where you can see one of the, the pen tray, it looks beautiful design-wise, but it just didn't work when rendered, because it's a black, black uh, product on the black background, so we didn't have any highlights to catch. Um, so that was, that was one thing that we stripped. Um, the other thing was working with Simon Fiedler, who did... Um, all the animations um, in Houdini, creating all those particles and the simulations by applying pressure on his tablet. So it's actually a simulation of the data. So it's not just like some fancy movement, but actual data that is visualized. Um, that was helpful to, to see how that works in the context of the whole trailer. But also things like where will typography be, where we'll be adding feature callouts and all that stuff. But also keeping in mind the demand for multiple social media aspect ratios and formats, because it's always a thing, you know, and who hadn't had that, that the client said, all right, shoot it in 16 by 9, but I also want vertical. Did anyone have that? Yeah? Okay. So you, you know how that feels, right? Because hang on, we're going from this to this? It's like, it's quite opposite, right? So we're trying to accommodate all of that. Um, but before we talk about this, let's talk a little bit about the look and the style of this thing, because look and style really goes hand in hand with timing. But also, it's important to like, work in parallel. So mostly, one of us is working on the timing and the blocking of the camera and the animation, whereas, for example, Max uh, was working on the shading and the look of how things should look like. So we have a couple of um, slides here where you can see we were you know, experimenting. This is a couple of renders from Simon Fiedler where we're just looking like, how can we play with the flow lines, the topic of flow and being in the creative zone and in the flow, uh, visualizing that. Um, these were 
these were really nice, but we toned it down a little bit, um, just making it like, OK, so we have enough product to see, enough space for text. Um, and then the next thing we tried was playing with lines, with those lines as, as a light source. OK, so those lines that are floating around in space are illuminating the tablet, uh, looking mysterious. We found it to be a little less, um, uh, it didn't work as well, as well because there was not enough contrast. So that's why we uh, went a different route using uh, normal studio lights in combination with those splines that illuminate the tablet. So these are a couple of renderings. Um, uh, but also screen content, right? So Wacom said, hey, we want to address a broad range of artists. Okay, so a lot of people are using these devices, right? So who are these artists? You have um, uh, concept artists, you have VFX artists, you have car designers. So we wanted to have like quite a lot of those artists like talk to in terms of the visual that is representative for that focus group. So of course. Um, I reached out to a very, very good artist that is called Glenn Southern. Um, I don't know if who of you knows him. Uh, he goes by the name uh, Southern F GFX on, on Instagram. You can check it out. And the brief was create a creature, but Wacom didn't want to have like an intimidating monster, but rather you know, something like a nice monster. So how can you do that? So we sat down together and we, we thought about what he can do. And he's like an immensely talented sculptor. He's just insane how fast it comes up with those things. And um, the idea was to create a monster that is kind of like not intimidating, but it's a mother with a calf swimming in water. So it's a sea creature because it likes diving. Again, pretty open brief, just not make it intimidating. And uh, he, he just sent that back within, within just a few hours, which was crazy. And he's using, um, he's using actually ZBrush to sculpt. And in fact, he's also a real sculptor. So he can, he can use hands, you know, Everyone knows hands, right? These are these things that we can use. Hands can create wonderful things in real life. You know, so with a piece of clay, he can just sculpt amazing, amazing uh, figures and characters. And in fact, he also worked on Guillermo de Tolo's um, Pinocchio, uh, was res responsible for the Pinocchio um, figure, which is amazing. So this is a little bit of the process that he made, just blocking out the rough character. And then he sent that along. And, um, I have no idea of ZBrush myself. I'm, I'm not a ZBrush artist, but I love and admire people who can. And these were the first drafts. Um, I, I wasn't so happy with, the, with them being so close, although it's like a, like, a hug, like a hug. But to me, it was important to have a little bit of separation. I always step back from the screen and squint my eyes and see how much can you still make out. So I wanted to have a little bit of more contrast. Um, so this was the next one, again, in the water, um, side by side. But I felt it just works better if you go for a top, top down shot, um, seeing the water from above. So we communicate like really fast. OK, this is in the water. You, 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 know, you can see the creatures one by one. And there's a hint of a family and multiple creatures um, swimming around. And then the next thing um, was, of course, Mike Yelinek's car design that is in the first shot uh, that you just kindly sent to me. It's like a fantastic car designer. And all that was missing was a VFX shot. Um, so I was like, okay, Robert, maybe I can do a VFX shot. So I was tasking myself to do something, and this was that. Um, actually, I had very, very little time for that. Um, it was quite late in the project. Uh, it's always difficult to go in and license something. You just cannot ask ILM, give us some footage of Star Wars, and it's just impossible, right? So that's why we had to come up with something that is um, self-made. So uh, it's an Adobe stock um, cloud background that I downloaded. It's a spaceship. I licensed, um, textured that, added a little bit of optical glow, used SuperComp to comp it together, and this was done in about a day. So really, just really fast turnaround, um, and it works works nicely, I, I think. So let's talk about formats. If your client asks you, or if you ask your clients, how many formats do you need, and the answer is yes, you know it's a lot of formats and a lot of work involved. So let me talk a little bit about that. The exact formats that we had to accommodate was 16 by 9, 1 by 1, 4 by 5, and 9 by 16. So it's all the social media feeds can be, uh, um, can be fed with, with, the, with these work. And the way we are working for the past three or four trailers, I think, we developed the process of working in a square format. So we're working way too big, actually, right? So we are basically laying everything out um, in a huge format. Um, and the hero format is 16 by 9. So we frame everything 16 by 9, but um, I hope you can actually see that. It's quite dark. Um, so everything that, that plays back 
is framed in a composition um, that it looks best in 16 by 9. This, this is what we call hero format. But of course, um, if you l look at those guides, it works well. But we can also use um, this to play around with the vertical format because we are in a, in a square master format. And we put this into After Effects, and we can just shift this around depending on where we are. So if, if it moves to the left or to the right, um, we can accommodate that and, for example, change the typography. And I'm a typography nerd, so I like to work with, with uh, nice animated typography. I can shift it from the side to the top. And even when it's 3D, um, we can work with that because you know, we can have the camera exchange from Cinema to After Effects and still make sure that it's working in the space. Um, but this is how we can accommodate um, all those formats, and it, it's, just, um, it's just a breeze and nice, nice to work with. And especially if you look at this one, um, we also did a couple of cutdowns, like 15 and 30 second versions. Um, and I believe it works quite naturally if you just you know, use all the space that you have available, uh, combined with rearranging the typography and also making sure that we have to work with 20 languages. So everything has to be translated um, into, into different languages and including all the, uh, for example, the Arabic version, you know, it's right to left, so we also need to keep that in mind, but we can work with that. So it's not a one-click solution, but it's great to work with this because we have to use that template in After Effects and just animate it um, the way we want. I can show you a couple of things um, in C4D um, on the specific setup. So this is the this is our working file, and it's a, quite a huge file. It's 450 megs because it has everything in there. And credit to Max Iglesias, who is my partner in crime I'm working with um, on this one and with many other projects. And he has, I mean, he's, he's like very organized, okay? I'm, I'm very unorganized, okay? I'm just like, don't name layers. Hey, don't tell anyone. Michelle, I'm trusting you. Don't tell anyone. I'm not naming layers sometimes. Sometimes I do, but sometimes. Um, so... He's like, Robert, let's get organized. And what he likes to do is um, to work with takes. So everything is organized in takes. That's why we have one file. And the beauty of working in takes is we can very quickly go ahead and go to, um, for example, a different shot, like this one. OK? So if we're, if we're going into this shot, um, you will see um, that it changed everything. All of a sudden, you have a hand in there, a different camera. And this is the beauty of it. The file will be bigger, yes, but we have one file where everything is consolidated, we can work in one file, we can go into the takes, and when we are done, um, we can go ahead and say render mark takes to picture viewer, which is beautiful because then you can have all your takes render overnight. Even if one take is finished, let's say three hours in, then you still have like eight or nine hours before the next workday starts, and then it will just render the next take, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun um, to do. And here you can also see how we are, how we are working with, um, with the framing. And one thing I would like to point out, if I will show you the, the camera, uh, let me see if I can find it. For this one, uh, control, let me search for a camera. I'll show, you, I'll show you the next one. It doesn't matter. Actually, hang on. I have it here. Um, so if we go to composition, um, I can work with the grids. And this is something I do a lot uh, because I'm really conscious about what, um, what composition I use and what lens we're using, right? So a friend of mine made this joke in one of his presentations uh, a couple of years ago. He said, you can use a different lens other than 36 millimeter, right? Because everyone is using the same lens and it's you know, pretty much a wide angle lens. But be very conscious about what lens you use 50, 80 millimeter to tell the narrative, to help you know, drive the story and focus on and what you would use in real life, right? If you are doing a product shot, going really close to a project, you would use 100 macro and stuff like that. And this will also influence um, the look of your project and to be conscious about it. And the other thing I really like to use a lot is the uh, golden selection as well as the golden spiral of where you are looking. And, um, I didn't check if that is perfect for this one, um, but it is, yeah. So I'm always trying to maintain where your, your eye is going to. And I will show you a different example um, once we proceed um, to, the next, to the next project. Cool. So um, I hope you're still with me. Let's switch gears and talk about another topic that took a little bit of getting used to and you know, wrapping my head around, 
which is called ACES. Who knows what ACES stands for? Okay. Okay. I, I know you know. I know I didn't know, like, a couple of months ago. It stands for Academy Color Encoding System. And it's, it's been implemented in Cinema 4D for quite a while. It's been implemented in, in Redshift as well. Uh, and, of course, in other tools like After Effects, which is my other favorite tool to work and use. And thankfully, a couple of months ago, it's been implemented really well into After Effects. So I was like, all right, let's get going. Let's use it you know, properly without third-party plugins and all that. But I needed to understand what it is. And it drove me nuts, because it's, it's easy once you understand it. But to get there, it's kind of like, OK, it needs some work. In a nutshell, it's an industry standard for that. And it's managing the color throughout your pipeline, no matter if it's you know, motion picture, television, video, games, whatever. It is there to be a standardized workflow, making sure color consistency is always there and always preserved. So you're always working in something like ACES CG, which is something you use um, when you render stuff. You know, I have friends that work at ILM. I ask, like, so what are you using? Are you using ACES CG? Oh, cool. It's the same stuff that I use, right? So it's, it's a basically uh, an, a, a standard. And talking about standards, it's important, because standards are great. Everyone should have one. That's the thing with standards, right? Um, I don't know who was the, the, the owner of this quote. I found it in one of the forums when I was going through to understand what it is. And I would like to give a big shout out to um, two people that helped me along the way, which is Max and Dr. Sassy from Maxon, who actually took countless hours in person and as well as online sessions, like just privately explaining, being very patient with me, explaining what it is and what it is not, what it is good for and what it is not. So very broadly, I mean, this would not, we, we don't have enough time to cover everything in this session, but very generally speaking, ACES is just like a giant color workspace, a giant, a big, big color gamut, way bigger than what we can actually display these days, um, but also way bigger than what we have with what we are used to in our monitors, which is sRGB or Rec. 709. So this is, again, just a simplified um, display of that. But also there's different color spaces like DCI P3, which most of us have in our pocket looking at your iPhone or iPad, for example, which also has a uh, pretty significantly bigger color space than sRGB. So working in a bigger color space allows you to have better results when you are lighting something, when you have light fall-offs, and all those beautiful things that actually will make your renders look a little bit better. It's not a, like a one-click solution, and all of a sudden it's better. It will just help you to drive home uh, a better result. But you would say, all right, let's use it all the time, everywhere, anywhere. Well, that's not right, because especially if you're doing product-related uh, renders, and your client comes up and gives you hex values for RGB, you can't use those values, right? So it's, it's not that easy to just simply say, right, this is the RGB value. So it's rather meant if you have a, like a VFX workflow, okay? effects heavy things. If you are combining rendered stuff with film footage, then that is the way to go. So don't just use it for everything just because it's, it's there, right? Okay. A um, couple of things I found along the way. There's an ACES primer, which is free. You can download it. Uh, you can you know, photograph that or just rewatch the stream. And of course, some information you will find on OCIO's website regarding how the Open Color I.O. workflow is implemented. But let's be a bit more practical. It shouldn't be like school. You know? We all have been to school, hopefully. Been there, done that. Enough of that. So let's talk a little bit of passion. And the joy of passion, in fact, passion projects. And the, why I'm a big advocate of passion projects is because it gives you a playground to try out new technology and new tools. It's always tricky if, if a client comes up and says, all right, here is this and that amount of money, do something, and feel free to try something new. Break it. Maybe the project is not finished in time. That's fine. No, no one says that, right? So it's always a bit tricky if you are trying new workflows with you know, important client work. So that's why passion projects, side projects, personal projects, whatever you want to call them, are so important in your own development as an artist, because you can use this as a playground to try new cool stuff. So um, for that, um, my, my biggest example is probably my E11 short, just like a shameless um, quick uh, shout out. If you want to see it, you can rewatch last year's IBC demo on the Maxon um, uh, YouTube site. You can check it all out, how that was built. 
And of course, you can also uh, scan the code to see the short if you're interested. But I'm not going to bore you with old stuff, because uh, after releasing that, um, many people said, hey, can we on, make it a series, do more stuff around that? Then I was like, two weeks after release, I was like, all right, I'll carry on. So I have a bunch of ideas working in about three or four simultaneous episodes. Uh, I'm not going to tell the story, but I'm going to show you a few new shots that I've never shared uh, or shown publicly. And again, this was one of the things where I wanted to learn the new workflow uh, with Asus CG. And this is this uh, spaceship um, I, I bought from a very talented modeler called uh, Trainy McTrainface. Um, I licensed it through, through CG Trader, and I wanted to have a shot that is uh, featuring the infamous hyperspace. And he didn't texture the, uh, the ship. And I was like, all right, let's go ahead, because that's another example in, in my short film work. Substance 3D Painter was the chance for me to learn this new tool. My friend Chan Eruman said, hey, Robert, getting all those scuffs and all the, the messed up, grungy look on those textures, try Painter 3D. And I'm like, all right, let's go. And so I, I went ahead, you know, got Substance Painter, you know, tried my, my way around it, and I was blown away. I had like, such a magical experience because like, in real time, you can paint on your model without having to wait for a render. So I applied um, a couple of textures on this ship, um, using using uh, Painter and then taking that into uh, Cinema 4D. So uh, I'm showing some little love for Painter. Uh, just going to be very brief, uh, and hopefully it will get your excitement as well. So here you can see the ship in Painter, and you can see several different um, um, uh, areas. Okay, like hull, hull accent, greeblies, turrets, and so on. And the first thing I didn't understand, like how can I get multiple multiple um, shapes and areas? of a 3D object to be textured separately. And then I found out it's very important to go in to Cinema 4D and select those separate parts that you want to have separately textured and give them a new separate material. Okay, So as soon as you have a separate material for a separate 3D object or geometry, this will be recognized as a separate element in um, Substance Painter. And that allows you to texture it separately. The next important thing was to make sure you have wonderful UV maps, OK? And um, UV mapping is, is an art of its own. I know that. And thankfully, there's this feature um, where you can go ahead in Cinema 4D and say, set UV from projection, and you can go automated packed UVs. That works a lot of times. For the love of God, why can't just AI do a wonderful, I mean, we can do images and everything, but yet we are here spending hours making sure it unwraps beautifully. If, for those of you who doesn't know what a UV unwrap is, OK, that's fine. We are all friends, OK? I'm not telling anyone, OK? That's, that's cool. All right, so Easter Bunny uh, or Santa Claus chocolate thingy, like wrapped in tinfoil, OK? So I have that red coat or the Easter Bunny, you know, with the, the green thing and ears. And so if you take that chocolate thing and you take the tinfoil and unwrap it, you will have like a square texture, basically, where you have the eyes and you know, the, the clothes and everything. And that is unwrapping. It's basically telling something in 2D space where something is in 3D space. Okay? So that is the, the beauty of it. And it's important that you do that so that um, tools like Painter know where you want to apply textures to. And the cool thing is, and let me go ahead and uh, quickly show you something that I really like. It's called Smart Materials. Um, they are certainly smarter than I am, because that's what I used first um, just to play around with it. And let me say, you want to do a new paint job um, to this cruiser. Uh, let me go ahead and find that green, um, that green steel uh, painted. So I can just take that and drag and drop this onto any of the, of the uh, corresponding layers. And look at that. Um, this is just like, this is so crazy. I love it so much. All right, so you can see all the, the edge wear. And this is doing it dynamically because it detects where there's an edge break. Okay, and the cool thing is this is all completely parametric. So uh, yes, you can paint over and you can say, at this exact pixel, I don't want to have any you know, scuffed edges. So you can paint over pressure sensitively on the mask. And, um, but if you go in, and let me show you the, the edge damage, which is right here. I can go into curvature, and I can just say, like, oh, hang on. This is a brand new ship. This has no damage, you know? Not used, OK? 
pay the full price. Um, but if you want to say like, okay, this one has seen a little bit of action, you can increase that and just play dynamic with that. But also going in and uh, let me zoom in a little bit on this one and rotate around just like that. Let me add a new, a new paint layer. And let's go ahead with laser. I'll go ahead with laser impact because this one, <laughs> I was like, when the first, the first time I tried it, I was like, no way. Okay, hang on. Let me make this black. And let me do like this, pew. Okay, you don't have to do the sounds, okay? I'm just doing them, right? So you have those impacts. Uh, so so this, this ship has seen some action. Uh, you can also change it not to be glossy, but matte. Um, I've added a couple of over here and there. And this is just the beauty. It's just fun working with that. You export that out um, to Redshift to work with that in, um, in Cinema 4D, and you render things out to make them look um, beautiful. So um, shameless self-promotion, okay? If you're interested a little bit more about finding out, I'll, I'll have the honor to speak at Adobe Max. So there is, a, there is actually a, an in-person talk and a virtual talk. So if you scan that, you will get to the page. You can download um, the information, and then you can register and watch it. Or say hello in LA. All right. Commercial break finished. Let's see what I created. And I hope you can really see on the, on the rather um, dim screen. So this is that ship flying through hyperspace um, really fast, uh, going to a very special mission. Uh, but also another shot that looks like this. And again, this is fan art, completely unofficial, inspired by the galaxy far, far away. So you can, you can see the ship like really zipping across um, space here. And I want to show you how this was built uh, because it's, it's a lot of fun and it involves um, these two fantastic tools. So let's get going. All right. Space Tunnel. Uh, let's switch the user interface to this one. And let me just hit play. So you can see how, how the, sh the ship is zipping across. Uh, it's actually really simple. And again, a big shout out to my friend, uh, friend uh, Chan Eduman, who I reached out to and said, hey, how can I can create this hyperspace volumetric, blue, streaky stuff? And um, he was like, yeah, let's I can, I can build you a setup. I'm not the best shader setup, node tree person, OK? But uh, I, I think I'm an OK artist, so I wanted something where I can work with to art direct it very intuitively. So he came across and, and built me this wonderful setup that actually, and let me show you how it, how it actually looks if we zoom out a little bit. So it's like a very long tube, and you have the ship just flying across this tube. And in this very long tube, there's just a texture mapped onto it that just twists and rotate, rotates with the, the twist deformer. So you can see the, the angle. So you can just twist this uh, as you like. And the beauty of that, um, looking at the, um, let me show you the notes. Looking at this one, um, it involves two ramps. OK, so look, looking at the ramp, let me start the preview for this one in Redshift. I love how the MacBooks are saying, you have a lot of VRAM. We recommend increasing bucket size. Um, so this is the render. It renders quite fast. And you can see that, um, you know, that fluffy, strokey thing, uh, space. And the way um, Chan set it up for me to be able to art direct it was basically having multiple colors in a ramp, like a multicolor ramp. And the good thing is I could just go in ahead and, and fine tune that. So going in and selecting a color, uh, and just changing that will pretty much dramatically change the outcome if I chose the right, um, the right one. Let me see which one that is, because it's, yeah. So uh, can you see that? So just a little color change, or even just shifting it, will result in a completely different looking um, result. And, and it was a very, very fine, like super micro detail. So just shifting the color and shifting these sliders by the tiny bit could make it go overboard, like way too bright or way too dark. And it was, the challenge was just to find the right balance. So I always say the joke, that I'm not a good enough cinema for the artist to have a finished picture, but I'm hell of a, you know, like good enough artist in After Effects combined with Cinema 4D to get to the finish line and to combine my skills in those tools to, to deliver something that looks, um, that looks nice. So that was fun. Um, so it's just basically two, two RAMs that are, that are working together 
uh, in conjunction to create this, uh, this basically this, this space. So um, let me show you another thing that I kind of hinted at towards uh, the, the Wacom uh, part. And this is about composi composition of, of uh, basically framing and the blocking of your camera and your shot. And let me show you this one. I'm going to, going to this one, GoPro. Uh, let me just get rid of that. You can pretty much see that I've used the golden spiral as well as the rule of thirds to frame and composite my shot of how the spaceship should look like and how it should be framed. So the point of interest, of course, is the ominous target in the distance, but of course also using the rule of thirds to make sure it, it looks nice. And if I play that back, you will see nothing really happens. All this is just flying in this direction, moving down in Z space. But how can you add a bit more, make it more dynamic and add a bit more action? Well, there's a very easy solution for that. And I call this like GoPro left. Imagine like, I love those shots in the, in the real movies where you see the side of the, the ship or the plane, even in, in movies like Top Gun, where it flies and the camera is like mounted. It's like an action cam, like a GoPro. And it just vibrates a little bit and it's like, oh, I'm just flying so fast on this thing going through the valley. So that's what I wanted to uh, imitate here. So I called it GoPro left. It's mounted to the ship, um, but it's very static. So what you can do is go ahead to animation, animation tags, and add the vibrate tag. And it does exactly what it says. It will give you... It's similar if you're an after effects person, it's like the wiggle expression, okay? It makes things wiggle and move. It's exactly the same thing, um, just in 3D. So I can uh, say the frequency is 20, uh, maybe 1, 1, 1. Maybe that's too much. I don't know. Let's see. 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0. 0.1, 0. 2. And let's play that and see what it looks like. Okay? Already you can see there's a little bit of wiggle, okay? You can really tell... This is like, this is fast, but it's not moving so much because it's an imperial mount that they're using and they're really good quality, so it's dampening quite a lot of the wiggle, okay? So it's, uh, it's good stuff, it's good stuff they're using, of course. So um, how, can you, how can you render this and how can you get this out? Well, let's talk about ACES um, circling back to what I said initially, and I will cover the last 10 minutes compositing everything together so you can see how that works. Well, going into Redshift, um, you will see that you have the option of choosing, um, uh, basically in the, in the previous version, you could choose here Redshift as uh, ACES as the color space. But now, if you go ahead in the new version, you hit Command D or Control D, and then you go to Project, and then to Color Management, and you have to switch it from Basic to Open Color I.O., and then you can use the, the config. It's the 1.2 config, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you can just make sure you're rendering into ACES CG. Let me zoom in here for you. So you're rendering ACES CG, you're displaying it in sRGB. This will be output to YouTube. Um, and you have to make sure that you have a view transform also enabled if you want to render the, the transformations um, of how it is perceived into the file. But I want to render um, just a regular EXR file in 32-bit, so I want to do all the transform and the view um, the view stuff in After Effects. Cool. All right, let me just go out and free up some memory. And let's get going with After Effects. Who of you is using After Effects? Okay, what about you? Okay, a little bit, okay, yeah. That's cool. It's, it's the tool I started with first. My history with After Effects is going from web design using, you know, Flash and then Live Motion. I don't know if who remembers Live Motion. Anyone? You do? That's good. Oh, yeah, it's like a little tear. Yeah, it was, it was like the, the Flash Pondar from Adobe, which was a, a, a great tool. It was my first touch point of understanding that being able to animate something just by myself can be something that is actually feasible and can be done. And then a friend of mine, Steve, uh, Holmes introduced me to After Effects, saying like, hey, Robert, you know, this is the cool stuff you can do with. That was about 22 years ago. Jesus. Okay. So um, that's the tool I feel very, very at home at. And uh, let me show you a couple of things uh, on how you can uh, get going and a couple of tricks along the way. So it's wonderful, you know, to do stuff in 3D in After Effects, and you can now in the beta especially. But with... Um, with, with things that are coming out of Cinema 4D that have um, 
a bit more going, you know, with ACES and motion blur and, and depth of field and iron 4K. I revert most of the times to the traditional workflow, which is compositing EXR. Compositing is sounding like Arnold, right? <laughs> the compositing um, in in After Effects, the traditional way, OK? So how can you get those files in, those EXRs? Well, let me show you a trick that will also help you to get in 3D data. And this is like an old school workflow that I've used 18 years ago, probably, as well. Going, oh, OK, close to Cinema 4D. Let me just open that up again so you know. Um, because you can not only output rendered files like EXRs, but you can also output 3D data um, either with a Cineware plugin or the uh, old school way by exporting it. So the way you can do that is you go to your save dialog, and there, hidden, again, with many tools, little button, big impact, OK? So little button, toggle this open. Ah, save, After Effects, relative 3D data, include 3D data, lights, cameras, and so on. Save project file, and then this will enable you to open up an AEC file with all the files and all the 3D data intact. But then you will find that you cannot open it up. Why? Well, the answer for that is you probably don't have the latest plugin installed. And let me give you a little hand on how to do that. Going to your Maxon Cinema 4D 24 install uh, folder, you go to Exchange Plugins, and you go to After Effects, Importer, OS X, CSCC, C4D Importer. Unzip that file and put that into your After Effects plugins folder, and then you'll be able to import those files straight into After Effects. So I will do that right away. Going to hyperspeed, I have my output folder here with all my EXRs. I drag and drop that file to After Effects, and then this will be imported. So I have special passes, a ship side, and also a composition. Opening up that composition, you will see, oh, that's great. It's my three-second file. Let me reduce the, the comp area and get rid of all the cameras that I didn't, didn't use. So I just have this one. I have my, uh, my puzzle mat and my emission uh, channel. So emission is basically just the lights. I don't know if you see them. To make them really, really big, you will probably see them. OK, so that's, that's that. All is there. Perfect. But I'm still missing a couple of the sequences. And if I look at the sequences, um, you will see that they have been imported at 24 frames per second, but it's not ACES. Yet, I'm here telling you how to use the ACES workflow. So how can you do that? Well, you can do that before you create a composition or a project or during that, but I would not recommend changing it once you've changed it or set it up. So you go to File, Project Settings, Color, and then, OK, now I've set this up before. But usually, it stands on Adobe Color Managed. So you have to make sure you select OCIO Color Managed. You can choose the profile if you want to change that. Make sure 32 bits is active. And you're working in the ACES CG uh, color space. And you display it. You convert it, basically, to display it in sRGB. So After Effects is doing all the math for you uh, while you work with that. OK, so that's cool. And let's look at the import dialog, because I have my ship here. So here's my ship. Um, without an alpha mat. Um, but how can I get the other files in, for example, the background? Because I was rendering the ship and the background, the tunnel, separately. I want to combine them in After Effects. Well, let me show you one thing, um, which is important. You go to Interpret Footage, Main, and then you set up. No, come on. Interpret Main. You set up the color to be not default ACES 2065, but uh, rendering ACES, ACES CG. This will change the look a little bit, but it will be exactly that, what we rendered out out of Cinema 4D with Redshift. So that's done. And a little trick I can also show you, if you go to your interpret footage dialog, and this helped me a lot, you go to assume this frame rate 24. And if you don't change the, the, the default import frame rate from 30 to 24, image sequences will always be imported at 30 frames per second but we work with 24 here. So let me show you what happens if you import another file. So let me go in and import the tunnel. OK, so I import the tunnel as an EXR. And now, if, if this would be like 10 sequences, I had to go interpret footage, 24, ACCG, and so on and so on. But now, 
this having, um, you know, since I changed this to uh, main color, again, rendering ACES TG, and I say interpret footage, remember interpretation. I click on that, and I apply that onto this one. Apply interpretation, boom, 24 ACES TG. And you can multi click that. I mean, it's a quality of life feature, but it helps you tremendously. All right, so let's get going and, and slapping this together really quickly. Okay, so I'm adding the tunnel. So here's the tunnel. I, I even have those informations for main engine, start, end. So um, see that? That looks good. Uh, get rid of the puzzle mat and make sure the ship is also in there. Okay, but now where's the alpha? Well, let me add the alpha in here. And now with the new track mat feature, I can just, no matter where it is, I can select that and say, okay, let's go ahead and use the luminance values to mat out that ship. So that looks, that looks cool, uh, I would say. But there's a couple of things I would like to add. For example, I have the emission pass. I selected that, and I select the alpha channel, and I will do a pre-comp calling this ship. Okay, so here we are. No transparency, um, because again, going to the ship, you will see that within the ship, um, we still have the emission channel active. Okay, so putting the emission channel with the lights above that, we can, without duplicating the below layer, we can say, all right, use the same mat, use the same principle, and now I only see my emission, my lights. And now I can go and say, let's add uh, optical glow, which is really nice because it has like a proper light. But be aware, if you're using ACES or a linear workflow, you have to make sure that you're not selecting video, but linear. And this will change the way light is calculated. Uh, inverse square fall off, more realistic. So that looks better. So now you have the lights in here. Everything is transparent. But the really, really keen viewer will notice we don't have any light leaks above the ship. It's a super bright light source, but we want to have that bleeding in, into the ship. So how can we do that? For that, I use SuperComp. And let me show you that um, in a second. Let me just first pre-compose the background and call this background so it's a little bit more easier to follow. And I'm selecting both of these. Go to Effect, Red Giant VFX, SuperComp. Okay, super comp. Again, a little thing to watch out for. It took me a while to understand. You also have to change the output gamma from video to linear for the entire comp, and you have to define for each element that you're using that this is also um, linear, and this one is also linear. And as soon as you do that, you will see the same exact result maintaining the ACES workflow within After Effects, within SuperComp. But now, this is where the magic happens with SuperComp. Looking at my ship composition, I can do multiple things. First of all, I can um, choose a little color correction. I don't want to color correct it, really, because I like the color. I just want to boost the exposure a little bit, just to make it ever so slightly brighter and a little bit stand out a little bit more. I push it a bit more for, for, um, for this display, so it looks a bit better. So that looks nice. But what else can I do? Well, there's interactive light wrap. So I can choose light wrap. And this will be calculating the pixels that are behind the ship and will lay it over the actual ship. So let me just crank this up really a lot um, so it looks um, nice and juicy. Um, so OK, so let's, let's check that out. Look at this. OK, so this is with and without. And even if I open up the, the layer, I can also show you what the light wrap does. This is without, and this is with light wrap. It integrates the ship much better into its environment, so that works really, really well. And the other thing that I would like to point out, and it's the last feature before wrapping it up for today, um, is changing the, the background a little bit. Because again, being very critical, this looks a bit too mathematical. I want to give it a more organic look. So how can we do that? Well. Um, Going into that composition, I can use um, a tool from the Sapphire uh, plugins, and I, and I call this, um, this is called Blur Motion. I love this one. Um, this allows you to basically set a focus point and just twist and rotate around just to create this little bit more organic look to that, which, which I really like. Um, this helps 
to really tie it in and make it a bit more, just a little bit more fluffy and uh, not, not, so, not so mathematical. And of course, what is missing? The last thing, what is missing? Anyone? Come on, shout it out. Shake, no, yeah, what? Effect? A flare, oh, thank God. <laughs> 100 points. <laughs> I would love to give you a hug. A flare, exactly. Lens flares, right? Um, so, how can we do that? Well, there's real lens flares. Let's go ahead and call it flare. And uh, look for real lens flares. And let's just add that. And the beauty of that is that the real lens flares, they're also, once we put them in the right order, they're also working uh, with ACES. So you have to make sure that you change that um, video uh, is not video, but it's linear, and it also gives you ACCG now as a, as a preview. And now, finally, thank God for that update, you can specify lights as the source of your lens flare. So, um, basically, I know that I have my, my start um, 3D object right here. Let me just isolate that. It's right over there. I'm going to do a new light. Uh, it can be a point light, and I'm going to copy and paste all those keyframes onto the light. Sorry, let's go ahead like this, okay? And now going back to my lens flare, I will select, not a 2D position, but AE light. And all of a sudden, boom, it snaps in. Let's go ahead and use add and make it a little bit smaller, maybe like 2%. And this will travel along. And when I render it out, you will see how it looks. Maybe it's a little bit too strong. I know there are certain directors who would love it. More lens flare is always better. But that's basically it. Um, there's a little bonus if you have two more minutes um, to spare, because I want to share a little bit more. Um, this is the interior shot we worked on. Uh, it is all in camera. We're trying a little bit of new playground technology stuff that we want to uh, have some joy with it. Here are the troopers sitting, you know, getting ready to jump. And again, this is all in camera. Um, so how did we do it? Um, I was always intrigued by how they do this in Mandalorian with virtual production, OK? So we did virtual production for the broke artist, OK? So it's a huge screen that a friend of mine, Christian Obermeier, uh, uh, borrowed me with a short throw laser projector, just like this one. So I can stand here, and still the, I'm not blocking the light rays, but I can have really close distance. And this is throwing that, um, that animation onto that. So I use Particular to create a couple of stars, the streak effect to create the transition. And then we transition over to fractal noise that is running as a loop and gives you basically the impression. If, if you would film me with this, with the camera right here, this is the same principle, OK? So we're using this just to play around with some new fancy uh, ideas of how we can just you know, have fun as creatives doing funky stuff, and even in real time, playing it back in After Effects, shifting the, the layer just to accommodate for the perspective shifting. And that's me. Um, hang on, let me just do that. Uh, that's me here looking completely fascinated by it. Come on, turn it off. All right, so last thing. Action Movie Dad, <laughs> Action Movie Dad said, hey, guys, here's Tom Cruise right before Mission Impossible, hanging onto his plane. Post your own results. And I'm like, all right, you got it. So of course, I had to put Tom Cruise onto the side of the cruiser, hanging on ever so tightly, because yeah, it's Tom Cruise. He can do it all, right? So um, that was like a little fun uh, ode to, uh, to the stuntman and to the visual effects artist doing that. All right, with that being said, um, sorry for running over five minutes. Thank you so, so much for attending. Thank you, everyone online. Um, I see you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks, Karan. Thank you, Maxton, for having me. And have a wonderful remaining day at IBC. Feel free to reach out on any social media or email channels, and I'm happy to answer anything. Do, do we, should we do questions, or um, we have enough time? We can, absolutely. Or you can, you can meet him pers in person as well and ask him. He's going to be around. I will hang around for about an hour next to uh, that booth over there. If you have any pressing questions, please feel free to ask any questions that you have. And I wanted to say thank you to Robert because he's been presenting for Maxon for a while now. And it's always a pleasure.
Thank you. I know him personally as well. He's a super nice dude. So please have a chat. Even if not work, he has a lot of experience about a lot of things. Have a chat about it. And if you are in Munich, please go meet him. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, cool. Thank Thanks you so again. much, Robert. Um, thank you, everyone. We have one more presentation to go by Territory Studio. Um, don't forget to scan the QR code, and you can also watch the presentations live on Maxon YouTube channel, um, as well as anything that you want to learn about Maxon, you can go to the Maxon website. Thank you, and see you in 10 minutes. Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, 
even better Redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new node editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. Welcome back, and it's the last one for today, but for me personally, it's the most exciting one. Um, we are here with Territory Studios. Uh, they are a global studio um, based all over the world and work with clients from all over the world. Um, they are a creative studio with a lot of experience in media, entertainment, and gaming industry. Um, and we have Josh and Pamela here from the studio and they'll be talking about layering familiar techniques to create complex structures and designs. Well, thank you very much, Karan. Um, yeah, thanks guys for coming out and thanks for everyone who's listening online. Uh, my name's Joshua Thorpe. I'm the 3D lead at Territory Studio in London, helping to train and develop the team of designers there. Um, I've spent probably the last 12 years uh, using Cinema 4D and other 3D tools 
to create ads, title sequences, concept art, and visual effects. And this is Pamela. Hi, guys. I'm Pamela, and I am a senior motion designer at Territory Studio. Um, I've had the chance to work on a lot of really exciting projects over the years, um, but for the past year or so, I've mostly been doing a lot of 3D design work for film and games. So you may be familiar with Territory Studio, but Territory is a creative specialist, drawing on years of expertise for design for films, games, brands, and different experiences. And we use that expertise to create compelling future-facing experiences. This drives our vision of imagining new worlds that bring stories to life and take audiences where they've never been before. But what really sets us apart is our hugely talented team that love the craft and have a passion for storytelling and design. Today we'll be demonstrating how we use the Maxon tools within the wider pipeline at Territory, layering and combining familiar tools to create complex structures and designs for a variety of different projects across brand, film, or television. As you can see, it's very common for these tools to be utilized at every step during the creative process, be it in Cinema 4D for modeling, animation, design, Redshift for rendering, or the Red Giant suite within After Effects for motion graphics or compositing. So I'm going to quickly play our showreel so that you can see all of this in action. Thank you very much. Hugely talented team behind all of those projects. And in a lot of cases, Cinema 4D, Redshift, and a lot of other tools from Maxon are heavily used. So let's get into it. Today, we'll both be talking about using very familiar tools that come with Maxon and layering them up to create complex structures and designs. What I love about the Cinema 4D community and the wider 3D community is the open sharing of tips and tricks and knowledge that help us all to work more efficiently and more creatively. There's always a hundred different ways to come at a project and every artist will come at it from a different angle. Events like this are a great opportunity to peek behind the curtain and see how people work and often with tools like Cinema 4D just how simple it can be and how you can achieve very similar results for yourself. So though you may be familiar with a lot of the tools or the techniques that we're using here today, hopefully you will learn something new um, and something that you can implement into your own work and pipelines. So today I'll be breaking down a technique that we used for the launch film for Nike's digital platform, Dot Swoosh. We knew that a key part of the brand was this 
dot. Just a dot, a simple dot that differentiates this new brand from the wider Nike brand. Um, and we knew that that was a key part of the brief. Um, so after exploring a few different options, we just, we, well, the brief was to create a world that felt very digital, um, but still heroed the shoes that Nike are famous for. So after exploring a few different executions, um, I eventually landed on quad trees. Quad trees are a type of grid-like data structure where each node has four children, and each of those has four children, and so on and so on, until you reach the desired level of detail. It's a technique that's often used in 2D image compression, and it inherently has quite a digital look and feel already. Technically, in our case, we were going to be using oct trees, where each node has eight children, and they're laid out in a 3D grid. And you get this kind of voxel-like effect. So let's have a quick look at how we put this to use in the launch teaser for DotSwoosh. So as you can see, we created a large oct tree structure that housed thousands of shoes and Easter eggs. And we had this rapid journey through the dot swoosh world. This oct tree was probably only a couple of subdivision levels deep to keep the consistency size of the shoes and really keep them heroed. And eventually, we land in this gamified world that's decorated with more oct tree like structures. So I'll briefly explain the fundamentals by creating some interesting 2D examples. And then we'll just see how, just how far we can push this in 3D. And then hopefully by the end, we'll have a decent understanding of how you can create something like this, which is very similar to the, the dot swoosh world. But we went on a bit uh, a larger scale with the dot swoosh world. Um, but you can see how you can quickly use the oct tree as a base structure layering up glass and neon and metal connectors to create something that has quite a lot of complexity by the end. OK, so let's jump into Cinema 4D. So like I said, we're going to start off with some 2D examples. So I'm going to start off with the most simple of it all. We're going to start with a plane. We'll start by reducing the size of it and reducing the segments to one. Now, what I'm going to do at the start is I'm going to add this into an instance. And um, the reason for doing this is so that it, later on it's easier to update the shape and um, update the objects that we're using. So I'm going to put that instance that we've made into another instance and just put these into a folder to keep things organized. And I know Robert was mentioning staying organized. This is a helpful tip to help you stay organized. You can change the icon of anything in C4D. Um, so what I like to do is create nulls and then change the icon to a folder just to help me know that there's other stuff in there. So you can come down here into the basic tab, and it's, it's hidden under this little icon twirl down. And you can just load these different presets in here. Lots of different icons, very helpful for rigging, or like I like to do, keep organized. And you can change it to any color there as well. So back to it. I'm going to put that second instance into a cloner. You can just uh, press Alt and click on the cloner, and it will automatically make that instance a child of that. And I'll stick with the 3x3 three three grid, but obviously we want to make the grid spacing the same size as our instance. Now, like I said, we've got these nodes, if you like, or these planes, but we want to divide them in half. So how I'll do that by creating another cloner that's just two by two this time. And because we're, because we're getting incrementally more detailed, we actually need to make the spacing of this one half as much as before. So the last one was 20. This one will be 10. I want that to be 2. And I'll also halve the transform of this one as well. Whoops. And then I'll put that cloner inside the other cloner. Now, the, there's a bit of funny business there. They've disappeared. So what we need to make sure we're doing is copying that instance into the new cloner as well. Sorry about that.
There we go. So now we can see straight away we're getting that kind of subdivision look. And you can, like I said, you can increase the detail by just layering that up. So I can copy that cloner again inside itself and again. And you slowly get more and more detail. Now, right now, it's just iterating between the clones. So it's, you're getting this very repetitive structure. How do we have control over how these are distributed? So the best way to do this is with effectors. So I'm going to use a plane effector. And I'm going to make sure that it's being applied to all of my clones. Just come over here to the effector tab and drag that into there. Now, by default, a plane effector shifts the position. We want to turn that off. And we're not going to affect rotation or scale either. We want to actually affect which clone is being shown. So to do that, we can come down to modify clone and just drag that up to 100. And now we've gone back to the lowest level of subdivisions. And then to control which is being shown, we can just use fields. So that could just be a simple random field. And as you can see, we can go through the different seeds, and you're getting different patterns. You can even animate this and have that playing. And it's already look quite an interesting um, look that we're getting there. But one of my favorite things to do is control this with an image. And so we know exactly what it's going to look like, and we have loads of control over that. So I'll create a new standard material. And I've got an image that I know I want to use here, which is this kind of wavy gradient. And I'll apply that to the cloner. Now, by default, it just applies the texture once to every single clone. That's not what we want to do. We want it to go um, over the whole whole image, so we need to change the projection in the settings to flat. Now, right now, it's looking in the wrong direction, so you can come up to the top here and change this to texture transform. I'm going to rotate it just 90 degrees. Whoops, a daisy. Just 90 degrees, so it's facing down. And then another handy trick here is you can right-click on your texture and fit it to object. Yes, we want to include the children, and it fits it perfectly to that object. Now, in the plane, we no longer want the random field. We want to control it with our material that we've just applied. So we can use the shader field and change this from custom to color. And it will use the color that we applied into the material tag, which we can just drag into there. And you can see already we're getting something, but it's probably not quite what we're after. Um, another thing that I want to change here is I want the color to be applied. I want one color to be applied per clone rather than the image to be applied over the whole thing. So what I'll do is come to the material. I'll just add a selection into here. We don't have any selections, so that will turn it off. And then we'll come up to the shader and then just force this to update by switching this to color and then no color. And then we'll get the color showing up that way. Now, say we want to control how this is being distributed. It's, it's still not quite how we want it. So we can come down into the shader field and go down to remapping. And then there's this handy contour uh, option at the bottom where you can add uh, some, uh, a quadratic um, effector, which you can just slide, which is kind of like a curve. Or you can actually add a custom curve as well. And you can see here we're getting a better distribution of those clones that match more evenly up with the image that, we've won, that we uh, have added there. Now, if you're still not happy with that, say you want to see more of this kind of like second level of subdivision, you want to see more of those, you can actually just go into the cloner and copy that again so you get more of those showing up. So it's, it's kind of favoring that size of the instance instead. Now, like I said, there's no reason this has to be a square. And we set it up in such a way at the beginning that it's very easy to swap that out. So I'm going to come and add a disk, make that a little bit smaller to match the size of our scene, drag that into the instances. And then I'll go to that first instance that we create, created, drag our disk to replace the plane. And straight away, you can see that it's updated that. And I'll just turn the lines off, increase the subdivisions. 
And you can see now instead of a more digital look, we're getting a bit more of an analog look, kind of like a halftone look. And you could push this as far as you wanted to. There's no reason this has to be this size. It can be any size. You can limit it to uh, different shapes with effectors in similar ways. This could even be 3D objects as well. So let's just quickly grab a cube, make it a similar size. Maybe add a fillet on there. And in the same way, we can just drag that into our first instance. And now we've got 3D objects in there. It's very easy to just use this as like a base framework to get some interesting results straight away. So talking of um, 3D objects, let's see how now we can turn this into an oct tree by using it in a 3D laid out grid. So in the same way, we're going to add uh, a basic object. In this case, it will be a cube, because we want to go into the 3D space this time. Same as before, we'll add a couple of instances of that and just tidy things up here a little bit. Put that into a cloner. And this time, we'll just do a 2 by 2. Again, we want it to be the same size. Um, make sure we're going up as well. We want it to be the same size as our cube. And then I'll just bring this up in the Y so that it's sitting on our floor. Now, as before, we want to create a copy of that clone inside itself. Now, we just need to make a few adjustments here. We need to come over to Transform, halve the size of our clones. And then we also need to halve the distance between our clones. And then we're getting that kind of voxel-like look. And again, it's very easy to iterate on top of that just by creating more copies of that clone inside itself. So you can go as far as you're willing to risk. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at a couple of levels there. Now this is already fairly interesting. We could add a fillet onto our cube. And we've got a reasonably interesting structure here. I might want to add another plane effector to get a bit more randomness into this. So add a plane effector, turn off position, change it to modify clone, and then add a random field into there. And then I can just play with that until I'm happy. But let's say we want to just branch out so we're not just using basic geometry. We want to use some of our own custom geometry. Maybe we want to use a few different shapes. So that's very easy to do as well. I just happen to have made a few shapes earlier on. And um, I've made sure that these all kind of are fit within the same size as my cube, so they're only 100 by 100. But this could be any shape you wanted to. And I'll just copy them back over to here. So what we want to do to be able to use these inside of our oct tree is put them all into a clone, a cloner. Now, what we're going to do is reduce this to one by one, because we're not actually interested in using this to display. We're going to use this to drive iterating between the different shapes. So I'll drag this cloner into the instances, and I'll replace the cube inside our instance object with our cloner. Now, by default, it's just going to show one of them. So how do we control which, which object is being shown? We can come, again, using our trusty plane effector, making sure that it's being applied to our new cloner. We can use that. Again, turn off position. We want to be affecting which clone is being shown. Now, again, it's just a switch between them all. But we can use fields. Let's, in this case, use a shader field with some noise. I'll come in here and add a bit of contrast. Um, oh, yeah, I need to make sure that it's um, being applied world. And there we go. Now we're getting some iterations between the different shapes. And again, you can play with the noise any way you would normally. So you play with the seed until you're happy with the distribution of them. Come down again to uh, this one uh, that's affecting the subdivision layer. You can tweak that to your heart's content. But right now, let's try and get some more variety in there. At the moment, they're all facing in the same direction. I'm just going to tidy things up here a little bit. So this first plane effector is random shape. 
I'm going to add another plane effector. I love it. My favorite effector. Turn off position. And I'm going to change the name of this one to random rotation. Make sure it's being applied. Yes, it is. Now, yes, yeah, so we want to check on rotation. Just add a full turn into a couple of these. Now, by default, because we're doing a full turn, it doesn't, nothing shows up here. We need to control this with fields. So again, we can just bring in a random field. Now, that's definitely not what we want. We want to come into our remapping node and make sure that this is being quantized or stepped in 90 degree increments. So let's do that by coming to the step effector, adding four levels, because obviously there's just like the four 90 degrees within um, our 360. And already, we're getting some really nice variation of angle. The next thing I want to do is I'm a bit fed up of looking at white plane uh, geometry. Let's add some color into here. Again, let's just add a plane effector to our cloner. This one will be random color. Come to the parameters, turn off position. Now, we just all we need to make sure that we're doing here is making sure that fields color is being applied. We can just come over to the fields. Again, we can do random. Come over to the color remap. And we can just add a gradient into here. By default, this will just be black to white. But again, coming down to our presets, some really handy presets for gradients inside of Cinema 4D. We can just come and select one of these ones down here, maybe that one, or this one's quite nice. And we can remap this further to make to get um, maybe we want to see more of that darker pink color. So I just come into here. Oh, that's the wrong way. So there we go. And you can change this further as well. There's more layers that we can add on top of this. Maybe we want to. We don't want it to be a solid block of geometry. Maybe we want to carve out some of these so we can um, only show a few of them. We can do that again using our trusty plane effector, turning off position, this time coming down to visibility. And we also want to make sure that it's not overriding the color that we've just added, so we can turn that off. So I've got the visibility check down here. And I'll add, this time, I'm going to add a, um, a linear field. And just turn it, turn it around. Lift it up a little bit. And there you go. We're, you can start to see how you can really art direct this. And again, there's no reason we, just can, we need to use just one um, field. We can start to layer up fields as well if we want to. Maybe we want to add a random on here, and we can overlay that um, on top. And we can see it straight away it's very easy to art direct this and get a lot of, sort of randomness and variety into there. The final thing I want to show you is the example that I showed you at the beginning. So this is built in the exact same way as before. So I, I'll just turn these things off, turn that off, and I'll just solo our base layer. You can see it's using the exact same base structure that we used in the previous example, but this time, I don't want to use these shapes directly. I want to clone other objects onto this structure. So this is just like a base structure um, that I'm going to use to clone other things onto. So to do that, I need to put it into a connect object. And that makes Cinema 4D think of this as a mesh rather than lots of different objects. Now C4D thinks of this as a mesh. mesh and you can access all of those edges and points and faces to clone onto. Another side thing that this helps with is it, it welds the points that are directly on top of each other. So when we are cloning onto the points, we're not getting duplicate objects that are directly on top of each other. So I'm going to just briefly go through this. I won't go through this in a lot of detail, because Pam's got some awesome stuff to show us as well. Um, I'll just briefly go over how I layered this up. So the first thing I did was I just grabbed one single spline, and I cloned that to all of our edges. 
And then in the uh, cloner options, I just made sure that it was scaled along the edge so that it was the exact same size as um, each edge that we're cloning onto. And I'm using the extremely powerful Redshift, um, Redshift object tag to render all of these splines as cylinders. And now I've got some really nice glass cylinders. And then I did that again. But this time, I'm on, I want to use this um, as neon tubes that are inside those glass cylinders. So one, one interesting thing that I did here was I used the shader effector to drive how and where my illumination is. And you can see in those um, examples here, I was containing the neon tubes to just a few different places along the neon tubes. And then I can help guide the viewer's eye as we go through this journey by moving where, these neon, where the neon is being emitted from. So I just did that with a light, uh, with a, a shader effector that was just a, um, a solid color. So this could be, again, anything you want to. And then I'm controlling that with um, a box that can be moved around. So let's just um, add a vibrate tag onto here so you can see it moving a little bit. And you can see how that starts to move around. And then you can plug that into your shader graph just using the very powerful color user data node. So you can come over to here. And then in your attributes, um, down in the attribute name, there's a bunch of presets here. So you can grab the MoGraph color. And you can pull that in to drive your emission color. And then I've also plugged it into a ramp node, um, crushed that down quite a lot plug that into the opacity. So we're, just, we're only seeing those neon tubes exactly where we want to be seeing them. And then I just kind of added some of these extra little details, like the little connectors and some nice wavy glass to be on trend. Um, and so hopefully you get the idea. It's very easy to uh, layer all of these things on top of each other and create something that has a lot of detail enough to really stand up and be right inside the structure like we used in the, in the dot swoosh example. Um, and hopefully, you can even combine a bunch of these other things that we've used as well, like the, the random shapes, um, random direction. And hopefully, yeah, you've got a decent understanding now of how you can maybe utilize this in some of your own work. I'm now going to hand over to Pam, who's got some awesome stuff to show us as well. Thank you. Okay, so similar to Josh, I'm going to be showing you guys um, how we use Maxon tools in our workflow. Um, I'm going to be focusing on some techniques I've used recently to create um, holographic objects. Um, and we're going to be focusing on making really simple builds, but layering up so that they look more complex than they actually are. So it's no secret that Territory loves a hologram. Um, envisioning futuristic technology is our bread and butter, but what's really at the core of everything we do is world building, and that's across brand, film, games, experiential, creative advertising. We're always asking ourselves, how is this fitting into the story? Are we hitting the story beats? Does this hologram feel like it fits in the universe or the era in which it's, it lives in, basically? So I'm going to be kind of showing you a bit of a similar process to stuff like this. So this is what we're going to be making. Um, and here are some variations of it. So this workflow is really good for kind of giving yourself a lot of options, um, layering stuff up in different ways, having a lot of scope to present to a client. So the first, uh, I'm going to break it into three parts. So the first thing I'm going to talk about today is the materials. Um, it's really good to have a material library of sorts is kind of like a color palette, creating that level of consistency. A lot of the times as well, we have to apply the same holographic treatment to multiple objects in a film or a game, or we need to kind of swap um, objects in and out. So it's good to kind of create something that makes it easy for you to iterate. Um, so we have a Fresnel layer here, which creates a really nice like kind of halo effect around objects. We've got a subsurface, which depends on how you kind of look at it, you're kind of cheating that level of translucency. And then we've got two, oh, we've got two glass-like materials, one that's a little more rough. 
Um, glass is really good for holograms, so is metal, because this tends to be the materials that we associate with expensive technology. And holograms are usually used, well, at the moment anyway, to illustrate a world that is a lot more technologically advanced than we are today. The second thing I'm going to talk to you about today is the geometry aspect. So um, we're just going to be using spheres and a cheeky torus. And the effect is literally just using the poly effects deformer and then different random or plane effectors to kind of disrupt the way it looks. Um, and they're all built up using a similar sort of way. We're just changing values up and down. And then the final thing I'm going to show, if I've got time, is um, the After Effects comp, where we're using lots of Red Giant plugins to kind of boost things that extra level quicker. So I am going to tab into Cinema, if I can remember how. How did I? Oh, OK. We're on something. OK. So we've got four material setups here, so I'm just going to very quickly kind of pop up the graph of them. I'm going to get my redshift render view and fling that over there. So our Fresnel, oh, and I've got, um, I've got two lighting setups here. Um, they're both just HDRI dome lights. The first one is this uh, studio one, which I'm pretty sure I got from Grayscale Gorilla that I've just tinted purple and up the exposure. And then the second one, which I'm using in the subsurface, actually in combination, um, is this chapel one, which I think I got from Polyhaven. Um, so just very simple setup. So for our Fresnel, I have just used a standard material, literally just switched off the reflectance and in this texture bit you can just come down here and drop for now and that's that's it. You can dial this up and down if you want to kind of create like a harsher edge, almost like a kind of sketch and tune effect. Um, but I really like the kind of soft glow this, this kind of gives. So that's our for now. For our subsurface, Shove that light back on. Again, very, very simple. So all we've done to create this is drop our diffuse weight down to zero. Um, we've applied a bit of roughness and a bit and dropped the weight down on the reflection. We've added a smidge of sheen roughness. I think the default for that's 0.3, so we've just bumped it up a wee tiny bit. And then we've added um, some weight to the transmission as well um, to kind of create that translucency. But the real power comes from subsurface. So if you kind of, I realize I'm covering this. If you kind of dial this up and down, you get different sort of levels. Um, and I like to kind of put like a light color up at the top and then a dark color for the scatter, um, just to kind of create that sort of gradient look. Um, and I will quickly show you the glass ones. So I've just called, do some first just called this one water to kind of differentiate between the two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a displacer on this because the real power from it comes from the refraction. And we're just going to chuck a wee noise. And we're going to ramp this up. Oh. We're going to ramp it up more. Yeah, so once we do that, you can see kind of all this like nice colorful light we've got going on around the edges. And once we kind of um, do the poly effects and break everything up into geometry, we'll get these nice like glints of color throughout. And yeah, so the last glass one, really similar settings. This has just got a little bit more roughness than the one before. And I'm actually using this thin film shader from this artist here. Um, it's a really, really powerful script. There's a really good tutorial on it. But I'm going to just quickly show you how with the new um, cinema, you can create something similar like in the software. So I'll come out of there. So move this guy over here. So if we create a redshift standard material, if we now scrub all the way down here, we've now got a thin film um, added. So if I chuck that in there, and 
and do really similar settings to what's on the other one. Oh, over Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so now if we make this a bit smaller so that we can see what's going on. If we, if in this thin film, we also want to put this at 1.33 because that's the refraction index of water. So now if we push up this thickness and um, also push up this metalness, we'll get a really similar effect um, where you can see all the colour kind of coming through. So that is our materials. Um, I'm just going to go into our poly effects. Okay, so um, we have the Fresnel set up from before, and we're just going to start with that. And I'm just going to come up to MoGraph here and add a poly effects deformer. So if we drop that into our sphere, can't really see what it's doing just now, but if we come into our scale and we drop this down, doesn't seem to be doing anything. Ah, yeah, if I take this down, my segments down, yeah. You can see that it's breaking up the geo um, into polygons non-destructively. Um, and what we can do is, if we pop this back up, we can use a random effector to displace it. So you can see how it sort of just bursts it out. So if we change the random mode here to something like turbulence, and we bring down our strength, we start to kind of get this sort of wavy, wavy look. And then if we play about with the parameters here, so um, if I just add a bit of rotation, and if I add a bit of scale as well, we start to get some really cool effects. Um, another trick that I love to do with stuff like this is if we add a subdivision. And we drop our sphere into that. It changes the, the squares to little circles. So now if we bump back up our segments, we've got this really sort of organic looking um, holosphere broken up by dots. So I'm just going to duplicate this and show you kind of how to do some variations. So for tidiness, I'm not the most tidy, if I'm honest. So if we take the sphere out of the subdivision surface and we swap it out for a torus, I'm just going to show you some other things. So I'm just switching this around. I'm dragging the material up to it. I'm going to turn these guys off and I'm going to put the poly effects back up here. So if I take the radius down to 80 and the other radius down 24, turn this back on, we start to see this breaking up like this, and we want to put our segments up to. And again, it's just a case of like playing with different settings. So in the effector, I'm going to bump the strength up of this to 100. And then I'm just going to kind of play about with these settings to get something working. Uh, zero, this to 30. And I'm going to put some rotation down here too. And we don't want any scale. So now that doesn't, doesn't look too exciting, but if we use the kind of materials that we created earlier and try out some of those, we can get loads of different looks. So I'm just going to pop a glass on here. And I'm also going to swap out our lighting for the other one. 
and we've got this really cool like chromatic sort of look um, which is really fun um, and the next thing I'm going to show you is how to kind of maximize on these renders so what I'm going to do is add some AOVs in so I've already got some added here. These are the kind of core ones I like to use. You see reflection, refraction, specular lighting. And if we come back here, it gives us these options to swap them out and we get loads of really different looks. So this kind of just maximizes your kind of comp options. So that's kind of changing the look of things. Just show you on the other one. So I'm going to just quickly jump into After Effects and show you um, the stack now of how that would work. So we've got our variations all here. So I'm going to jump into a couple, hopefully, and kind of explain the setup for that. So if I solo these guys. So with that AOV setup, um, it gives you the ability, if you're exporting as OpenEXR, to extract different passes. So I really like to kind of play about with like using different ones. So for this pass, um, I've just extracted the beauty. I've um, tinted it to white, and I've dropped the opacity to 50%. I've then pulled in another one, and this time extracted the refractions, tinted it white, and added an optical glow, which I love and drop the opacity down to 20% as well, just to make everything a bit softer. I then have a third pass. Um, this time, I've extracted the specular lighting from it. Again, tint and an optical glow. This one, I've kept at 100%. And then I've reused one of the passes from earlier, except I've tinted it and also added this light burst effect, which is really cool for creating that sort of glowing from the bottom um, look. So, and then these guys are all just screened on top of each other to create this sort of more detailed looking um, sphere. And then my favorite part is the adjustment layers with all the effects. So I'm just gonna run you through those. So I've got a shine. Um, and I've just put a mask around the top so it's only the bottom that's being shined. Um, I then have a directional blur just to sort of create that sort of warpy um, paneled light sort of effect. I've then got another tint. Um, I've just dropped it to 50% so that it's mostly desaturated but we've got that little bit of chromatic color. We then have a fast box blur. Again, we've just masked around the top so that you've got that sort of halo effect around the sides. Then use one of my other favorite effects, which is point zoom. This is a really quick way to kind of create that conical projection look, especially if you're trying to concept a hologram really quickly. And you can use this sort of cross here to, to choose where your projections come from. We then have a couple of looks. Um, I've got a more blue one here, and I've got a green one that's dropped to 50%, just to kind of create a sort of cyan feel. Um, most of the time, I use presets um, and then kind of tweak various aspects, but it's a really powerful tool just to kind of take your work here to here very quickly. I then have um, chromatic aberration, just very subtle. Um, it's very easy to go over the top with that sort of thing. Um, but a little bit kind of helps just make it that a bit softer. And then lastly, we have an unsharp mask and a noise just to sort of kind of create that kind of cinematic effect. Um, and the other ones are all built in a very similar way, either just by mixing and matching the different passes, kind of changing the colors, extracting different layers. Um, so yeah, Maxim Tools make it really easy for us to kind of create variations very quickly. So if I tab back to presentation, no. Ah. Wow, okay. We got there in the end, okay. <laughs> um, 
If I tap back to the presentation, this is just quickly another example of the same process used on another object. So we've got a poly FX uh, pass going on here. We've got a glass kind of creating the edge, and we've got some Fresnel. We've got some noise. Um, so it's, it's kind of easy to apply it to different things. Um, and that is it for us. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to Maxon for inviting us. Um, it's been great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, thank you all in the audience and people watching live. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. This was the last presentation for today. Uh, do not forget to scan the QR code. Uh, you can watch the live stream, or you can watch the recording on YouTube channel, on Maxon YouTube channel. And we will see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Thank you.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the note editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system. This means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks with objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trapcode Particular has hot new features, introducing Combustion, a new fluid dynamics option to create fiery looks with particular particles. Control attributes like temperature over life as particles ignite and then turn to smoke. If you've ever created particle trails from a parent and had to increase the particle account significantly in order to create a line, now with the new stroke from parent feature, those lines are created for you automatically. Create particle trails and tails fast and easy and at perfect quality while still having control over essential attributes such as size, color, and opacity over life.
Cinema 4D 2024 adds improvements to modeling, powerful enhancements to the new unified simulation system, great additions to the node editor, even better redshift integration, and much more. You'll notice immediately that Cinema 4D 2024 is much faster. Cinema 4D 2024 includes incredible performance improvements in all areas, while keeping the same intuitive workflows you know and love. With over twice the playback performance compared to previous versions of Cinema 4D, you can experience real-time responsiveness in many scenes. Pyro has been incredibly popular since its first release. Now in Cinema 4D 2024, you can set the initial state to specify exactly how your Pyro simulation begins. You can also emit Pyro directly from particles and the MoGraph matrix object creating fire, smoke, and dust trails that make use of color, scale, and other attributes. Now it's easy to art direct pyro at a low resolution and then up-res it to impressively high detailed simulations with the single click of a button. And using the new cache list, you can directly compare different versions of your cache volumes with ease. In this release, we've also added rigid bodies to the unified simulation system this means you can now simulate rigid bodies together with soft bodies, clock, rope, and even pyro. Take advantage of GPU processing and shape simplification for incredible performance when simulating complex meshes. We've also enhanced Cinema 4D's modeling toolset with this release. Use the new Select Pattern tool to repeat polygon selections across the surface of your mesh. Or use the new Projection Deformer for enhanced animations that quickly move points from one object to another. Take advantage of the Fong Tag's new style option to eliminate shading artifacts, or use the all new normal editing tool to gain full control while tweaking the vertex and polygon normals. Also, we revamped the Vamp Manager with the ability to transfer UV and weight normal data from one mesh to another while preserving the edge breaks. The new note editor in Cinema 4D 2024 now has scaffolds and notes to make your node setups more readable. Use scaffolds to visually group nodes and move them around as a whole. Adding or removing nodes to a scaffold is as easy as dragging it in and out. The new notes allow you to easily add comments in various colors, sizes, and styles. And as always, new nodes have been added to give you more flexibility in controlling your assets. The viewport has a new option that allows you to view polygon and point indices, both in object and component modes. The modeling brush and magnet tool have been improved with a new surface smear mode that retains the surface flow, and both have a new preserve boundary setting that preserves both mesh and selection boundaries when you use the tool. Starting in Cinema 4D 2024, Redshift is Cinema 4D's default render engine, and we've made the integration even better. You can now choose to create Redshift materials when importing popular exchange formats like OBJ, FBX, GLTF, and USD. And simplified versions of Redshift materials will be exported via the same formats as well as Cineware for Unreal. This makes it easy to design content in Cinema 4D and Redshift that's destined for interactive projects. All through this year, we've been regularly releasing new sets of capsules. Maxon's collection of tailor-made materials, models, and nodal assets to help you kickstart your projects, including plant assets by Laubwerk, home decor models by Pavel Zoch, and redshift materials by Fuchs and Vogel that are perfect for architectural visualization, product shots, and motion graphics. There's also a new brake spline modifier by Rocket Lasso, which allows you to evenly or randomly subdivide splines with spacing, great for creating dynamic stacks of objects swept along curves. Editors and compositors are going to love the huge assortment of great new features in Red Giant. Real Lens Flares has a big update, starting with the exciting ability to use After Effects lights to control flares. This allows you to easily use 3D tracking data to accurately place flares in a scene, or direct your flare with a parallel light or spotlight cone angle. You can also now control the distance of a flare in Z space. Using this feature, combined with the new distance effect size and size effects brightness parameters, you can now control the throw of the light in a 2D track. 
Real Lens Flares also adds a new ring projection, which is great for those classic 1970s and 80s movie looks. And in what is sure to be a favorite, schmutz can now be illuminated by the background, or your flare, or both. To help you work more efficiently in Real Lens Flares, we've also added a draft mode. Simply enable draft mode on your After Effects layer, and the render quality will be reduced by a factor of 4 to increase performance. When you go to render, draft mode is automatically ignored, and your flare is rendered at full quality. And remember that Real Lens Flares and many of these new features are also now available in Adobe Premiere Pro. Universe has hundreds of presets to help you get started, and this release adds over 50 new presets to inspire your creativity and give your designs and edits a head start. Magic Bullet Looks also adds dozens of new presets to give you even more options for professional creative color grades. Also, the OCIO configuration in your After Effects project is now seen and synchronized with Magic Bullet Looks, so you don't have to worry about getting consistent color, consistent color throughout your pipeline. Trap Code Pay 